Wow. Hey, much love and respect. Pura vida. Mi gente, thanks for uh, being here once again. Thank you for uh, taking the time to, you know, out of your day today. I know it might be a busy hour right now, Friday afternoon. But thanks for uh, tuning in here uh, once again. Let me know if the music is a little louder than my voice. I'll put it down. Um, so, yeah, basically, a little excited about uh, going over this information again. I got a lot of new people, guys. Uh, a lot of new subscribers. They've missed a lot of my Huguenot videos. Yeah, so I thought it was time to do a kind of remastered version, refresh, straight to the point. All information I'm going to be reading, you know, primary sources, academic research. You know, this is, you know, after watching this, this is going to be a long one, guys. I hope get cozy, get the popcorn, you know, roll up, <laughs> get comfortable, you know. If you've been wanting to do something, clean the house while you watch this, go ahead. This is a good time because it's it might be four to five hours, okay? I'm just warning you right now, all right? It's going to be all info. So I do want to say in the chat, you know, to the real ones, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, my patrons, thank you for supporting me. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, the Huguenots, right? Who are the Huguenots? So if the chat can allow me, you know, you know, just to grab the podium and just present the information. I know a lot of people want to answer people in the chat, like, who's this? Who's the Cadians? Who's more? Who's this? You know, we can't just generalize it. I'm going to break it down today, okay? I'm going to break it down. We're going to, I got a lot of old videos, you know, we're going to put together. It's not going to be a lot of dead air. It's going to be a lot of information. I got it all pre recorded, okay? So just want to answer right away. Yeah. Uh, most of the French people that ended up in the Acadian region were Huguenots. So, uh, yeah. But um, I have a whole video on that. I'm going to get to that at the end. I'm going to, you know, recommend some videos that I got. All right. All right. Straight truth today. You know, if you still deny or, you know, doubt anything I'm going to show you today, uh, after the four or five hours, then you're just practicing cognitive dissonance. And that's just straight up. You know, we're here for... The truth, we're not here about emotions or people feeling a certain way. All right. These are the Huguenots. All right. I'm going to do a big disclaimer now. <laughs> so in my old videos, I used to say Huguenot. All right. So don't kill me. Okay. <laughs> I say it correctly now. Huguenots. All right. Huguenots. But at the time, believe it or not, I was kind of finding them everywhere, simulating, amalgamating everywhere. So I was just like Huguenot. Huguenot. <laughs> But, uh, you know, no disrespect now. I understand that many of us have this geneal genealogy. They were everywhere. I'm going to show you guys. All right. And again, thanks for uh, tuning in once again. And again, I know how to say the name now. <laughs> you, the <good> nuts. <laughs> New chair. So before I start the recording, I did, I just want to uh, go ahead and add this right away to the presentation. I'm in the Berkshire County Eagle, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Friday, June 17th, 1859. All right, 1859. This is old. It says here, Moores in South Carolina. Moores in South Carolina. It may not be generally known that some of the best families in South Carolina are Moors by descent. Yeah, Moors by descent. We're not talking about tans or blackwashing. We're talking about real history. Get out your feelings. Get ready. All right? Let go. We got to empty our cups. Remember who <laughs> Harriet Tubman was raiding and where it happened. South Carolina, right? South Carolina plays a big role here with the Huguenots. So who was she really raiding? All right, here we go again. It may not be generally known that some of the best families in the South and South Carolina are Moors by descent. The blood of the African, Dr. Hijack, soon washes out, but that of the Indian and more. After half a score of generations, shows itself almost as strongly as ever who? The Black European and the Indian. All right. 
the crisp curling black hair, dark sad eyes, long silken lashes and swarthy complexion come up generation after generation. Many of the old Huguenot families down to the present day show strong traces of their Moorish descent. Okay, I'm not making this up. Many Huguenot families, again, they show traces of their Moorish descent. Make sure you like and share the video, all right, so everybody can get this information and we can kill all the biases, stereotypes, prejudices, and misinformation out there. When the Moors were driven out from Spain, upon the conquest of Granada, thousands of them took refuge in the south of France, carrying with them the art of cultivating the vine and growing silk. After a lapse of years, they were again driven to seek new homes and in large numbers emigrated to South Carolina. The Battle of Marengo. All right, so this is a whole other topic. They all of a sudden, they start going into another topic. <laughs> but wanted to read that to you. Shout out to the person that sent me this. Uh, I believe his name was Juan. Sorry if I'm mis not remembering. It's on Instagram. And uh, I actually found a better version of this, right? Again, we're in the Vermont Patriot and State Gazette from 14th of May. 1859 same year all right so again they're going over the same story the only difference is it's a little longer all right so again where were we so a lot of the huguenot families show traces of the moorish descent all right so when the moors were driven out from spain upon the conquest of granada okay granada we're gonna see a lot of the so-called huguenots were moorish people that came out of granada Thousands of them took refuge in the south of France, all right, carrying with them all their art and culture and their skills and trade, like growing silk, the silk trade. Remembering their bitter persecutions in Spain, they could never become Catholics, though forced by the position to renounce Mahometanism and become Christian, all right? Conversos, crypto-Muslims, crypto-Jews, we will see as well. They became eventually Protestants, so-called Protestants, right? Who's the Protestants? I know a lot of you uh, subscribers uh, always hear me like, how does he know all the Protestants are, you know? Well, when you start doing the research, you start seeing who these so-called Protestants are. And when the revocation of the Edict of Nantes took place, withdrawing toleration from the Protestant religion, they were again driven to seek new homes and in large numbers emigrated to South Carolina. The Gauls of Caesar's day and our own is of a different type from the French Huguenots, whose descendants are among us distinct in physique and in moral and intellectual character, a fair complexion, dash the hijack like like light or reddish hair, and a disposition versatile, fickle, and not to be relied on, inconstancy in his friendship and enmities have been characteristics of the Gaul. Okay, they were talking about the so-called Gaul there. That's what they were saying, describing in their time in 1850s, right? The Gauls. He is the very antipodes of the French Huguenot. So he's saying it's very different. These people who he was just describing are very different than the French Huguenots. And a dissimilarity so strong and marked can only be accounted for by tra tracking them up to the different stocks from which they sprung. Different stocks. Different stocks. Ethnicity. It's not just about religion. There never was a nobler or more chive chivalrous race of men that the Moors of Granada from whom our Huguenot population are derived. The Moors of Granada. Oh, we're just in newspapers right now. Don't worry. We're about to get to all the sources. Okay? <laughs> this is just corroboration. This is just to get us ready for the information. So anybody who's not comfortable with this can just go away right now. All right, again, the chivalrous race of men that the Moors of Granada, from whom the Huguenot population are derived with strong and active passions, controlled by a lofty sense of honor, and in it, love of justice, and tempered by a politeness and courtesy that is inborn in their race, firm and constant in friendship, and dignified even in the most bitter resentment. The descendants of the Moor, the descendants of the Moor claim our admiration in peace or war. Clarendon Banner. Wow.
Yeah. So thanks for tuning in. We're about to get to uh, the recording. And uh, of course, I'm going to do side commentary here while we're reading all these sources. We're going to break it down, right? We're going to go, you know, with something we kind of shown a lot before. But again, we have a lot of new people. And so we just got these newspapers saying all this. What do they mean? How are they so sure? Why are they writing this so confidently in 1859? All right. And I just, uh, out of respect also, uh, if we can stay on topic in the chat, Make sure we stay on topic. Don't go off because it does distract others, you know. So thank you. I appreciate that. Let's go. You guys ready? Again, I know a lot of people are new to this. They might have never known that the Huguenots were Moors. Just going over some information here that we've gone over many, many times. This is the book History of the Conquest of Spain by the Arab Moors by Henry Copey. Written in 1892. We're in page 445. And right there, they're talking about Christopher Columbus and how he believed only more civilization was good and that his vessel was fitted out in that little port of Palos, which had lately been a Moorish port. His sailors were many of them men with Moorish blood in their veins. It has been asserted that when the Moors were driven out, thousands took refuge in the south of France, who afterwards, abhorring the Roman Catholic persecutions, became Huguenots. Who became Huguenots? Moors. Moors, when they were driven out. Moors, right? Moors, when they were driven out of Spain and Portugal. They ended up in southern France, became known as Huguenots, right? They're being persecuted by the Catholics. So this is a beef they had. Huguenots are Moors and Sephardic Jews as well. Uh, history channel right basic info uh, the Huguenots right Huguenots were French Protestants in the 16th and 17th century who followed right who followed the teachings of theologian John Calvin supposedly right it's persecuted by the French Catholic government during a violent period Huguenots fled the country in the 17th century creating Huguenot settlements all over Europe in the United States and Africa all right so United States so Calvinism what's Calvinism right this is from Britannica online. Calvin's theology it says at age 27, Calvin published Institutes of Christian Religion, which in successive editions became a manual of Protestant theology. Calvin agreed with Martin Luther on justification by faith and the sole authority of Scripture. On the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, he took a position between the radical Swiss and the Lutheran view. Thus, he believed that the body of Christ was not present everywhere, but that his spirit was un universal and that there was a genuine common communion with the risen Lord. Calvin likewise told, took a middle view on music and art. He favored congregational singing of the Psalms, which became a characteristic practice of the Huguenots, all right, in France. So the Huguenots sang the Psalms, which is a, the Torah, right, the Old Testament, Hebrew stuff, right? Huguenots, uh, it says in France, and the Presbyterians in Scotland. So the Presbyterians did the same and in the New World, all right? Calvin rejected the images of saints and the crucifixes, that is, the image of the body of Christ upon the cross, but allowed the plain cross. All right, these modifications do not, however, refute the generalization that Calvinism was largely opposed to art and music in the service of religion, but not in the secular sphere, right? It's so, called when Scotland was Jewish. DNA evidence, archaeology, analysis of migrations, and public and family records show 12th century Semitic roots. Elizabeth Caldwell Hirschman and Donald and Yates. We're going to get into. All right. So we're about to get into uh, John Calvin, who he really was. You remember? So the Huguenots were followers of Calvinism. So this is what their whole thing is based off their so called religion. But remember, that's religion and ethnicity, two different things. Uh, if you just joined us, because I do see a lot of people joining, you know, we already went over some sources uh, just saying the Huguenots were Moors who settled in the south of France. All right. Now we're going over. Who John Calvin, the, the one they followed, their whole Protestantism and Reformed Christianity is based off. All right, let's go. John Calvin, as you see here, John Calvin or Calvin or Cowin, 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 Cowan, Cowhen. So who's this famous person? What's a Calvinist, right? What are the Huguenots? Calvinism, Calvinist, Protestant. Who started Protestantism? Who supposedly started? The Huguenots and what are their belief system? The Calvinism, right? Who is this John Calvin? 
So as here, John Jean Calvin was born in 59 in Picardy, France. The family name was perhaps actually Calvin. John's father, Gerard, was employed as an attorney by the Lord of Nyon. Of John's Jew, we know only that he served the noble family of de Montmore, de Montmore, de Montmore, and studied for the priesthood. In early adulthood, Calvin moved to Paris, where he became friends with two sons of the French king's physician, given their surname and their father's occupation, Nicholas and Michael Cobb, were likely of crypto-Jewish descent. A little further down, it says at the time a war was in progress between Francis I and Charles V, so Calvin was forced to make his own way to Switzerland through Geneva. In Geneva, William Farrell, bearing a Sephardic surname, Farrell, founder of the Reformed Church in Geneva, convinced Calvin to stay and help preach the new Protestant theology. Calvin obliged and set up several Protestant religious schools in the city. So, real quick, you know, just wanted to bring you here now. I'm on Wacky Hand, I know, Wacky Hand, but this is actually something you can actually research. So, Cohen, it says here, right? Cohen, don't know that's a Jewish name, usually given to the uh, Levitical uh, descendants of the Levi tribe, the Levi Levitical priests of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, I guess, right? Cohen, surname. Now, it says down here, French translation of Cohen gives Cowin, Calvin, as in John Calvin. John Calvin was a crypto Jew. All right? He was a crypto Jew, he was a Sephardi person of color. This this Calvinist founder, the ones who the Huguenots follow, right? He was a crypto Jew, right? Likewise, he has a crypto Jewish last name. Calvin spelled before that Calvin and before that Cohen. Really interesting stuff out there about it, all right? Just a little further on, I just want to get to this part. It says, from this capsule biography, we learned that Calvin's father was an attorney in Picardy, which contained at that time a flourishing Morano colony. Moranos, crypto Jews, Sephardic people of color. Obviously, his father was literate and well-educated. He was also an advisor to nobility. Common traits of crypto Jews. Gerard Coven was clearly ambitious for his son, guiding his career with an eye towards social and economic advancement. He was not a force of Catholic religious fever or conventional piety. So you hear what they're letting you know here, right? Calvinism and Calvin, the guy they, you know, following, his dad was a Jew. Morano colony, in a Morano colony in a Picardy, France. All right? We read also that John chose to learn both Greek and Hebrew languages, which would have permitted him to read the Old Testament example Torah in its original ancient form rather than relying upon Christian's translation into Latin. We perceive as well that he favored universal literacy and Judaic value, that two of his closest friends, Cop and Pharaoh, both had Sephardic surnames, and that he married a woman named Idel de Burr, evidently of possible Sephardic descent. A surviving sketch of John Calvin shows him with a leather head covering, full beard and dark features, dark features. All right, Calvin, John Calvin, dark features, dark. While we do not presume to judge the sincerity or Christian orientation of his beliefs, we do hold that the, he was of crypto-Jewish descent. All right, John Calvin, right? The Huguenots follow him, Protestantism, all that. He was what? A crypto-Jewish descent, that he moved in circles that included Moranos, and that his theology would naturally have been influenced by these ancestral community um ties all right so again john calvin protestantism huguenots all right and uh, just to correlate again i found another source here it says here the curse of canaan it's the name of this book it says a demonology of history by bustas mullen i'm um, basically on page 56 on this part of the book it says here calvinism right john calvin calvinism right the crypto jew it says here a strong influence in england during the 16th century capitalized on the growing power of the mercantile fleet and the black nobility i right, mercantile merchants right capitalized with the sephardic jews right and the black nobility this ain't no illuminati conspiracy it's just a there's a real history behind all this whose main interest was money right money unlike previous religious institutions which had placed great emphasis on austerity or and vows of poverty this new religious doctrine Stress the charging of interest and in loans, and the amassing of wealth was the new way of doing the work of the Lord. You hear that? 
So see how easy it was to just make it all about business because there was a new way of doing the work of the Lord. The religious doctrine became charging interest in loans. That was the religious doctrine. That was the way of doing the work of the Lord, making money, all business, all right? It was a welcome revelation to the grown merchants class that God really wanted us to become wealthy. And Riches Vos became the new battle cry which swept across Europe as the Canaanites built great commercial empires. Canaanites, hey, I'm not the one saying it. The prophet of this new divine revelation was Jean Cowin of Noyons, France. He was educated at the College du Montagu, where Loyola, founder of the Jesuit sect, had studied. Cowin, or Cowin, later moved to Paris, where he continued his studies with the humanist, humanist from 1531 to 32. During his stay in Paris, he was known as Cowin, and he then moved to Geneva, where he formulated the philosophy now known as Calvinism. At first known in Geneva as Cohen. He was known there as Cohen, all right? He was a Cohen, all right? He was a Cohen. The usual pronunciation of Cowin. He anglicized his name to John Calvin. This religious movement was based on literal Jewish interpretation of the Ten Commandments, Old Testament, philosophy, and the prohibition of graven images. The early disciples of Calvinism were known as Christian Hebrews, or Hebrews, Christian Hebrews. The advent of Calvinism made possible the great expansion of Jews into further avenues of European commerce besides money lending. You hear that? Like we were just like we've been saying and learning. All right, this whole this title, this banner they were using as new Christians or Protestants or Calvinists. Again, the advent of Calvinism made it possible the great expansion of Jews into further avenues of European commerce beside money lending. For this achievement, the encyclopedia honors Calvin with the statement, Calvin blessed the Jews. I mean, his other book says here, The Death and Resurrection of the West, Foretold in Prophecy, Secrets and Biblical Symbols, Book 1 by Ralph T. Kenny. And Ralph T. Kenny says, A Jew from France named Jean Cowen, Cohen, changed his name to John Calvin and became a Protestant reformer in Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin initiated what I would call a totalitarian form of Christianity, which banned dancing, smoke, and every bit of alcohol in Sunday sports for the first time. He legitimized the lending of money of interest, which has now gotten every nation into unpayable debt. All right, so a Jew from France named Jean Cowen Cohen. That's who the hell us for following a crypto Jew this term Morisco what is a Morisco right it says here Spanish little Moors or Moriscos Portuguese were Spanish Muslims who converted to Catholicism during the Reconquista of Spain the term later became a prerogative applied to those who had outwardly converted but secretly continued to practice Islam Moriscos were really Moors, right? Or Muslims, right? Moors, and you know, we're talking about melanated, dark-skinned people, right? Dark-skinned Europeans with a Muslim uh, heritage, right? And culture, uh, even religion, and history. And they were basically Catholics by name, but they were really still practicing Islam, right? So just like the Huguenots assimilated, these Moriscos were assimilating into Catholicism, right? Huguenots were descendants of Muslims in Europe. Huguenot history descriptions fade in Europe and their occupations and skills, etc. are so integrally related to Muslims that it is not far-fetched to investigate their being Muslims. Remember, it is well known that well before the fall of Muslim Imarat and Wilayats of Sicily and Spain Muslims had to use two names where one is to hide their Muslim origins when passing through doing business with people in enemy areas such as investigation becomes more of a possibility when we know that muslims in spain and other parts of europe are known in many denominations moors moriscos reli uh generis mudijars crypto muslims conversos and may also be huguenots as well because in 1534 a member of the persecuted french huguenots james cartier of saint malo 
began the exploration of New France, it is claimed that Cartier was Catholic, though he came from a Huguenot family, and his expedition was financed by Philippe de Cab Cabot, a Huguenot. I said Cabot, but I guess it's supposed to be said, pronounced Chabot in the French way. It's the same family, Cabot, exactly. That's John Cabot. It was probably a Huguenot too from England. They had anglicized their Chabot name, right? So who was the navigators and the map makers? You know, the first Huguenot colony was established in 1540 at Cap Rouge near present-day Quebec City, Canada by Jean-Francois de la Roque. Sur de Robernal, a Huguenot. All right, a Huguenot, another Huguenot important in history. This settlement was abandoned in 1543. World famous silk textile technology at Andalus reached Britain through Huguenots. What? The silk? What? Remember the Huguenots? That was their trade before they went to the Americas. It says mm -hmm. Al Andalus became a center of silk production, including both import of silk thread and cultivation of silkworks, styles, and technologies from Eastern Muslim lands, kept pace with Andalusian fashions of the court and among the wealthy. Silk textiles became important articles of the export trade. Andalusian silks at first had similar designs, motives like those of Persian, Byzantine, and Mesopotamian origin. Andalusian weavers also copied styles popular in Baghdad. All right, so I got a couple links there. Says the Huguenot influence on English silk weaving. Huguenot logo pendants, a sign of for source of light and enlightenment, earlier used by pre Islamic Hanif people who were earliest Muslim converts. The Huguenot logo, an inscription with Quranic verse Bismillah and Huguenot logo found in Arabia, town of Kilwa in Arabia. So, European and Ottoman literature of the 18th century provides details of close relationship of Huguenots with the Ottomans, page 8 of the Ottoman state, and its place in world history. Introduction, Camel H. Carpet, 1974. Hundreds of fugitive religionaires Huguenots carried off to the Ottoman regencies after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. So, I found this in that article. It says, why ignore the fact that Turks frequently have surnames Haji and Huguenots with surnames Turk? You see that sign? The sign says, built in and 1767 by John the Turk, son of Isaac the Turk, a Huguenot, who settled here in 1712 and was one of the number of French Protestants who were pro pioneers in this part of Berks County. That's what it says. It says, French settlers Isaac the Turk and his family, who settled on the Pennsylvania frontier in the mid 1700s, several of Johann's sons, served in the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. Johann the Turk became a member of the Moravian faith more moravian faith was originally formed by john huss or who's john huss is one of the forefathers of anti-trinitarian original unit uni unitarian monotheistic movement with rose which rose due to spanish king's allowance to arab trinitarian malkit nasara to confront islamic and cluniac church concepts of strict monotheism all right french Huguenots were in contact with the moriscos and plans against the house of austria hasburg they were against the hasburg who's the hasburgs again charles v is from a hasburg line charles v the holy roman emperor all right so they were against the huguenots or these moriscos which ruled spain in the 1570s around 1575 Plans were made for a combined attack of Aragonese Moriscos and Huguenots from Bern under Henry de Navarre against Spanish Aragon in agreement with the King of Algiers in the Ottoman Empire. But these projects foundered with the arrival of John of Austria in Aragon and the disarmament of the Moriscos. Going here, it says, in 1492, Granada, the last Moorish stronghold in Spain, was taken by the soldiers of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, and the Moors were expelled from Spain in 1496. All right, so 1492, what also happened? Columbus landed in America, right? 1492, who got expelled? Moors and Jews. They're leaving out the Jew part right here. So Jews and Moors were expelled from Spain in 1492, a lot of them ended up where? In America. It says, in 1496, to appease Isabella, King Manuel of Portugal announced a royal decree banishing the Moors from the portion of that peninsula. The Spanish King Philip III expelled the remaining Moors by a special decree issued in 1609. Fully 3,500,000 Moors or Moriscos, as their descendants were called, left Spain between 1492 and 1610. Where do they go and who do they become? Over one million Moriscos made their way to where? France. 
France, where the vast majority of them became hugging us. The vast majority of Moors became what? Hugging us. Let's, let's get all the tags out the way. These Swarthy Moors, right? Muslims, Muslims, Spanish Muslims became what? Hugging nuts, AKA hugging nuts. So why were they so quick to not carry their hugging nut identity in America? Because they had other identities, more ancient. It is in France where many of the last descendants of the Almoravids, as well as other Berber groups settled. It was along with these that our Moorish ancestors made their trek into the Southern France and were eventually titled by the native Franks as the Sol Solnier, also spelled Sonier or Sunny, Sonier, Sonier or Sunny. From El Mura Betun to supposedly dwellers in the willow. Our Moroccan name and history and our Moorish identity soon forgotten through time after becoming Huguenots, forgotten through time after becoming Huguenots, the family later legitimately made immigrations to the Americas. And what did they do in the Americas, right? We just read, right? 53 years after the last Moors left Spain, Louis Salnier was born in Vitre, Betragne, France. Louis later became the first Salnier to set foot on American soil, arriving in Acadia. Nova Scotia in Canada 1685. Lewis was also on the 1693 census taken at Bubasin. He and his wife, Lewis Batinox, also known as Pelletier, had 13 children. Lewis died on the 10th of March 1709. The family eventually spread all throughout the United States in areas such as Louisiana, all right, Massachusetts, South Carolina, and California. We're talking about Moors, right? We're not talking about pale skinned French people, Huguenots. Right, settling where? In Louisiana, right? Massachusetts, China, California. So it says Haganus kills in seafaring. Naval wars and activities termed as private piracy point to the same activities of many Muslims of Northwest African lands. Haganus are also credited with killing Ignatius de Avis Acevedo a Jesuit missionary who is considered a martyr by Catholics. It is reported that about 50 Haganus privateers or pirates operated in the English Channel in, six, in 1568, with Plymouth serving as their base. La Popellini, a book first printed in 1571, mentions Huguenot pirates and their attack on Santiago and the author of a history of the Buccaneers of America. All right, the Buccaneers, the Buccaneers, Huguenots, Huguenot pirates. Who's the pirates? History of the Buccaneers of America was himself a Huguenot buccaneer. Huguenot. A history of the conquest of Spain by the Arab Moors with a sketch of the civilization which they achieved and imparted to Europe by Henry Cobb. This was written in 1892. So it has been asserted that when the Moors were driven out, thousands took refuge in the south of France thousands who afterwards abhorring the roman catholic persecutions they became what they became huguenots been talking about moors and that of these many emigrated at a later date to where south carolina all right again these they went to south of france and became what huguenots and that these many emigrated to south carolina be that as it may the spaniards had found for the world a virgin land in which to introduce Spanish errors and especially Spanish bigotry and the great tide rushed in from Protestant Europe to occupy it. All right, the isolated valleys of Castile and Aragon are still swayed by the Hispano Roman and yet vital Celtiberian in the south. In spite of Spanish disclaimers, the Moorish blood still shows itself beneath a swarthy, beneath a what? A swarthy complexion and under crisp curling black hair. The expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain in 1609-1614, the destruction of an Islamic periphery. The expulsion of the last Muslims of Spain, the nominally Christian Moriscos, in the years 1609-1640 was a massive event of great interest for the history of humanity. Although neither carefully planned nor well prepared, it was forcefully executed. In the first year alone, from September 1609 to August 1610, a quarter of a million human beings a quarter of a million human beings were driven from their homes, the majority to North Africa. Most of them were transported directly by ship, but many first walked into southern France. Many what? They just went to France. Many of who? They talk about Moriscos, right? Little Moors. 
By early 1614, 50,000 more had been deported and hardly any Moriscos remained in Spain, hardly. Yeah. Spain under the Habsburgs by John Lynch, reader in Hispanic and Latin American history, University College, London. Volume two, Spain and America, 1598 to 1700. The expulsion of the Moriscos. The truce of Antwerp was signed on 9 April 1609. On the same day, Philip III took another decision to expel the Moriscos from Spain. The two events were not coincidence. Spanish statement of the time measured out their policy by calculation, not by accident. And Spanish policy was never more calculated than it was in 1609. The international situation was at last propitious for measure which was regarded as one of the national of national security. The detente achieved by Peace with England in 1604 and with the United Provinces in 1609 enabled Spain to concentrate her land and sea forces in the Mediterranean in order to ensure the security of the operation against the Moriscos. All right. The operation was equally efficient in Aragon, where it was conducted in the course of 1610 once the security of Valencia was assured. Here, too, the aristocracy protested, and here, too, their protests were in vain. By mid-September, some 41,952 Moriscos, including a few from Catalonia, had been expelled to North Africa via the port of Alfaquis. The rest of the Aragonese Moriscos, some 13,470, were sent over to the Pyrenees into France. And I wonder what they became there. To be shepherded by ex paraded French authorities to the port of Agde for shipment across the Mediterranean and forced to pay transit dues as well as seafarers from Andalusia, whereas the Moriscos were more difficult to identify because of their relative affluence. 36,000 were expelled by mid-1610 in the rest of Castile. The operation was not a problem in point of numbers, but was complicated by the existence of two groups of Moriscos, the ancient Mudejares and the more recent emigres from Granada. First, by decree of 28 December 1609, they were given the opportunity of emigrating voluntarily via France to Tunis. Many took advantage of this, and the remainder were expelled by decree by 10 of June 1610. All right, so this is a map of France and Spain, the Mediterranean, Europe, right? So basically, you can see uh, Portugal all the way to the left here, and Spain, they're right next to each other. Portugal is basically a little piece of Spain, all right? Uh, and France is the very first country right next to Spain. You can cross the border and walk right into France. So it makes sense that after the expulsion of Moriscos and Sephardic, Sephardic Jews, we're not leaving them out. Remember, there's a group being left out. We, we're going to get to that. They actually, they actually, you know, you know, ended up in France, you know. Visions of deliverance. Moriscos in the politics of prophecy in the early modern Mediterranean. This chapter first traces the communication between the Moriscos of Aragon and the French Huguenots of the region of Berne during the period that followed the Alpujarras revolt. At the time, the inquisitors of Aragon and the Supreme Council of the Inquisition were investigating all movements across the northern border. And these contacts between Moriscos and Huguenots set the stage for the Morisco rebellion plots of the early 17th century that will also be discussed in this chapter. The last Morisco voices of resistance found a number of inquisitorial sources demonstrate that until very moment of the expulsion, Moriscos held hopes fueled by prophecies that someone would come to their aid in staging an uprising against the Spanish monarch. <laughs> Says your studies of medieval and reformation traditions, Converso and Morisco studies. The Conversos and Moriscos, a late Medieval Spain and Beyond, and Beyond, Volume 2, The Morisco Issue. Edited by Kelvin Ingram, says, The fact that after 1609, among the Morisco exiles in France, in France and Tunis, those from Granada or Aragon were conspicuously present, occupying key posts. All right, they had key positions, just like in America, where they displayed their organizational skills. On the Granada side, for instance, a member of the Chapis family acted as a depository for Morisco capital in Toulouse. Candida, Compañero's second husband, the aforementioned Alonso Mule, is reported by Pedro Aznar Cardona to have settled in Marseille by 1611. Again, it was a Mule who appeared before the French consulate in Tunis, 
representing the Moriscos who had had their wealth confiscated. Likewise, the famous Morisco Geronimo Enriquez in re direct negotiations with Istanbul and France controlled the destinies of numerous Moriscos. Now it says here, the expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain, the Mediterranean diaspora, edited by Mercedes uh, Garcia Arano, Gerard Wiggers, translated by Consuelo Lopez Morillas, Martin Beagles, and it says here, and table one, two is showing a little table here, expelled Moriscos before 1611. 116,000 went to Valencia as the Valencia Moriscos, 30,000 30, from Andalusia, the Andalusians, 6,000 the Mauritians or the Martians, Mauritians, I didn't say it, 17,000 Castilians via France. So these are the rest of the numbers, as you can see here. The Moriscos outside Spain, Moriscos were continued to arrive in France and not only from the kingdom of Valencia, but also from Aragon and those Granadans who are spread out across Castile. So look at all these Moriscos, right? Who were Moriscos? Converted Moors, converted Muslims, swarthy and curly haired as they, you know, describe them. So again, not only from those kingdoms, but all, all over Spain, they were arriving in France. So on March 29, March 1608, the Council of Portugal sent on information from an eyewitness who had seen the risk disembarkment of Moriscos in North Africa when I was being held captive in Tunis. A French ship arrived whose captain was called Francisco Casacho, and it carried more than 200 men, women, and children. I myself embarked on the same ship for France, and after arriving, I saw the departure of another English ship full with more than 250 or 300 Moriscos destined for Tunis and I also heard that more than 400 or 500 Moriscos had crossed the border from Aragon to France and were waiting for a ship to take them away. This witness also said that the Moriscos took all their money with them and that in the ports from which they left for France they were allowed to pass in exchange for money. He also seems to denounce the fact that a Morisco infrastructure had been set up in Marseilles. The anonymous witness reported that in Marseille a certain Morisco by the name of H. Abraham, 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 had reached an arrangement with the French authorities to allow Moriscos to enter the country and leave from there to Barbary in France. All right, so this uh, Morisco set up shop. He he wasn't going over. He had a business going in France to help them supposedly get through to France into the uh, North Africa. Right. It can be seen that. In the years before the expulsion, there were already a number of Moriscos living in Marcel and the south of France, all right? There was already mad Moriscos living there. They weren't trying to go anywhere. Relations with the local authorities and whose aim was to help the recently arrived travel on their final destination. In order to cross the mountain passes of the Pyrenees, a certain infrastructure was needed. The Moriscos also required someone on the other side of the border to show them which way to go. At the very least, the fleeing Moriscos needed direction and a map indicating the route to follow once they had arrived in France. All right, all this is confirmed by two cases of which we have some knowledge. There was network operations to help the, even the Moriscos were already set up in France. Because recent studies have highlighted the importance in the flight of Morisco capital and collaboration. All right, with Portuguese, what? Judeo conversos, all right, Moriscos collaborating with who? Portuguese Judeo Converso. What's the Judeo Converso? According to a number of the King's spies based in the south of France, the Judeo Conversos collected their money and jewels from Castilian Moriscos, listen to this, who were persuaded that it would otherwise be confiscated from them by the authorities at mountain passes or stopping places such as the Burgos. So it says, one of the most striking structural aspects of this team of the Morisco who left for France and other places with their wealth is that in the south of France, they associated with figures of very high social and economic standards in the years immediately before and after the expulsion. Again, assimilated into high positions, right? Becoming wealthy, right? Becoming the local people, the local government, just like they did in America politically and economically, socially, right? By linking their own interests to those of the Judeo conversos who had been settled in the country for some time, some Moriscos were able to set up an infrastructure of social and economic support for Moriscos, which acted as a safety net for certain Moriscos of high standing, All right? All right? The Moriscos in France at the expulsion notes for the history of a minority by Joseph L. Alaoui, 
Alawi, Alawi, I don't know how to pronounce it, expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain did not pass unnoticed among those living at the time, not only in Muslim countries, but also in Christian ones like France, like France, French, right? French, which would come to play very unwillingly a secondary role in the tragedy. Networks created by the expulsion. It would be worthwhile to explore more fully the following topics. Listen to this. Conversos of Jewish origin who helped Moriscos to take their property in secret out of the country and into where? France. Becoming what? Huguenots, right? Moriscos networks in France, both before and after the expulsion. Before and after, not because of the expulsion. They were already there doing networks or business, these Moriscos. Collaboration between Moriscos and conversos, meaning Jews, and between Moriscos and Protestants by winding in the past first phrase by Cardiac and remarkable individuals, Moriscos. The, these are the lines of inquiry that will be most fruitful for the history of the Moriscos and France. And this is Perez Sagorin, Rebels and Rulers, 1500-1660, Volume 2, Provincial Rebellion, Revolutionary Civil Wars by the Cambridge University Press, Provisional Rebellion, Moriscos and Huguenots. We have previously seen Spain's Moorish Christians. Their what? Their Moorish Christians were a separate people, ethnic community or nation, a term contemporaries used of them, forever divided from the old Christians among whom they lived. What set them apart was their Islamic heritage and common origin, settled in mainly in Valencia and Granada. They constituted in the latter province a compact minority, all of whom can say about colonism, no matter in what country and what and which period. All right, Braudel has observed was true in the reconquered kingdom of Granada, as their Christian faith was always suspect. As their Christian faith was always suspect, the Moriscos were subject to unremitting oppression by the old Christian population and the Spanish monarchy, right? So, they're talking about the same thing here as we just read. The Morisco rebellion was only one of number of revolts in which a provincial society defiance of sovereign authority was refracted through religion. We may see another example in the Huguenot revolts of the 1620s. In the case, a confrontation between a Protestant body and its Catholic ruler. The Huguenot saga in the 17th century France contained an event tragically similar to the expulsion of the Spanish Moriscos. Very similar. But now we know why, right? So they kept trying to get these Moors and Sephardic Jews out of their countries because these were Catholic countries. Eventually, they were winning power, these Catholics in these same countries where they were settling. So these people kept having to move. So that's why there's a, a similar uh, expulsion with the Huguenots and the Moriscos. For it was in 1685 that Louis XIV, after some preliminary persecutions, revoked the Attic of Nantes, which granted toleration to the Reformed Church. The king's Protestant subjects were thereby compelled to become Catholics or leave their country just like the Moors had to become Catholics or leave Spain, right? Between two and 300,000 Huguenots, it has been estimated emigrated in consequence. This act of tyrannous injustice like the Morisco expulsion was perpetrated in the name of unity and understood by an absolute sovereign. It says here, becoming Jewish in early modern France, documents on Jewish community building in 17th century Bayonne and Pere Orat. I right, this from the Journal of Social History, Volume 40, Number 1, pages 147 to 180. And we only got a preview of this. It's the title is The History of the Sephardi Jews in Southwestern France. Right? The history of Sephardi Jews in France began with the establishment in the mid 16th century of small enclaves of Iberian refugees in the regions of Les Landes and the Pyrenees Atlantics. The settlers, most of whom immigrated, of France in the 1600s and traced their familial origins to or through Portugal or so-called conversos or new Christians. All right, remember, so they became new Christians. And remember, Protestants, Protestants looked at like a Christian, kind of like a Christian faith, right? But these new Christians were really what conversos, what Moors and Sephardic Jews. And we had Moors earlier. We just got in the last book. All right, so new Christians, right? So how do they have, how do they go from uh, being uh, Jewish or Muslim to to Protestant? Well, there you go. This is the bare new Christian. That's the title. 
before they were known as Huguenots or Protestants, historians' treatments of these immigrants have typically paid much attention to the legal foundations of the Portuguese colonies, focusing in particular on the fact that the French crown granted the expatriates letters patentes in 1550 and renewed them periodically until 1776. These legal instruments permitted conversos to settle and trade in peace as a cohort of resident aliens, all right? Resident aliens, refugees. These are wool, the Sephardis and Moors in France. They are the refugees. Original re word refugee was applied to them. We're going to learn that the refugee word was applied to them originally. The merchants, all right, the merchants, remember these are merchants and other Portuguese called New Christians. They were called New Christians. They weren't Christians. Muslims and, and Sephardic Jews, people of color, again, merchandise. Uh, and so the standard narrative goes to finally shed their worst fears as life as Jews, relatively undisturbed, albeit under an almost transparent view of Catholicity. All right, so secret Jews. It says Judaism was tactically tolerated but had been banned in France since 1394. It would not be fully legalized until the late 18th century. All right. So this is just wanted to correlate. This is from the University of Arizona called Who Were the Huguenots? This is uploaded by Al Farag Shaniti. All right. So that says it doesn't give any much other description, but it says the Huguenots and the Jews entwined in the pathways of history. Pretty good what he was saying and how he was comparing certain things that make sense of what I was trying to say. Um, now it says here, um, from Spanish Jews to French Huguenots, right? That's like down in chapter five. We're going to go to that part. And it says here, searching for crypto Jews in France, from Spanish Jews to French Huguenots. All right, so there's other people saying this. There's an increase in interest concerning where the overt, unconcealed Jews and crypto secret Jews of Spain and Portugal settled after being exiled by the Inquisition. Morocco and other parts of North Africa, the Ottoman Empire, and Holland have been of major interest as Islamic or Protestant areas, which did not have a Catholic Inquisition. So they went to Protestant and Islamic areas, right? In these areas, exiles generally practice their Judaism openly. Portugal and later Spanish and Portuguese colonies in the Americas have been of major concern as places where the Inquisition was imposed, leading to crypto Jews secretly practicing Judaism. But little attention has been given to France, the only country besides Portugal and Morocco, a short distance by water in that border, Spain. All right, so France is basically right, right attached to Spain and then, you know, so, you know, why wouldn't they go there? France, because of its proximity to Spain, was a natural point of escape for Jews fleeing across the border. This was only slightly less likely for Jews fleeing Portugal. Jews had been officially excluded from France since 1394, and the border was officially closed to Jews, but a trip through the Pyrenees was a route taken by some exiles, a geographical imperative well nigh forced the new Christians, all right, new Christians of Spain and Portugal to take road to France, even if only as a way station for other places. Because of the persecution of conversos in Barcelona, Catalonia in 1488, in the Balearic Islands in 1489, flights to foreign countries, particularly to the southern provinces of France, began to assume panic proportions. In addition to the geographical proximity, before the expulsion of Jews from France in 1394, there had been a close relation between the Jewish communities of Spain and France, with Spain providing many of the leaders for the French Jewish communities. In 1550, France officially opened its borders and conversos fleeing Spain and Portugal were officially allowed to live in France. As Baynard notes, the proximity of the territorial border made it possible for conversos fleeing Spain and Portugal to maintain ties with their families who had remained there and to establish business connections. There we go again, merchant business connections supervised from France. Despite some overness, the non-French, suspiciously non-Catholic merchants Portuguese did live in tense balance and act. Scarcely 50 years after the recognition, the new Christians who had been in Bordeaux for less than 10 years were asked to leave and settled mostly in Pite Horaidi, Bidach, and Bayonne. In 1650, Louis the 13th published an edict demanding that all Jews, disguised or not, leave France in one month, but the Parliament of Bordeaux prevented the expulsion from taking place. In 1656, Louis XIV issued an edict which in effect confined the new Christians to the Bordeaux, Bayonne, and surrounding areas. The Novos Christians continued throughout this time to live within the frame of Catholicism, 
they were baptized, married, and buried according to the Catholic tradition and made no apparent attempts to reveal Jewish heritage. They were repeating the history of the Maranos of Spain. Slowly, however, the crypto-Jews of southwestern France began to be referred to as Jews, and the king and his advisors gave clear evidence that the future of these newly designated Jews was uncertain. By 1700, Louis XIV no longer believed in their Catholic camouflage and began to treat the merchant Portuguese as Jews. If viewed as Jews, they would have no status and would have to pay exorbitant taxes for rights that Novus Christians had always freely enjoyed. The worst was over, however, and gradually the Novus Christians returned to practicing Judaism and disciplined those members of the community who strayed from the community. In addition to the ups and downs in the Bordeaux and Bayonne areas, there were problems for crypto-Jews in other parts of France. In 1632, for example, in Rouen, 37 new Christians were arrested for their Jewish ways, and an auto de fe was possible. They declared their fidelity to Catholicism, paid money, and were released. All right, so they had to say, hey, all right, we'll be Catholics. While they were distinct Sephardic communities, all right, Sephardic communities, especially in Bordeaux, which eventually openly returned to Judaism. Most of the Sephardic Jews in France disappeared. All right, they disappeared, just like the Mayas and all these things, right? They became extinct, really. One theory claims that they later showed up in Holland, and another theory claims they merged into Catholicism in France. While it is clear that some of the families' names did show up later in Holland, it is not clear that all of the members of these families moved to Holland. Even if one agrees that most Sephardic and crypto Jews moved to Holland, the possibility remains that some members, descendants of the families, remained in France. The fact that the community attempted to discipline straying members indicates that some individuals hesitated to return openly to the community, recognizing individual differences. It also is unreasonable to believe that all exiles and their descendants were able to overcome the pressures of ups and downs of Christian eyes. So basically, He's getting to the point. He's like, where did? Because in history, they like they were there. A lot of them were there, but where did they go? The Sephardims who went to France as either overt or secret Jews found a religious situation very different from that in Spain and Portugal, particularly because of the rights of Protestantism in France. The rights of Protestantism, French Protestants, were called Huguenots, and France was significant for Jews. Protestantism and several factors that would make it more attractive than Catholicism for secret Jews who wanted a Christian outward identity or for Sephardim actually accepting Christianity over a period of decades. First, Protestantism, like Judaism, had mutual enemy in Catholicism because of the Inquisition's attack on both. The rise of Protestantism in Western Europe added to the insecurity of Catholicism and was one factor leading to the Inquisition. In Spain, Huguenots also were persecuted. The Huguenots were persecuted in Spain. In 1565, for example, in Pamplona, the capital of Spanish Navarre, there was an intensive roundup of active French Huguenots. While Pamplona was a major center of repression of Protestants, other areas also were similar. In Toledo, for example, in 1565, a tribunal made short work of a group of accused individuals, some who were Protestants. Second, Protestantism, like Judaism, had a special appeal to merchants and to the financially well-off and well-educated segments of society because the Protestants were also controlling that. All right, again, this is a network, a global network. They've had it for ages. Again, they basically, he's getting onto something, but these families that he's finding out had a connection from way back. They're, they're merchants. Third, and related to the second point, Protestantism had a special appeal in seaports and ship and areas of France, especially in La Rochelle area of western France on the Bay of the Biscay, about 200 miles from the Spanish border and about 80 miles from Bordeaux. Remember that the Sephardic Jews were being attracted to Holland because of their ports and the way they can go ship and the while they did the same, they went to these areas of France. The Sephardic and Huguenot areas of settlement overlapped to a noticeable extent. They were in the same area. Fourth, at its height, before their most severe persecutions under Louis XIV, Huguenots comprised one-tenth of France's population. The largest numbers were in western and southern France, the areas closest to Spain. As pressures periodically increased against the new Christians in France, the new Christians, remember who the new Christians were? Right, those were the Sephardic Jews and the Moors, the Muslims. And remember, Protestantism is, is a type of Christianity, so they can be considered, they can go into Protestantism if they're considered new Christians in France. It is difficult to believe that some did not overtly convert to Christianity. And if they did, it is reasonable that some would have chosen Protestantism rather than Catholicism in the period when Protestantism was still strong. 
get it. But he's saying Huguenots also had a mixed treatment in France, sometimes being good and sometimes suffering from much persecution because they were not Catholic. Thousands were killed, sent to prison, or had their children taken away. Louis XIV ended, ended Huguenot rights in 1685 and gave the Huguenots a short period of time to convert to Catholicism or go into exile. About 160,000 Huguenots went into exile and, and opened and about 850,000 openly converted to Catholicism. Similar to crypto Jews, some overly practiced Catholicism but remained crypto Protestants. All right, Paul Revere's family is believed to have been a crypto Protestant. Paul Revere, we already got that. He was a Huguenot. Remember, Huguenot, who are the Huguenots? There were times when it was safe to be a crypto Jew, overly practicing Catholicism, than to be a Huguenot. But in the earlier years, up to about 1572, it was safer to be a crypto Jew, overly practicing Protestantism, than to be an overt Jew. Throughout Huguenot history, French Protestantism had had a special affinity for Jews. The Huguenots, especially in the Languedoc area of southern France, later, beginning about 1700, referred to themselves as living in the desert, which they likened to the Hebrews living in the desert. The Huguenot shield had a burning bush in the middle, with God's name written in Hebrew. In the Nazi period, French Protestants had an admirable record of defending Jewish refugees. The Jews and Blacks in the Early Modern World. Jonathan Scorch is the author. Early modern non-Jews in Western Europe also appeared to be confused or ambivalent about the color status of Jews. The English Sir William Barrington visited one of the Sephardic synagogues in Amsterdam in 1635 and wrote that the Jewish men were most black and insatiably given unto women. In 1643, Isaac de la Peyrier contended that once the Jews convert to Christianity, they will no longer have this dark complexion. <laughs> they will change faces and the whiteness of their complexion will have the same brightness as an Englishman. John Greenholm visited the Jew synagogue in London and wrote a friend about it in 1662, describing the chief ruler, probably the president of the Parnassism, Parnassism as a very rich merchant. All right, who's the merchants? A big, black, fierce, and stern man. He was a big, black, fierce, and stern man. At the letter's end, Greenhaw reiterated with ethnographic precision that the hundred or so Jews he saw at the synagogue are all generally black so as they may be distinguished from Spaniards or native Greeks, right? A hundred or so, all of them in the synagogue, all right? This is in London, all right? England, the Jews, all right? Black, so-called black. For the Jews here has a deeper tincture of more perfect raven black. In 1690, the Reverend Robert Kirk of Aberfoyle visited the same church Alley Synagogue and in his depiction of the worship with almost identical ethnographic punctuation he said and this is quotes they were all very black men and indistinct in their reasoning as gypsies right just like the gypsies similar portrayals continued into the 18th century make sure if you haven't checked out my gypsy video to check that one out again we're just going over this remember now we know you know, it was Moors, so-called Moors and Sephardic Jews who were eventually adapting and converting, becoming crypto Jews, crypto Muslims, and taking on Christianity. You know, new Christians becoming a lot of them Protestants. And many did become Catholics as well, but a lot of them, most of them Protestants, all right? Century and later, William Black, Secretary of Commissioners, appointed by Governor William Gooch of Virginia to deal with the Indians described Hester Levy, a daughter of the wealthiest and best-known New York Jew, Moses Levy, whom he met in June 1744 as a very well-made, her complexion black, but very calmly. She had two charming eyes and well-turned with a beautiful head of hair, coal black, all right? As late as 1753, during the debate in England over that year's Jewish Naturalization Act, one polemicist suggested that anyone who wanted to look Jewish, all right, should rub herself with walnut husk to fix such an indelible hue and make you complete olive beauties with a lively complexion like that of the new Negro from the coast of Guinea. 
All right. We continue. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Thanks for tuning in. You know, I'm trying to uh, keep track of who's there. Same time I'm reading here. And uh, we go into this book. We've gone into it a lot before. Just wanted to highlight the part here that, that you know, relates to what we're talking about today. And it says here, the Jews also brought in much Negro strain. <laughs> so the Jews brought Negro strain. Some of the noblest of the Sephardic families, aristocrats of Jewry, were Negroes. Isaac da Costa, right? The da Costas, remember? Slave owners in South Carolina. Free people of color. The da Costa family, free people of color in South Carolina. Mentioned sons and grandsons of Don Jachia. Ben Jaish, who were royal treasurers, court physicians, astrologers, and royal favorites of the court of Castile in Portugal, one of whom was Don David Negro, who with uh, another illustrious Israelite, Don Judah, Don Judah, all right, Don Judah, he don't play. In the following year followed Dona or Dona Leonora, widow of Don Fernando whose favorites they had been in Castile. His name, Negro, is derived according to the author of the Chalcheth from Dos Negros, one of the three seniorities, which were given to his progenitor by the king of Portugal. Race mixture was so common, all right? Race mixture was so common in Portugal that even royal family was mulatto. So John the Fourth shows evident Negro strain and John the sixth was described as a dark mulatto by the French Duchess de Abrantes, who was at his court. And it's right. called When Scotland Was Jewish. Elizabeth. All right, so actually before, this is on minute 54. One second, guys. I got an other video I want to open and I'll show you guys. A little more references. Just in it case says here, it's called The Jewish Black. <laughs> so right here it says the Jewish blackness teases revisit it. All right. Hold on. Let's get the. Uh... It says abstract. The notion that in previous centuries Jews were considered to be black or seen as blacks has gained broad acceptance in scholarly discourse on the Jewish body since the early 1990s. The present article considers the notion an analyt analytically and then examines some of the evidence provided to support it. Much of this evidence does not stand critical examination. Therefore, arguably, the notion of Jewish blackness should be reconsidered. They can't debunk it. You know? A second. All right, so the notion of the blackness of the Jews or Jewish blackness has become commonplace in scholarly uh, discourse. Going back to the path-breaking work of... Sander L. Gilman in the late 1980s, scholars often assert that a strong European tradition dating back to the Middle Ages maintained that the Jews were black, or at least swarthy, and finds sharp expression in modern anti-Semitic literature. That in medieval literature, a theory prevailed in which the Jews were part of the black race, or were at least dark-skinned, or that the general look of the Jew was considered to be like that of the black, so-called black. This article is meant as a caveat or question mark on this prevailing notion all right so go to another part here so this is the book the natural history of man comprising inquiries into the modifying influence of physical and moral agencies on the different tribes of the human family by james cowley's uh richard okay and uh let's see what he's saying he's saying the jews have assimilated in physical character to nations among whom they have long resided all right so a lot of them have Assimilated meaning they have changed in appearance, in culture, and everything, right? So let's get to the juicy part. It says right here um, that the Jews, they wore beards, are very conspicuous. It says the Jews of Portugal, right? Portuguese Jews, we're talking about the same people who being expelled, right? With the Moors, it says the Portuguese Jews are very dark, are very dark. Use as it is well known have been spread from early times. All right, so the Jews of Portugal are very dark. Okay, it's here Shakespeare and the Jews. All right, I think we already got these references. Yeah, we just got these from the churches in Holland. All right, it says here uh, in this book, System of Geography, 
or a descriptive historical and philosophical view of the several quarters of the world and of the various empires, kingdoms, and republics which they contain, partially detailed, detailing those alterations which have been introduced by the recent revolutions. All right, so that's the name of the book. It's a very old book. Let me see. Volume 2. All right. 1805. All right, this is from 1805. It says, if this is true, but it says the Jews, a singular people, have been called into the assi ass assistance of the advocates for the influence of climate. They are known never to intermarry with any, any but those of their own sect. And notwithstanding, this is argued, we find them in different parts of the world, all colors. The English Jew is white, that's the hijack. A Portuguese Jew, swarthy. The American Jew, olive. And the Arabian Jew, copper colored. All right, so in general, melanated people, all right? So again, Portuguese, swarthy. All right, and that's about it on this one. Let me go back to the uh, video we had going. You guys remember what minute we were on? <laughs> oh, no. How are we going to go back now? All right. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Appreciate your patience. All right. Here with me. All right, I'm going to continue now. So now we know they were swarthy, right? Any questions? So Moors and Sephardic Jews are people with melanated uh, complexions. Isaac the Costa. All right. All right, John. Okay. And it's called When Scotland Was Jewish. Elizabeth Caldwell. Hirschman and Donald N. Yates. Michael served as a multilingual translator in Sicily and Palermo. In 1378, a master mason, John Lowen, has hired to refurbish the walls of Roxburgh Castle. Around 1400, a Parisian master mason, John Maru, or Moore, John Maru Moore, was commissioned to enlarge Melrose Abbey. All right, a Moore. All these people, the real architects, right? Of course, they're going to hire the real original architects, right? Those traits, patterns, capabilities, and names were most common to two ethnic groups at the time, Spanish Moors and Sephardic Jews. They were the ones doing that. They were the contractors. Not only did Islamic mercantilism far surpass that of Western Europe and Christendom, but Jews were well represented in all branches of European business and industry, with the possible exception of agriculture and foodstuffs preparation. Jews and Muslims came to dominate such fields as banking, shipping, chemical and pharmaceutical glass, silk and paper manufactured, the book trade and jewelry, precious stones during this time period. Continuing the book was called, it was Jewish says something about somebody's ancestry behind his family's French Huguenot roots in Charleston, South Carolina, draws attention to the fact that the Huguenot seal of 1559 had the same four capitalistic Hebrew letters, right? The J-H-V-H, the Tentagrammaton, engraved upon it within a burning bush, no less, as we found in Basalt on the title page of the Edward Robin Psalter in Aberdeen in 1623. Many of the Huguenots were formerly Jews and Moors. Again, what? Many of the Huguenots were formerly Jews and Moors. And in France, the persecution of Jews and Huguenots went hand in hand. Same people. The King Dragonarts came after both. They didn't just go after the, the Huguenots when they were getting rid of them in France. They were getting rid of their brethren, the Jews, the Sephardis. After both with equal ferocity, and often the same legislation was used to condemn so, them. So they part five LDS, so the Later Day Saints, right? So they were making a whole connection with the Later Day Saints and Sephardic Moorish people. 
It says that the displaced Jews, like so many tiny floating seeds from a milkweed pod, landed on the fertile ground in Holland, France, Scotland, Germany, Switzerland, and England, where they grew into the Protestant Reformation. Who? Displaced Jews or Moors. They became what? The Protestants. The Huguenots respected the Jews and Moors as children of Abraham. The Huguenots sought to protect the Jews and Moors. Why did the Huguenots protect Jews and Moors? Cecil Roth, a British Jewish historian, asserts many Huguenots were converts to Jews and Moors. That's why. Abraham Lavender, PhD professor of sociology and anthropology, points out that the Huguenot seal of 1559 has the same four Kabbalistic Hebrew letters, the Tentagrammaton, okay, engraved upon it with a burning bush. Hirschman and Jays have stated we propose that the Reformation, beyond being a movement against Catholicism, all right, beyond what they told us in history, that it was just a movement against Catholics should also be seen as a movement towards Judaism. Basically, it was the Jews and the Moors. It was the Moorish people. They were protesting, right? Protestants protesting the Catholics. They didn't want to be Catholics. I just sing a song. So etymology online of Huguenot, just, just before we get started, right? Huguenot, it was French Puritan. So now we're going to get into like, you know, the whole history of the Huguenots. Now, I wanted to go over all this information before this just to uh, uh, overstand their ethnicity their culture, their background. Now you're going to understand why they were getting persecuted all over Europe. Do you guys see why they were getting persecuted all over Europe? All right. Now watch this. So what, what happened? All these people eventually got together and they did what? They did what? When they got together, they took an oath. We're about to read that. All right. Thanks for uh, being here. We still got uh, a long way to go. Hope you enjoy. 1562. From so this is the uh, etymology of Huguenot. Middle French Huguenot, which according to French sources originally was a political, not a religious term. All right? Because now they want you to think it's a religious thing. The name was applied in 1520s to Genevan partisans opposed to Duke of Savoy who joined Geneva to the Swiss Confederation. And on the most likely guess, probably it is an alteration of Swiss German Eid Genos, Eid Genos, Hood Genos, Eid Genos, Confederate, all right, Confederate, all right, for everybody who knows Psalms 83, what we know about Confederate, Confederation, a Confederate, from Middle High German, Etigenos, all right, an oath, an oath, all right, it says comrade, comrades, cognate with Old English, Janit, comrade, companion, he with whom one shares possessions, thus Conrad, thing of value, possession, to make use of and joy, a hug and nut. All right, so what's a reform? You know, so it says in 1300 to convert into another and better form. To convert into another and better form. They were already something, right? They're converting, they're turning, they're changing into something else. From old French reformer, rebuilt, reconstruct, recreate. From Latin reformer to form again, change, transform, alter. From re again, form to form. In trace of sense for 1580s. Course of life, or well, down here it says reform, any proceeding which brings back to a better order of things. Oh, so now it's a little different, right? Any proceeding which brings back a better order of things. Let's bring order back. From reform and in some uses from re French reformment, a branch of Judaism. A branch of what? A branch of what? Judaism. As a branch of Judaism in 1843. Now, I did, I was like, what, what does this mean? So, I King Nosen, again, just want to make sure, Confederates. We got the etymology earlier. Confederates, right? And I actually got it in a Spanish Wikipedia. And I wanted to translate it. And it says, uh, I can... Konsenschaft is a German word that means confederation. The term can be literally translated as an oath of camaraderie, camaraderie, right? And I think Konsenschaft is a confederation of equals, a confederation of equals, which can be individuals or groups like states formed by a covenant sealed with a solemn oath, all right? Such alliances can be limited in time or eternal, all right? They can be eternal, meaning it's still going on today. Ladies and gentlemen, an important characteristic is that the parties are always considered equal 
unlike the feudal societies owe for fidelity with their strict hierarchies all right so what are these hugging us really what are they letting us know here what does this mean what does this mean it says here hugging us a name which the french protestants are often designated its etymology is uncertain they say according to some the word is popular corruption of the german eidgenossen conspirators conspirators confederates all right conspirators confederates which was used at geneva to designate the champions of liberty and of union with the swiss confederation as distinguished from those who were in favor of the submission of duke of savoy the close connection of the protestants with geneva in the time of calvin might have caused the name to be given to them a little before the year 1550 under the form eigenot or eignot which became hugnot hugnot all right you see how it'd be changing all right so under the influence of hugues best sons and hugues being one of their chiefs he was one of their hugues or conspirators right others have named after hugon a count of tours all right so they're trying to give us a whole explanation this is from the uh new advent uh online dictionary the catholic encyclopedia so now real quick just want to show this all right so just want to make sure we're clear uh etymology of huguenot a confederate a confederate people of comrades right what would cause what comrades now we know the background right sephardic jews more these all these people are getting picked out together so what do they do when they gather in south of france they become confederate confederate against who the catholics confederate against who else hmm <laughs> we'll see you know um but hey what do we know about confederate people psalms 83 and um yeah you know comrades conspirators you know you just we read the broke it down right that's the etymology of huguenot but we know their ethnic background so we understand why they're coming together as comrades now we're going to go into the some of the history of the huguenot you know uh, what they tell in mainstream, you know, who they are in France and and what happened to them, right? Being persecuted just like the so-called Moors and Sephardic Jews. Book, The Huguenot Bartholomew Dupé and His Descendants. All right, by Reverend B.H. Dupé. And down here it says, They declare their pedigrees after their families by the house of their fathers, Numbers 118. Hmm. In this book, um, in the introduction, says the rise and progress of the Huguenots, origin of the term Huguenot. The term Huguenot was originally a designation given about the middle of the 16th century to the Reformed or Calvinist of France. All right, we already got those definitions. You mean a return of the order, the old ways, the order? All right, taking over, a changing of something. The origin of the word is involved in great obscurity. It's very obscure. They don't want you to know what it means. But then they tell us what it means, right? Professor Mann, the distinguished German philologist, distinguished philologist of Berlin, has given no less than 15 explanations of its supposed derivation. The three most plausible need only be mentioned. It has been derived from a faulty pronunciation of the German Eidgenossen, Confederates, Confederates who were called Ignots, Ignots, a term applied to the Patriotic Party of Geneva who maintained themselves in the connection with French Protestants against the tyrannical attempts at Charles III, Duke of Savoy. They were trying to take over his kingdom. This was a favorite explanation of the origin of the word with those writers who represented the Huguenots as secret conspirators against the crown. All right, it says Huguenot Church. French Calvinists adopted the Huguenot name around 1560, but the first Huguenot Church was created five years early in a private home in paris it says here the origin of the name huguenot is unknown but believed to have been derived from combining phrases in german and flemish that describe their practice of home worship like practicing in secret right practicing in secret by 1562 there were two million huguenots in france two million huguenots in france with more than two thousand churches where did these huguenots come from all right we're gonna get to all this now it says here, this book, the Huguenots, their settlements, churches, and industries in England and Ireland by Samuel Smiles, LLD. Sixth edition, this is from 1889. And uh, this image on the left is basically the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Those who have studied, or if you study the Huguenot uh, history, that was one of their infamous days where they got massacred, right? Because uh, they had to convert or leave. 
you know, they weren't tolerating part of, part of, you know, Protestantism and where they were. So that's what happened. You're going to see that resembles somebody in history too, right? So it says the refugees thus found themselves exposed to an Anglican persecution. So they're talking about the Huguenots instead of a papal one. Rather than endured, several thousands of them left the country, abandoning their new homes. And in, again, risking the loss of everything in preference to giving up their views as to religion. I also remember, it wasn't so religion. About 140 families emigrated from Norwich into Holland, where the Dutch received them hospitably. All right, so they went to all the way to Hull, Holland, right? These Huguenots from France. And these Dutch people received them with no problem. We're going to see why too. Why? So the uh, Dutch, so-called Dutch, uh, this was New Amsterdam. Many Sephardic Jews were already there, set up shop. One of the, uh, the most successful uh, people at that time, you know, in uh, Holland. That's why. Why they received them with no problem and gave them house accommodation free. Free house accommodation. Why would they just do that? with exemption from taxes for seven years. You don't even have to pay taxes for seven years, hugging nuts. What I meant is New Jerusalem. I, didn't, <laughs> I said New Amsterdam. I meant New Jerusalem. They called Amsterdam the New Jerusalem. We've gone over this. During which they instructed the natives in the woolen manufacture of which they had begun before being ignorant. But the greater number of the exiles emigrated with their families to North America again again but but no they didn't end up in <laughs> anywhere else but the much greater number the majority of these Haganats exiles so-called Haganats emigrated with their families to North America here they came here to your land your ancestors land they came here America and swelled the numbers of the little colony already formed in Massachusetts Bay, which eventually laid the foundation of the New England states. All right, so we already got one account of them being in Massachusetts, right? So they were here from the beginning, right, with the pilgrims and all that. On arriving in Brandenburg, the immigrants proceeded to establish the colonies throughout the electorate. Nearly every large town in Prussia had its French church and one more French pastors. The celebrated Anne Young was pastor of the Church of Berlin, and many of the Protestant gentry resorted thither, attracted by his reputation. The Huguenot immigration into Prussia consisted of soldiers, gentlemen, men of letters and artists, traders, manufacturers, and laborers. All right, so Prussia, because you'll get in history a lot of so-called Prussians coming in, German Prussians, and a lot of those so-called Prussians were of this ethnicity, Moorish people, uh, Sephardic Jews, and many other uh, people that had settled there, you know, so we, we always think German, we think one way, you know, but yeah, a lot of people, a lot of Sephardic Jews were in Prussia as well, and the Palatine area of Germany. So the Palatines carry a lot of this blood as well. Numerous other bodies of the refugees settled in the smaller states of Germany and Denmark and Sweden and even Russia. All right. So, so far you're keeping track. They're all over the place, these Huguenots. All right. Others crossed the ocean and founded settlements abroad in Dutch Suriname. Where? In Dutch Suriname. America, Suriname. Dutch, they call it Dutch Suriname, the South America. At the Cape, all right, that's, uh, I believe, in uh, Cape Horn in South Africa and in the United States of America, in the colonies, all right? The settlement formed at the Cape of Good Hope was of considerable importance. It was led by a nephew of Admiral Duquesne and included members of some of the most distinguished families of France. Duplessis, de Mornay, Rubox, de La Fontaine, de Chavanis, de Villiers, de Pre, Le Roux, and Roux, all right, and it keeps going. It says, other settlements were established in the state of New York, at Albany, under their patron Van Rancelaer, and at Manhattan, where they were joined by a body of persecuted Van Duas from the south of France. At New Rochelle, also in Westchester County, another settlement was formed, which long continued to flourish among the descendants of these emigrants were the celebrated families of Jay and De Lancey, well known in the political history of the United States, all right? These people are well-known people, they're Huguenots. In Massachusetts, they formed several settlements in the celebrated Faneuil Hall at Boston, all right? If anybody's from New England or Boston even, I grew up in Boston, I know what Faneuil Hall is. There's this historic building right in the middle of downtown Boston, it's supposed to be really old from those colonial times. Like, if you don't really study, you don't really pay attention to it, but it's, it's historic.
Now, what I'm trying to say is, deep because, you know, I, I grew up in Boston again, and I used to go to Fannie Hall downtown, and people would probably go nuts to know or possibly even imagine that this might be a Moorish person or a person of color. All right, Fannie Hall. This guy, they named Fannie Hall after. And most likely, I'm telling you right now, he probably was, guys. And that's just the truth. When you think of the ethnicity of these people, All right, this is a lot of years ago. Things change over time. All right, it's a Windows Revolution place and with all these people met and a very famous landmark. I, but they're letting us know that this was a Huguenot place where the plea for national independence was so e early heard was the gift of the son of a refugee. Worcester in the same state was originally a Huguenot colony. All right, Worcester, Massachusetts. That's a Huguenot colony. Who's these Huguenots? We're going to get to that. In Maryland and Virginia, other settlements were formed. And from the Maoris and Fountainies of the latter state, some of the best blood of America has come. Hmm, what do you mean some of the best blood of America? So like what I was saying earlier about the names changing, so Fountainies in um, Spain, it would be like something like De La Fuente. De La Fuente of the Fountainies, of the Fountaine family. De La Fuente, De La Fontaines. All right, South Carolina was even styled the home of the Huguenots. Home of the Huguenots. Nearly a thousand fugitives having reached it from the port of ports of Holland alone. There they formed three colonies at Charleston, at Santee, and Orange Quarter at the Cooper River. The first pastor of the Huguenot Church at Charleston was Elias Prelieu, a descendant of Antoine Prelieu, Dogie of Venice in 1618. From the French settlers in Carolina have come the Ravenels, Travesans, the Peronus, the Lorenz, the Nevilles, the Bodinots, the Manigolds, the Marians, the Garis, the Hugers, the Gaylers, the Benorts, the Bayers, Dupres, Chevaliers, like Chevrolet, Chevaliers, right? And many illustrious Americans, many illustrious Americans. All right, we're going to see how many. But Holland and England constituted the principal asylums of the exiled Huguenots. Holland in the first instance and England in the next. Many of these refugees passing from the one country into the other in the course of the great political movement which followed up close upon the revo revocation of the Edict of Nantes. All right, we're going to hear a lot about this Edict of Nantes if you've never heard about it. So many of these people ended up in Holland, they're telling you right now, and England. So remember that. So two, three hundred years later when they come to the colonies, or even 50 years later when they come into the colonies, you know, they're being labeled English or Dutch Holland but they're really French hugging nuts, all right? Get what I'm saying? So we're going to see a lot of this as we go. So there was also a large number of destitute landed gentry, professional men and pastors to whom the earnings of a livelihood was extremely difficult. And these also had to be relieved out of the fund. From the first report of the French Relief Committee, dated December 1687, that is, only 14 months after the revocation, appears that 15,500 refugees had been relieved in the course of the year of these, says why 13,050 were settled in London. All right, so all over the place. 600 of them for whom it could not find employment in England were sent at, at its cost to America. America, they were just sent to America. Sent how? Remember, they had to pay their way. They weren't just getting free rights, and the only way they were able to do that is through indentured servitude. They had to work their way seven years most of the time, from four to seven years, to gain their freedom again, and maybe possibly they can own land too and be wealthy, unless they were already coming with a deal that they would have land granted to them and their own indentured servants through some deals they made, you know, depending on their status, right, where they were coming from. These people, uh, we know that's far. All right, so what I want to just uh, explain in case, you know, I didn't explain it uh, too much uh, in this presentation is the whole history, you know, French Huguenots were, uh, you know, welcomed to practice their Protestantism for a while under one of the Lewises, Louis the Fourteenth, I, I believe, or the one before him, and then about you know another time, another period, another Lewis comes, and this is what they're saying: the revocation. So all of a sudden, like, nope, you got to be Catholic, no more Protestantism. So all of a sudden, all these ex Moors and Sephardic Jews who were secretly practicing all their, <laughs> you know, beliefs and practices and all that under the banner of being new Christians had to leave they couldn't even be protestants anymore because you know what the catholics knew 
there's a reason why they went after and persecuted the Huguenots and Protestants. And I hope you, you guys are starting to see that. The same people being persecuted from the Iberian Peninsula, mostly. All right. So now we're going to keep going. Just wanted to go and break that down. Pretty uh, Jews. A lot of them ended up and were very successful in, in their commerce and business in, in, in Holland and the Dutch Republic, um, you know, which also happened to be one of the places where the Huguenots were able to go after they were refugees and uh, become very successful too. As it says here from the Brigham Young University, uh, Le Grand Arch de Fugitives, Huguenots in the Dutch Republic after 1685 by Michael Joseph Walker from the Brigham Young University Provo. And right here, page 14 of this book, uh, article says resettlement in the Netherlands was somewhat more successful for the Huguenots than in the British Isles. In both locations were the most receptive as compared to anywhere else because of cultural and linguistic, linguistic structures provided by the pre-existing Walloon churches. The greater number of Huguenots settled in the Dutch Republic as opposed to any other single place. In the Netherlands, the Huguenots retained their separate culture and identity for the longest time of any of the areas of resettlement, arguably into the 19th century. However, they also managed to be integrated into Dutch society. The Huguenots were attractive to the Dutch because of their skills importing in the Dutch economy. Doesn't that sound like how they were also allowing the Sephardic Jews to settle in, in, in Amsterdam and all these places because they were going to be so important to the economy as well? And also their reformed religion which matched so well the religion of the Dutch Reformed Church. Indeed, the Dutch communities to which the Huguenots fled greatly benefited from the additional talent, wealth, and devotion these refugees brought and generated. Refugees, just like Sephardic Jews. Alice Clear Carter suggests that the Dutch readily accepted and invited skilled, talented, or wealthy foreigners. She argues that while other countries were rejecting religious diversity, the Netherlands, especially Amsterdam, embraced the skilled individuals who helped create the Dutch Golden Age, regardless of religious confession. However, the religious confession of the Huguenots happened to match very closely the sentiments of the Dutch Reformed Church, making them even more attractive than other sorts of refugees. Amsterdam was a city where toleration flourished. Remember that Amsterdam, many Sephardic Jews were prospering there and had control of the commerce in Amsterdam. And also, so these Huguenots, if they wanted to do business, they had to do business with the Jews, basically their own people from ancient times in Spain and Portugal, and also provide a ready market for their Huguenot refugee industrial skills. The Huguenots enriched the communities where they made new homes. Their commitment commitments to the new communities left a lasting cultural impact where they settled. In fact, the most skilled Huguenots migrated to the Netherlands because the Dutch Republic found quick use for their skills. Various cities even competed with each other, competed with each other in the Republic to attract the most skilled refugees. William III of Orange also encouraged the towns to support the Huguenots as part of his effort to gain political favor amongst Protestants around the Republic and England and to combat the policies of his political opponent, Louis the 14th. Furthermore, the states of Holland offered generous funds, which also served as propaganda against France and emboldened the Dutch to help Huguenot refugees. The Dutch army also benefited from the Huguenot exodus from France, as Louis the 14th had previously employed Huguenots as soldiers and officers. All right, so that was just a little quick thing. Just wanted you to see that, yeah, they were also Huguenots, just like the Sephardi Jews became very prosperous and were settling in, in Holland and becoming Dutch citizens. All right. All right, so now we get into this journal. Huguenot Merchants and the Protestant International in the 17th Century. By J.B. Bosher, the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 52, Number 1, from January 1995, pages 77 to 102. Again, Huguenot Merchants and the Protestant International. The Reformation of the 16th century created religious conflict in France that lasted for two centuries and in some respects even longer. In the 17th century phase of this conflict, church and state made efforts to destroy the Calvinist heresy that had taken root in the kingdom. A vigorous Roman Catholic resurgence, the Counter-Reformation, gave these efforts great force. Consequently, several waves of emigration brought Huguenots to Protestant parts of Europe. The word refugee Again, the word refugee, just like the uh, Sephardi Jews were being called refugees, was invented to describe them. Refugee was invented for the Huguenots. Some of them found their way to the English colonies of North America. 
particularly after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. By then, large communities of French-speaking Protestant refugees had been gathering, had gathering in the Dutch Republic. All right, they already were in the Dutch Republic. Why? And who was also there? Sephardic Jews, right? The Dutch. They brought prosperity during the same time. These Jews, and though the Huguenots were also going there, Huguenots possibly ex Sephardic Jews, ex Muslim Moors. So they're just meeting up with their ancestors, their cousins, their families that were already in, in Dutch there as Sephardic Jews. The first French church in London was established in 1550. The refugees who left France in the generations that settled in America were not only joining the Protestant colonies of English North America, but were also joining a cosmopolitan diaspora, a Protestant international, a diaspora, just like the Sephardic Jews and Moors, right? Merchants stand out as one of the more robust elements in the Protestant international. Merchants. Who was the merchants? Again, merchants, Protestants, Huguenots. It's the same titles. They're doing the same thing in the same places. All right, that book just told us that a lot of these Moors that were expelled from Spain and Portugal became Huguenots in France. You see how it all connects. Right? Merchants stand out as one of the more robust elements in the Protestant international. They frighted ships. They freighted ships. All right, who was also doing that? Sephardis and Moors with goods for sale abroad sent sons and nephews across the seas and as agents in order to extend their trading circles just like the Sephardic Jews were doing and corresponded with foreign trading partners such business practices gave them international contacts stronger than those of the soldier and artisans of the Huguenot dispersion and different from those of the intellectuals the correspondence of refugees such as Pierre Bale, Pierre Jury, Jean Leclerc and Jean Telofil de Saguilers was abundant and full of ideas, a major part, of, indeed, of the early Enlightenment. Letters between merchants were humdrum exchanges of information about prices, commodities, and transactions, but behind them were family relationships. Family. Behind all those titles and tags was what? Family relationships, just like Sephardic uh, research we just did, about how they had their family connections all over. Same thing, the hugging us, right? Who are these Huguenots that formed the heart of the Protestant International? The overseas business of Huguenot merchants flourished in the atmosphere of personal trust based on common religion and carefully common religion and carefully fostered relations of scattered families. Posting a relative abroad as a trading partner reduced the risk of fraud and all merchants, Catholic and Jewish, as well as Huguenot did so because they knew the difficulty of collecting debts. They all did so, right? But Huguenots were particularly well endowed with relatives abroad as a result of the persecution that drove them from France and from, before that, Spain and Portugal. Even after the decrees of May 18 and July 14, 1682, and several more in 1685 and 1686 made emigration a crime punishable by slavery in the galleys or even death, as persecution intensified during the 1680s, Huguenot merchants' colonies in Amsterdam London, Rotterdam, and elsewhere grew larger than the foreign communities and French ports, and their numbers swelled dramatically after the revocation of Edict of Nantes by the addition of the merchants among the 150,000 to 200,000 new refugees. Until then, the mercantile part of the Protestant International had been largely composed of English and Dutch merchants, together with Walloon refugees from Spanish Netherlands. These were Jews. They're talking about Jews. They ain't telling you in this article. They're calling these people hugging us, but these are all, we just read all the info, right? Who was on these areas doing the trade and doing business until then? But the late 1680s were a turning point when the French element became substantial. Huguenots took an active part in the phenomenal expansion of the Anglo-Dutch and Anglo-American trade in North Atlantic. The diaspora of Huguenot merchants has been an elusive historical subject. This is partly because the wrecks are scattered and the merchants do not fit easily into the national history of our any country, you see? See how they don't make sense? Because these are Sephardic Jews and Muslim Moors, crypto conversal Moranos, Moriscos. Historians tend to classify Huguenot merchants with other immigrants, and so to miss their essentially cosmopolitan character. Much Canadian American history treats the people who reached North America as though they had turned their backs on Europe, but the Huguenot merchants at least had not. Canadian historians usually ignore the Huguenots of La Rochelle and Bordeaux, who carried on much, sometimes most of the trade with New France, presumably on the ground that they were not Canadian. Read here, so again, remember the Huguenots had to go. All right, so. They're going all over the place, right? <laughs> the Huguenots. Huguenots, okay? 
Yeah, so uh, this is uh, re we're watching excerpts of uh, old videos, right? But we're doing a remastered version. This is way better. There's a lot of uh, small talk and all that in those uh, videos. But let's get to the point. Yeah, a lot of uh, your ancestors labeled as merchants. Yeah, you got to really look into that. It actually does. Uh, most of them are, are most likely Sephardic, Jewish, Huguenot, you know, Moorish people. Uh, a lot of those trades, you know, uh, were uh, from them. All right, the merchants, you know, they were the ones dealing with the money. All right, so before we continue, I just want to go ahead and read another book. We're going to do it live since we're here. Let's put that the music. All right. Okay. So it says Huguenot Heritage, the history and contribution of the Huguenots in Britain. All right. Oh, wow. I clicked on it and it got, went right where I wanted it. There we go. We'll go to chapter two. All right, hold on. Let me, um, because I didn't, I didn't name the author. Okay, some people like the sources. <laughs> and this is by Robin D. Gwynn, Senior Lecturer in History, Massey University, New Zealand, okay? New Zealand. So we go to Chapter 2. It says, The Huguenot Settlements in England. It says, Given the chronology of persecution in France, it is not surprising that French Protestants were to be found seeking refuge abroad from the 1520s onwards, especially in the 1560s and 1570s. Emigration diminished in the early 17th century, briefly reviving in the 1620s, but it intensified sharply from the late 1670s and peaked in the 1680s. Therefore, thereafter, it was more sporadic, intensifying anew in the late 1740s and early 1750s then dying away altogether during the second half of the 18th century. Jean Migault was typical of the Huguenots and fleeing his country only when faced by an emergency. Although men sometimes left ahead of or separately from their families, there was no conscious process of chain migration whereby refugees, as they settled in a new land, sponsored the migration of kingsfolk or fellow villagers from their homelands until a section of the original community had been transplanted, nor did the countries to which the refugees fled appoint state officials to assist their passage. In contrast to the case of Salzburg in 1731, when all Protestants over the age of 12 were expelled, and Prussia, we just read about Prussia, right, promptly appointed special commiss commissaries to organize their relief and transport. In the 16th and early 17th centuries, Huguenot refugees often hoped to return home when conditions improved. But after the Dragonades and the revocation of the decision to emigrate was likely to be permanent. Their French background could hardly have been more effective in preparing the Huguenots for a refugee environment. They had never been anything other than an exposed minority. Listen, remember who they really are, Sephardic Jews and Moors. Every official document reminded them of their isolation since they were always referred to as belonging to the so-called Reformed Religion, or RPR, Religion Pretendu Reforme. They were used to living in fear, and their survival depended on the development of inner certainty and fortitude. We have seen that they were not a microcosm of French society as a whole, but were mostly artisans or burgesses, right? The middle class, the burgesses. They, they possessed therefore commercial and craft skills and an unusually high degree of literacy. Such assets were portable. They could readily be taken from country to country and from town to town. As opportunities beckoned, had the Huguenots been predominantly a rural, landed, or peasant group, their history in exile would have been very different. As it was, they were welcome in many parts of Europe. All right, because of their skills, remember who they are, Sephardic Jews and Moors, because of their skills and culture, their background, the Huguenots were welcome everywhere they went. As it was, they were welcome in many parts of Europe and the wider world, and for good reason, they blessed the lands that adopted them with commercial advantages, as well as with a rare combination of integrity and determination. You got to understand, they preferred this over death, right? The Catholics were after them. The Catholics were after them. Much love and respect to Frank Ritchie. Thank you for the donation. One outcome of their education, their beliefs, their commercial interests, and Calvinist international coordination was that even while in France, the Huguenots developed contact elsewhere, all right? So remember, we just read 
how they had this chain network of families, right? Really, it wasn't just about religion. Families, families, ties to the Iberian Peninsula, these families that have been persecuted all these years throughout Europe. They start setting up networks everywhere. Just like the Sephardic Jews and Moors, they start setting up networks everywhere. We've read all this. It's the same people, same persecution. Calvinism in Geneva, in La Rochelle, in London, in Amsterdam was interlinked. All right. All these had Huguenot people in them. This made the decision to emigrate more acceptable. The process of taking refuge that much easier. The choice of destination greater. Before the world of international Calvinism had developed, the earliest refugees slipped across the border of other to other French-speaking areas, notably the southern Low Countries and parts of Switzerland, huh? Flemish? Their impact on the places to which they went was considerable. Indeed, was partly re responsible for the development of Calvinist internationalism. It can be encapsulated by a brief look at the fascinating history of the Reformation in another area they evangelized, the islands of Jersey and Guernsey, all right? The Channels Islands were in a very curious political and religious position. In the first half of the 16th century, they were small, rather isolated, and much closer to France than England. Yet still, in the hands of the Tudors, after almost all the continental mainland possessions, once ruled by their predecessors, had fallen to the French king, the islands were fortified frontier posts in sight of enemy country. Their inhabitants spoke French, all right? So it almost sounds like they were moving amongst kingsmen that had already been in the Channel Islands for years. All right, these so-called Tudors. Who's the Tudors? Oh, yeah, we got many references of them being so swarthy. Oh, yeah. So they spoke French, these inhabitants, used livres tournois and not pound sterling and were subject to Norman law. But they were as anti-French as they were un-English, as part of their Norman heritage. Their ecclesiastical links were with Normandy rather than England. Their bishop was the Bishop of Countenance, and continued to be so throughout the Henrician and Edwardian reformations. The Catholic reaction under Mary and part of the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Protestant ideas and hostile encounter, sorry, countermeasures developed more swiftly in France than in England, and Normandy was affected at early stage. In 1528, laymen were burned for heresy at Rouen and countesses, and three women at Avranches, both because of their closeness and because they spoke French, therefore had no educational opportunities in England. Channel Islanders were inevitably influenced by events in Normandy. Although we cannot name French Protestant teachers active in Jersey and Guernsey before Edward VI reign. There is good reason to believe they had been at work for years. The Channel Islanders had a long tradition of vocal and pertinacious defense of their rights and were well aware that in the last resort, it was both difficult and apolitic for the English Privy Council to insist on its own way in such a remote, foreign, and beleaguered part of the realm. At the time of the Reformation, they were protesting loudly about various political matters. Yet only one or two lone voices were raised against the Westminster Acts introducing Protestantism. Parish fraternities, obits, endowments left for masses to be said on the anniversary of a person's death, and chantry chapels abounded in the islands. But their suppression gave rise to no apparent protest. Protest, right? Protestant, protestant, protest. Wayside crosses were destroyed with a will. And when in 1549 the Act of Uniformity did away with Latin services, these were at once abound, abandoned. Indeed, the Privy Council wrote to thank the islanders for their speedy action. They can hardly have adopted Cranmer's English prayer book, which they would have found even less intelligible than Latin. The historians of Jersey, G.R. Boleyn, suggest that Calvin's prayer ecclesiastics were used instead. During Mary's reign, when an attempt was made to resume the Maundy procession of St. Helier, Two youths marched in front of carrying a dead toad on a gibbet. Such an offense would surely have merited the death sentence in France, probably too in Marian England. In Jersey, all that was required of the offenders was that they find security for good behavior. Clearly, Protestantism was too strongly entrenched for more forceful action to be acceptable. The Huguenot Richhead that had been established in the Channel Islands was of enduring value to refugees escaping France. 
And we will see later that the form of worship developed there over the next century exercised an important influence on the nature of later Huguenot churches in England. While the earliest French Protestants to reach England included those leaving Normandy for Jersey and Guernsey, the first major influence of refugees came not from France at all, but from the southern Low Countries. These were therefore Walloon-speaking rather than French-speaking Huguenots, all right? Walloons and Huguenots, same people. But they were rapidly joined by Frenchmen alongside whom they worshipped and with whom they shared in English eyes a common identity. From the time Lutheranism first spread until just before the end of the century, the conglomerate of provinces that made up the Low Countries was ruled by only two monarchs, Charles V, right, the Catholics, right, Swarty Charles V, yes, so-called black man, until his abdication in 1555, and Philip II, all right, his son, both were staunch defenders of Catholicism. So this is what it really is about, war between ex-Sephardic Jewish Moorish Muslim people who became new Christians, Protestants, they're still the same people, right? They're still crypto secret hiding, practicing their old beliefs. They're just outwardly, we're going to read later on, outwardly Protestants, outwardly Huguenots. Huguenot means confederation of comrades, conspirators, right? Conspirators against who? The Catholics. Both were staunch defenders of Catholicism, right? Charles V, their willingness to use the Inquisition to enforce their desires ran counter to the wishes of their subjects who held an unusually tolerant point of view. Lutheranism and Anabaptism reached the area early. When Calvinism arrived, it first took root in the great old towns of the South, and as we have seen, its development in France and low countries remained closely interwined. After the English Reformation, the long-standing close trading links between England and the low countries, as well as the proximity of the Channel, made it inevitable that those fleeing persecution, again, persecution, people being persecuted, would head for London. A few Protestants from the area arrived even before the Henrician Reformation, following closely on the heels of the earliest Lutheran books, which are known to have reached England by 1519. It was to be another decade before the French king was calling on Henry to repatriate French heretics who had sought refuge in his realm. Persecution in the Low Countries became acute only after the ascension of Philip II. Calvinism grew rapidly in the Netherlands, in the 1560s, the large numbers of Calvinist refugees reached England in 1562 and 63 after the outbreak of religious wars in France. Many more followed in 1567 and 8. After the first revolt in the Netherlands failed, the Duke of Alba arrived there with Spanish and Italian troops and implemented policies based on fear and bloodshed. Another large influx occurred at the time of the Second Revolt in 1572 and 3. The provinces of the Low Countries under Spanish control remained unsafe for convinced Protestants, and many left during the remainder of the century, seeking sanctuary either to the north, where the Union of Utrecht eventually joined a group of provinces in a fighting alliance against Spain or across the Channel, right, against the Catholics. It is impossible to state precisely how many religious refugees were in England at any one time. Numerous returns of aliens in the London area were compiled under Elizabeth and the early Stuarts, inspired either by the government fears about possible riots in the capital and plots against the royal person, or since aliens were heavily taxed by economic motives. The evidence seems ample, but it is difficult to interpret. Contemporaries had problems defining the word alien. Extant, return, extant returns are not always concerned with the same region. It is not always clear whether the returns relate only to men or to women and children as well. Above all, it is hard to know how many of the aliens were inspired to come primarily by religious motives. For the purposes of this book, the most relevant of the early returns is that of 1573, the year after the massacre of St. Bartholomew in France, right? When they massacred the Huguenots, we're talking about the Catholics, and the outbreak of the Second Revolt in the Netherlands. Now, don't think it was one way. There was many histories where... The Protestants were doing it, massacring the Catholics. And in this instance, the massacre of St. Bartholomew was the Catholics doing it to the Protestants, all right? Remember, Oliver Cromwell, he was a Protestant, and he did the same to the Catholics, and he kicked them out, right? Remember the Jacobites, right? They were Catholics. Well, they were under the banner of Catholics. <laughs> so, 
again, he's talking about the main one we're going to talk about is the massacre of St. Bartholomew in France and the outbreak of the Second Revolt in the Netherlands. It suggests that there were 5,315 members of the various foreign churches in and about London, of whom just under a half had come for reasons of employment rather than religion. As a result of the troubles of the continent, substantial numbers of refugees came to England in 1572 and 1573 of Southampton, where a foreign church with 116 communicant members had been formed in the winter of 1568 and 8. The civic authorities now order references of newcomers to be listed in case spies tried to take the opportunity to enter the country. While the Rye, the major reported to Lord Burghley that 641 refugees arrived between 27 of August, just after the massacre, and 4 of November, 1572. There is no evidence that any newcomers swelled the large stranger community at Norwich, which in 1571 already numbered nearly 4,000, or getting for a third of the city's population, almost a half of the 4,000 were children and about a sixth had been born in England, nor does much smaller Dutch settlement at Maidstone seem to have been affected. On the other hand, the community of 406 foreign Protestants originally settled in Sandwich in 1561 grew greatly and was about to spawn the Paterbury settlement. It had previously been responsible for that at Ch Colchester, where, according to a return of 1573, there were 534 foreigners. These figures show that foreign Protestant churches in England had well over 10,000 members as early as 1573, and the majority of them were religious refugees, all right? So again, remember who they applied the word refugee to. It was first applied to Huguenots. This is who they're talking about. Over the next generation, the number of aliens in the country grew substantially, all right? Again, Huguenots, a.k.a. more Sephardic Jews. Let's not forget. Peaking in the 1590s, both in the capital and the provinces, the Norwich community grew despite the loss of 2,408 members to a plague in 1578 and 9 and was numbered at 4,679 in 1582. Plague likewise hit Southampton with great severity in 1583 and 84, but although over 70 members of the foreign church died, there had been only 25 deaths in the previous five years. It still had 186 communicants in August 1584. The other congregations increased too. It was certified from Colchester in 1586 that there were 1,293 Dutch settlers, of whom 504 were children born in England. Although the community of Rye had returned to France by the 1590s, the Canterbury settlement was flourishing. And when the consistory there investigated the situation in 1597, it found the church had more than 2,000 members. There may have been as many as 3,000 a few years earlier. The total figure for all the foreign churches in the realm at the time must have exceeded 15,000. The French churches in England represented at colloquies between 1581 and 1604. Dutch churches represented, all right. So French and Dutch, so-called French, so-called Dutch, Moorish Sephardic people, heritage, right? <laughs> the so-called Protestants, Protestant, being persecuted by the Catholics, all right. Now it goes on to explain who these people become. Many bankers, right? Many important people in England, very financially stable now. So I just wanted to read that. So again, you can see, you can pursue. This is another source if you want to read the whole thing. Pretty good book. If you're interested in the Huguenots in England. All right. We're going to go back to the uh, video. All right. And we're going to continue. Oh, wow. Wherever they said was a protestant friendly area many of them ended up in ireland england scotland right a lot though a lot a large amount landed up in ireland and by the time a lot of them made it over to america they were considered irish irish now remember i was telling you about all these irish coming over here as indentured servants and all that and so-called black irish all right Just giving you a hint here so it says irish huguenots were originally French Calvinists, oh really, who following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 departed from France rather than convert to Catholicism. The Dublin writer Charles Maturin, who was said, used to sit in Marsh Library with a host pa pasted on his forehead to indicate that he was composing and should not be disturbed, was from a Huguenot family. And all about 40,000 Huguenots settled in England 
with perhaps a quarter of that number coming to Ireland. The literary impact of the Irish Huguenots in their host country was significant in relation to their overall numbers, especially in the 19th century. The English Huguenots barely registered in the area of literary production over their first two centuries in England. Daphne du Maurier, Marie, Marie, Mar, Mar, who published in the 20th century, is that community's most notable liter literary figure. On arrival in Ireland, many of not most Huguenots conformed to the established church. They conformed, as was expected of them by the authorities. They assimilated, right? They confirmed, right? They weren't Huguenot anymore. And a good number of them prospered within the politically and economically dominant world of Irish Protestantism. The name Latouche is long associated with banking in Dublin. Latouche, banking, again, Huguenots banking, Latouche banking who's the bankers remember dublin what did dublin mean again do you guys remember dub dub is black dublin means black the original david latouche fought with king william at the boyne and later laid the basis of his fortune through astute land purchasing in the saint stephen's green and angier street areas of the city diolier street is named after jeremiah diolier a huguenot who was high sheriff in dublin and a founder of the Bank of Ireland. Again, another banker and another founder of another bank, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Is that a French name? Jeremiah? Huh? He established what? The Bank of Ireland. Here we go, another bank, right? Money, commerce, merchants. Today, Lefroy, who was to become Lord Chief Justice of Ireland, was another. Lefroy is more famous today as the man who flirted with and may have even toyed with the feelings of incomparable Jane Austen. Austen was working on the Pride and Prejudice when she knew Lefroy, some say Darcy modeled on Lefroy, while others maintain it is the character of Elizabeth Bennet that is based on the quick-witted Anglo-Irish Huguenot. Brigham Young University from Provo, Utah says research to Huguenot settlers in Ireland. All right, so it says the French Protestants who came to Ireland, all right, so French Protestants that came, so-called French Protestants, is that the beginning of their history? Who came to Ireland after the revocation of the Attic of 1965 were from many different regions of France. Many different regions had Huguenots and from a wide spectrum of backgrounds. What? But I thought they were all the same. A wide spectrum of backgrounds? The Huguenots are of a wide spectrum of backgrounds. Laborers, artisans, craftsmen, tradesmen, and merchants, along with their wives and children, were joined in the period by some 1,000 disbanded military officers, many from whom, from noble backgrounds, who were pensioned in Ireland after serving in King William III's army in Ireland, all right, in Flanders in the 1600s, like 1680s, 1690s, and in later campaigns under Queen Anne, mostly on the Iberian Peninsula. Both, all right, on the Iberian Peninsula. Both Robin Gwynn and Raymond Hilton have estimated the total number of refugees who arrived in the period 1670, 1685 to 1720 to have been in the region of 10,000, though some other historians argue for a lower figure. In any event, the number of immigrants declined significantly in the 1720s, with many opting to move on elsewhere, especially to England and America. And America. It should be noted that scarcely any Huguenots traveled to Ireland directly from France. Most first fled to neighboring countries, such as the Netherlands. So they became Dutch. They became what? Germans. They became what? Swiss. Finally reaching Ireland. You see all these backgrounds they're talking about, right? Who's these people? They assimilated everywhere they went, all right? Via England, and they were always on the move, all right? So it says here, the history of the Huguenot emigration to America by Charles W. Baird. All oh, right, all right. So... Uh, real quick, guys, before we continue with that book, The History of the Immigration of the Huguenots to America, <laughs> I'm going to go over to uh, this uh, newspaper right here. All right. It's the Staunton Spectator. This is on 28th of July, 1863. Special report. Special report, all right? So it starts talking about... Let me see. Okay, so... Says from the Atlanta Intelligence, a common story, a cousin Norma. And I uh, really, <laughs> I don't understand what she's talking about there. But then up here, I don't know if it's related, right, to the same, but it seems to be related to the same. It says, 
sensuous Italy with its crumbling decay, its lassitude, its women and its wine, its classic hills and valleys, its decay, its barbaric and modern ruins, its faded glory and dreamy mist of a sensuous and luxurious religion resting on all we see and feel. It is a living dream. Our footsteps wandered to Spain, tired of the Levant. We dreamed our way to the land where our ancestors, the Huguenot Moors, again, our ancestors, the Huguenot Moors, in the golden days of long ago, held high route and revel where the Neva Nevada and Morena, 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 stretched their misty blue outlines into an ethereal heaven which seemed to meet the dreamy palaces and gorgeous structures of the luxurious conquerors from the Orient, where Eastern splendors culminated in that master's work of art and beauty which rested on the banks of the Darrow has ever been the wanderer and mecca of travelers. Whoever visited Spain and failed to pay his hard tribute at the grand and mysterious shrine of the Alhambra, I'm sorry, Alhambra, the Mahometan gains his idea of the Elysian heaven from the Ar arabesque and monumental beauties of the East. Here he made an earthly paradise, and amid its mystic scenes and magic endearments, its brilliant colors and gold and luxuriant flowers, my son, more than ever looked out over the broad expanse of earth and sea and rested at home where Josie lived and love is truthful. All right? And it keeps going. But just wanted to go ahead and point that out. She knows her genealogy and her ancestors, the Huguenot Moors, right? Huguenot Moors. And uh, what I wanted to point out a little bit is and a lot of these uh, uh, newspaper articles, you know, it's random, right? So like, for example, this one, the Vermont Patriot and State Gazette from 1859. So here, the Moors, it may not be generally known that some of the best. Okay, so this is actually what we already read. Sorry. So it says Granada, the stronghold of the Moors down here. We read that a lot of the Granada Moors ended up in, um, you know, south of France. It was the same way in France. The Calvinists are Huguenots. So what they're talking about is how they were exiled and persecuted the Moors. And then they're saying it's the same thing for the Huguenots. All right. That was in the Pittsfield Sun from 1899. All right. And the Wayne Herald from 1942. Says Europe has long been a cauldron of hate. History affords untold examples of persecution of minority groups. The Reformation in Germany. Henry VIII, Huguenots, Moors, and Jews in Spain. Jews in Germany are examples, all right? All the same people now that you understand who the Huguenots are, right? Do you over, do you see why it's the same? All right, the Sunday Times, May 1990. What does it say here? It says... That Ferdinand and Medici was very fond of Jews. When the Hebrew was be, be, being pursued, pursued with great vigor all over Europe, right? When they were being persecuted, the Florentine baron Rothschild, all right? The Rothschild of the 16th century was, by the grace of God and the foolishness of the Pisans overlord of Pisa. Uh-oh, we're talking about the Piso family. Pisa, Piso. And Leghorn was a ca castle in a swamp. Ferdinand decided to make the swamp a town by making it a sanctuary for all the outcasts of Europe. English Catholics, French Huguenots, Mahometan Moors from Spain and Christian Moors from Barbary, where they were, getting, where they were putting them in the swamps, right? What's another word for swamp? Moor. Moorish land, the Moors. So a lot of the time, people got stuck with the Moor tag. It wasn't just because of complexion. It's because they lived near a swamp. There's a lot of history with the word more. That's a whole nother topic. I just wanted to show that. It says here, Catholics, Huguenots, Moors, and Corsicans lost their individuality soon. But the Jews remain Jews. All right. So again, Huguenots and Moors being same thing going on with them, right? Oakland Tribute, 1938. says wholesale deportations are not new in history. To select only the examples of the Huguenots and the Moors is to demonstrate the disastrous consequences to the deportation nation the huguenots who were mainly middle class merchants whose the merchants and bankers the persons of means were massacred by the thousands by saint martholomew all right so remember what happened from there they fled 
to many European countries. Again, this is from 1938, and again, being classed just like the Moors, the Huguenots, it's the same people. That's why it's the same history. The Muscatine Weekly Journal, 1886, it says Prince Bismarck's expulsion of the Poles from the Prussian territory, right? So-called Poles, from the Prussians, right? is calling out criticism all over the civilized world. It is classed with such cruelties as were perpetrated upon the French Huguenots and the Moors of Spain. Okay, so now they're saying, see how they're separating the Prussians, but what did we learn about Prussia? They had many of these so-called Moors there already, and Sephardic Jews. So they're just persecuting the same people. Yep. The Leavenworth Times. The Spanish Inquisition, this is 1906, right? It says the Spanish Inquisition, the massacres of Drongela and St. Bartholomew, the expulsion of the Moors, the Huguenots, and the Acadians, the murderous proselyting of Mohammed, the crucifixion of Christ are examples. All right, so again, all these people, and now the Acadians we're going to see, or oh, we've already shown, the French Acadian, the French people that went to Acadia, these were mostly Huguenots, fleeing their persecution. A lot of them wealthy people setting up shop over there and everything, you know. The Philadelphia Inquirer, 1861. The truth is they were impelled by blind, bigoted ferocity to commit the same great folly committed on the similar mad impulse by France and Spain in banishing the skillful Huguenots and the ingenious Moors. Okay. <laughs> The Catholic Weekly, one more example. I hope it's clear. By 1879, right, Catholic Weekly says, Notre Dame de Pena is one of those Madonnas so numerous in the Pyrenees, right? Remember, that's where they crossed from Spain into France that were hidden in the times of the Moors or Huguenots. Hidden in the same time. Why? Why would they, the same people do the same thing? Because they're the same people. And being forgotten were brought to light, all right? So Huguenots and Moors. All right. Hold up. Hold up, we ain't there yet. <laughs> we ain't there yet. So the Costa, we mentioned that the Costa earlier, they were Irish, but Sephardic, but Moors, but Huguenot. <laughs> All of the above, right? That the Costa family, South Carolina. Make sure to check out that video if you haven't. And make sure to check out my Cadian Cajun Exiles in the Colonies. Great video. As you guys can see, five and a half hours. A lot of good information. We might redo this one eventually in a couple of years. <laughs> Catch up, you know. Definitely connects to what we're learning today. Who were these French Acadians? And where did they end up? And what happened to them? Same thing. Being persecuted, exiled, being... <laughs> everything. We under get to understand the full story. And then you understand why. It's similar to the French Huguenots and the Moors. Right? Alexander Hamilton. We already got his mom, Fresh Huguenot. Make sure to catch that one. And George Washington. We're going to read... Uh, more on this right now. Let's go back to the video presentation I have prepared for you guys. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Let me just go back a little bit. Okay. Just the Netherlands. All right. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate your patience. I know it's a long video, but eventually you guys can play it back as many times as you want. Um, I like to just go deep and break things down and make things clear. So we get rid of conjectures and guesses and opinions. That's the whole point of this. Here's the history of the Huguenot emigration to America with Charles W. Baird. I have undertaken to narrate the coming of the persecuted Protestants of France to the New World and their establishment, particularly in the seaboard provinces now comprehended within the United States. This movement and settlement took place principally at the time of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. But before that period, important emigrations had already occurred. Emigrations to Acadia, all right? So listen to this. Even before the 1600s, right, this Edict of Nantes that these French Huguenots were coming to America, right? Now now we're, letting, now we're learning that they were coming even from the 1400s, 1500s. Listen to this. Says, but before that period, important emigrations had already occurred. Emigrations to Acadia, that's in Canada. The Acadians, the fresh Acadians, those are all Huguenots. All right, I don't get it. Too... The sun, same thing. Yep, yep. And uh, you know, these people ended up in Haiti, um, Florida, and, and Louisiana. All right. So, yes, those are all, most of these people are uh, Huguenots. And we're going to see who these Huguenots are so you can understand real history. All right. We're going to go in, we're going in deep. 
All right, I'll be, you know, so. Uh, one again, thing right before, right before you kick off, anybody who's catching feelings over this, you know, really shouldn't be, especially if uh, you're a more. <laughs> this is actually helpful to help you distinguish your uh, Morris lineage. Yeah. Yeah, like which more, you know, which more house or which more descend, you know, whatever, you know, if you want to call it more, you know. So shout out to uh, Kiowa. This was when we were live back like four or five, four years ago, I think. We were doing the Huguenot uh, presentation. He was with me. So this part I didn't add out, but uh, that was a good uh, point. You know, it's not the same about like, it's same personal. It actually might help you if you're into the whole Moorish history. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, but we didn't even get there yet, but we, <laughs> we're good. What does Moors have to do with hugging us, Kiowa? What are you talking about, man? You're confusing me, man. <laughs> uh, you know, dangling that carrot a little bit. Well, all right. You must know something, man. <laughs> all right. So, again, these Huguenots, these French, I mean, they're already in America and Acadia and Canada up there. Again, they're, they're Acadians. They're the French Acadians that were relocated from there or even sent to there uh, or Nova Scotia, right, to Canada, to the French West Indies. Again, French West Indies where Haiti, Haiti. These French Huguenots, these French Europeans, French, French Huguenots, so-called Huguenots in Haiti, and by way of Holland to the Dutch possession of New Netherland, now New York. And still earlier, the effort had been made by Coligny, unsuccessfully indeed, to plant a colony and provide a retreat for the French Calvinists, first in Brazil and afterwards in Florida. All right, so before, I see what they're doing now. So they're not calling them Huguenots, but they know it's the same people, right? Because this is a Huguenot book. They're calling them Calvinists at this time. They weren't Huguenots yet. <laughs> this is 1500s. They had a colony. They tried to make a colony down in Suriname, uh, you know, French Guiana and over there near Venezuela and all that, Guiana. And, and they were actually warring with the Indians. The local Indians didn't like them. They were warring. The Indians, they were, you know why they were unsuccessful? Because the Indians, you know, Took them oh, out they weren't having that they weren't having that they uh, weren't having it with these hugging nuts all right aka chameleons aka chameleons assimilation assimilators all right it says the volumes now submitted to the public treat first of this anti antecedent movements and then take up the narrative of the event that led to the more considerable and more effective emigration in the latter years of the 17th century the attempt has been made in connection with a brief account of the Huguenots before their exodus, before an exodus, all right, an exodus from France to trace the fortunes of many who ultimately reached this country. The recital is by no means to be regarded as exhaustive. It is presented rather as illust illustrative of the subject. Yet the number of families whose places of, all right, so it keeps going, says the story of the Huguenot emigration to America has remained till now unwritten. Why has it remained unwritten? Listen to what this author is saying. This has not been due to a lack of interest in the subject, nor to a failure to recognize its importance. Its importance. Many, many a glowing tribute has been paid to the memory of the persecuted exiles, and many a thoughtful estimate has been formed of the value of the contribution made by them to the American character and spirit. What do they mean by that? What did they contribute to the American character and spirit? No traditions have been more fondly and reverently cherished among us than those concerning the hardships and sufferings of the fugitives from France, and no names are more honored than the names of foreign castes that indicate descent from them. All right, descent from them. Who is they talking about? Yet there has scarcely been a serious attempt to set in order the facts that have been known with reference to this theme, much less to delve into the mass of documentary evidence that might be supposed to exist. All right, so this author, I wanted to throw this in this video real quick because he's letting you know, man, they're not even paying attention. They did not read. Really, they're like, there's so much evidence, but no attention has been made to it. Right. Now, I'm going to read this book. It says Archives Internationals. They study this in these, all right? International Archives of the History of Ideas. It says the Huguenot Connection, the Attic of Nantes, is revocation and early French migration to South Carolina. Right between 1675 and 1690, from 150,000 to 200,000 Huguenots fled their native France to escape Louis the 14th, uh, yeah, 14th final attempt to extirpate pro Protestantism from his lands. 
These refugees initially settled in the nearest Protestant sanctuaries available to them, namely Geneva, brandenburg hesse the Netherlands, and England. But as prospect, prospects dimmed for return to France, many sought new homes for a permanent exile. The second migration took Huguenot's refugees far from their native France and Europe to places as remote as South Africa, Russia, and South Carolina. In these new and permanent homes, the Huguenot refugees and their descendants experienced significant cultural and religious changes. Some of these alterations proved to be re relatively innocuous. French weavers, chamois dressers, and silversmiths became, for example, American or British farmers. Again, pay attention when I'm telling you right here. French weavers, right, all these people, silversmiths, they became what? American or British farmers. All of a sudden, they were different people in history. Why? We'll see why. But other changes proved more problematic. Huguenots who left France to preserve their religious tradition became Anglicans. Now remember, Huguenot is more of a political term, not a religious. We just got the etymology. All right, so dodge the hijack. Presbyterians, I says, they became, so look at this, Huguenots who left France to preserve their religious tradition became Anglicans, Presbyterians, and even Baptists. All right, what you guys know about Presbyterians and Baptists and Anglicans? What do you guys know about that? These Huguenots, right? So why are these Huguenots becoming all these other religions or, you know, denominations? Men and women who had fled religious persecution profited from a slavery that victimized others. Hear that? Men and women who had fled religious persecution profited from slavery that victimized others. These same Huguenots eventually had slaves. It is possible that the commemoration of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes will stimulate a scholarship that makes sense of these and other anomalies in the history of French Protestantism. Understanding the revocation and the Huguenot migration to South Carolina lifts up a remarkable coherence in the past, even amidst wrenching persecution and significant social and religious change. The revocation was more than a catalyst for Huguenot flight from France. It predicted the very character of Huguenot migration into South Carolina. In turn, the Huguenot migration and fate of its participants reflected more than European exigencies or American opportunity. They bespoke processes of change and alteration that after the revocation overtook French Protestantism everywhere. All right, so changes, processes of change. In short, the revocation, diaspora, and assimilation, assimilation were not discrete, isolated events. They were consecutive scenes in a major historical drama that historians long ago named Le Refuge. That's what they named as Refuge. Refugees, the Le Refuge, the famous Le Refuge when the Huguenots, but to which they are only now given sustained attention. All right. On the surface of the revocation appears to have been a remarkably simple event. On 17 October 1685, Louis XIV revoked the Edicts of Nantes issued by Henry IV in 1598 to grant privileges to worship to Protestants. The result was an exodus from France of about 160,000 Frenchmen, women, and children. Now, there's people, there's other scholars who have said millions, 800,000, 500, you know, different numbers. So they don't really know the numbers. This would have been a massive exodus, even in modern times, all right? A massive exodus of Huguenots. Who's these Huguenots? All right. In fact, it was the largest population movement in early modern Europe, aside from the expulsion of the Moors from Spain. Aside from the expulsion of the Moors, so they share something... It's similar, just like the expulsion of the Moors from Spain. Hmm. And it was all the more remarkable in the face of crew transportation and a social milieu that limited population mobility for most people to relatively constricted regional movement. All right, so it's changes already embedded in the exodus from France quickly extended into the diaspora and directly touched the Huguenot emigration to South Carolina. With the help of demograph demography, we can now see what contemporaries may not have noticed that the Huguenots who came to South Carolina and probably Russia, South Africa, and other British colonies in North America, all right, other British colonies in North America, were not representative of the Huguenot population that fled France. This is most obviously demonstrated in immigrants' ages. Extrapolations based on the well known 1697 list of adult applicants for South Carolina, sub 
flagship revealed that two-thirds of the refugees' children were born in South Carolina. Less than a fifth were born in France, and fewer than a twelfth were born in the European exile centers. The same pattern held true at the refugee community at New Rochelle, New York, where a 1698 census allows us to document the refugees' actual ages and probably also at the Narragansett settlement in Rhode Island. All right, so Huguenots all over these places, right? There's also indigenous people in these places, right? Okay. They point up major differences between Huguenot immigrants in America and refugees remaining in Europe. In short, the Huguenots who came to South Carolina composed a self-selected subgroup within the larger exodus population, something historians now call a cohort, distinguished chiefly by its relative youth, the exodus. It says, yet the South Carolina, Carolina refugees also were pursuing another occupation, farming. While they used traditional trade and merchant terms to describe themselves in their 1697 naturalization petition, many of the same refugees also were obtaining land in utterly astonishing quantities. Astonishing quantities of land. Whose land? Whose land are they getting? The South Carolina land records only describe property dispensed through direct government sale or distributed as inducements to important servants and slaves. They ignore the bird joint market of private sales. Still, the colony's land records alone reveal that by 1700, Huguenots had acquired at least 36,000 acres of land from the government, most of this necessarily given to first generation refugees. In the next decade alone, they and their descendants acquired yet another 68,000 acres from the government by 1710, uh, then scarcely. 30 years after their first arrival in the colony, Huguenot immigrants had acquired more than 104 acres through government sale and distribution. So you see all the land uh, that these people are getting, right? All right, so it says, this astonishing Huguenot record makes the better known New England and Pennsylvania land acquisitions patterns pale by comparison. Historians often explain Settlement in both these more northerly areas by the lure of land. In fact, South Carolina easily outstrips its northern counterparts in its distribution of land to European immigrants. The English settlers who acquired land in 17th century New England or Pennsylvania before 1720 averaged less than an eighth of the 710 acres obtained by Huguenot immigrants in South Carolina. Even the largest New England and early Pennsylvania farmers usually acquired uh, only 300 or so acres of and says, in addition, and somewhat surprisingly, Huguenot refugees themselves seem to have pursued land holdings more aggressively than did their Puritan and Quaker contemporaries. Certainly, some refugees acquired very little land. Isaac Vary and Isaac Remeth each received only 100 acres of land in 1694 and 1696 and obtained no more land from the government in the next uh, decade. But others acquired enormous amounts of land. Powerful entrepreneurs like John Gaylord and Philip Gendron obtained between 3,700 and 4,300 acres, respectively, and appeared to have possessed sufficient capital to make much of it productive. It was breadth rather than the all too typical inequality of land holding that made the Huguenot record so remarkable in South Carolina. Virtually every Huguenot male known to be in Carolina in the 1690s received at least some land. 5,100 acres. So all these Huguenots were getting land. By 1710, a judgment made only on government land grant records. In contrast, New England Puritans often accepted increasingly restrictive land distribution policies well into the early 18th century. As the historian Philip Graven has demonstrated, men in Andover, Massachusetts in their 50s and 60s obtained land only through inheritance from fathers who proved notoriously long-lived. They did not force town authorities to sell land to them or buy it elsewhere. Moreover, neither English, Welsh, Scottish, nor German immigrants in Pennsylvania ever matched the land holding record found among Huguenots in South Carolina, however appealing William Penn's promotional rhetoric. All right, so just real quick, want to remind everybody. So again, Huguenots, right? More Sephardic Jews, people of color, Black Europeans coming in to getting all this land, right? Whose land is it? This is what I'm trying to say. It's not personal. It's just real history. And it's in all your genealogies, like um, mixed in with the indigenous uh, um, lines, you know, so a, a lot of a lot of this lineage, right? A lot of this lineage. So 
it's not about the so-called white evil man coming and taking the land and all that. That's just why I'm doing this so you can get a better perspective and understand. Because the past is the past. You know what? Whatever whoever our ancestors were, you know, who do you represent the most, right? Who do you? Well, who's your spirit represent the most, right? Uh, that's all I gotta say. But and I just want to remind that as we're reading here, don't don't be imagining again. Don't go back into the hijack and be like, oh, these white people taking our land. <laughs> but, you know, we just went over a couple of hours of who they were. Does widespread hugging and ownership of land in South Carolina soon produce dramatic changes in the refugees' economic and cultural life? One of the less traumatic changes involved the disappearance of traditional hugging trades after 1700. The rich, complex occupational identifications that appeared on the 1697 naturalization petition soon gave way to a ubiquitous designation typical of all European settlers in the colony, planter. All right, so they let go of what they used to be or do, and they just became what? Plantation masters, planters, all right? They were basically getting their own plantations. By the 1720s and even as early as 1710, Huguenots, after Huguenots called, no longer used the traditional French occupational classifications to identify themselves. Little evidence suggests that they shoot their old occupations deliberately, although evidence on these matters is extremely thin. It does suggest that Huguenots used their old skills when it was desirable. South Carolina history, Walter Edgar. South Carolina had one of the more heterogeneous European populations in British North America. By the time of the American Revolution, there were nine European ethnic groups represented in measurable numbers. Of these, in addition to the English, the French, Scots, Irish, Germans, Welsh, and Jews maintained something of a cultural identity the Dutch and Swedes did not. After the English, the French were the most significant ethnic group in the terms of colonial affairs. Colonial affairs, their hands in the colonial affairs, these French Huguenots, far out of all proportion to their numbers, South Carolina had the largest French population in terms of percentage of any of the 13 original colonies. It was a diverse group made of Huguenot refugees, French-speaking Swiss and Acadians. The first French settlers were Huguenots who were attracted to South Carolina by the promise of religious and political freedom and the availability of land, all right? All right, so they try to say, well, they wanted religious freedom and the political freedom, right? But also availability of land. I think that was the biggest reason, <laughs> availability of land. Who's yep. land again? Yep. In April 1680, a group of 45 Huguenots arrived in South Carolina aboard the Richmond, the Huguenot, answer to the Carolina in the Mayflower. Over the next few years, other immigrants emigrated as families or individuals. Then in 1685, Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes that had guaranteed French Protestants the right to worship freely. Huguenots were persecuted in thousands sought refuge in Switzerland, Netherlands, England, and the New World. All right, we, can, we know the story now, right? In the decade following the revocation, 1,500 fled to South Carolina, many of them escaping with only their lives. In 1685, after months of suffering from abuses by French soldiers, Judith Gitton Manigault wrote that her family resolved on quitting France by night, abandoning the house with its furniture. We contrived to hide ourselves for 10 days while a search was made for us. The Gittins, via an underground railroad of Huguenot sympathizers, escaped from France and made their way eventually to England and then to South Carolina. Some Huguenots remained in Charlestown, but most moved north and east along the eastern branch of the Copper River and on the vacant lands along the Santee River to what was then South Carolina's northern frontier. There they established themselves as planters. They became what? Planters and plantation owners. What does that mean? That means they had slaves, right? Uh, so there they established themselves as planters again, plantation owners, what would become one of the richest rice-growing areas of the colony. Until about 1720, they continued to speak and write in French and married within the Huguenot community. After that time, Huguenots intermarried with the English majority in the low country, joined the Church of England, and made little effort to perpetuate the rem remembrance of a distinct nationality. Few even anglicized their names. While they may have become anglicized in many ways, Huguenots and their English neighbors continued to recognize the former's heritage. The area along the Santee where they lived was known as the French Santee, 
and when parishes were established in the 18th century, one was called St. Thomas and St. Denis. The name St. Denis, with its French spelling, allegedly is derived from the site of 16th century victory by Huguenot forces led by Admiral Coligny. The French heritage was also displayed in the retention of family names Bonneau, Cordes, the Sauri, the Vaux, Du Bois, or Du Bois, right? Du Bois, Du Bois, Web Du Bois, Du Bois, Fort, Gaylard, Gendron, Gerard, Horry, Huger, Lawrence, Laguerre, Manigault, Marion, Perry, Porcher, or Porch, Prilio, Ravenel, Simmons, and Timothy. Assimilation did not uh, come easy for the Huguenots, who found themselves the uh, objects of intense ethnic animosity. In the elections for the first Commons uh, House of Assembly in 1692, five of the six delegates from Craven County were Huguenots. This led to an angry petition to Governor Philip Ludwell asking him to prevent the Huguenots from taking their seats. Shall the Frenchmen who cannot speak our language make our laws? You see what's going on? These Huguenots already making laws, right? They, they, they get in power. They gain in land and power. Trying to unseat the Craven delegation was not enough for some bigots. They demanded the enforcement of more extreme provisions of England's alien laws that would have denied Huguenots the right to vote, serve on juries, or even inherit property. Governor Ludwell ignored the protest. It, it permitted the Huguenots to take their seats. It says by 1730s, the Huguenots had be, uh, begun the, uh, to abandon their language and customs. They, why would they somebody abandon their language and customs and to merge with the English majority? Huh? They were no longer as alien as they once had been. The more they became assimilated, the more successful they became. Later, French immigrants settled on the frontier away from the centers of population and for a while clung to their own ways. So a lot of these French frontiermen, these woodsmen, these naturalists, these men going in the woods, these traders, they were Huguenots. All right, we're going to see one that's very famous later on. But uh, most of those French Frenchmen, French traders, fur traders, we already got the French uh, enslavement video I did about the Indians. They were not just trading fur. They was trading Indians, right, humans, or over to the English. Their buddies, you see, the ones they were assimilating with. And they too married their neighbors, whether or not they were French. In Charleston, no one really cared whether backwoods French or German settlers kept their alien culture and language out of sight and earshot. They were supposed to be the colony's first line of defense against the Indians. So real quick, I'm in the Huguenot Society of the Founders of Manikin Town in the colony of Virginia. We're going to be talking about Manikin Town today again. So it's here, the Monacan Indians and Monacan Town. It says here in 1699, a Huguenot colony took the Indian land and established a settlement of their own. Uh-oh. Huguenot colony, what? Took. They took it. They weren't giving it to them. They took it from Monacan Sioux and Indians. Through intermarriage with their white settlers or through uniting with other tribes, the Monacan population gradually decreased. All right, what happened? Intermarriage with who? These Huguenot. We're going to see Moors, settlers. All right, so real quick, we're just going to read this book. It says the history and present state of Virginia in four parts. All right, this is from, as you guys can see here, 1705. 1705, publication date, 1700s, this book. We're going to go to page 45 of this book, where it starts talking about these French refugees. Who is the first refugees? The etymology of the word refugee will tell you that the first people called refugees were Huguenots. Who are the Huguenots? We're going to get into that real quick, just for reference. But before that, it says here, all the French refugees sent in theater by the charitable exhibition of his late majesty king williams are naturalized they're talking about over here in virginia and james river piedmont region it says in the year 1699 there went over in about 300 of these all right 300 huguenots and the year following about 200 more 200 that's 500 huguenots and so on all right and so on till there arrived in all between seven to eight hundred men women and children they're talking about huguenots who had fled from france on account of their religion 
Protestants, right? Cryptos. The Catholics were after them, persecuting them. Most of them were cryptos. Who are the Huguenots? We're going to get into that real quick. Just for reference, those who went over there the first year were advised to sit on a piece of very rich land about 20 miles above the falls of James River on the south side of the river, which land was formerly the seat of the great and warlike nation of Indians called the Monacans, a warlike nation, the Suans, ancient Suans, none of which are now left in those parts. What happened to them? What do you mean they're not left? This is written in 1705, 1700s. What happened to the Monacans? But the land still retains their name and is called the Monacan Town. We're going to be reading about that today. What happened to Monacan Town? Who ended up with Monacan Town? The refugees that arrived the second year went also first to the Monacan Town. But afterwards, upon some disagreement, several dispersed themselves up and down the country. And those that have arrived since have followed their example, except some few that settled likewise at the Monacan town. All right. Who settled in Monacan town? What happened to them? They just disappeared. Really? Come on now. Now, this article is called the establishment of the Huguenots in Virginia. All right, I'm just going to keep reading a little bit more of this history real quick. This is by, uh, Mary Wilson Bonahan Land, College of William and Mary, Arts and Sciences. All right. Now it says here, before giving an account of the chief events relative to Huguenot history through the period leading up to the revocation of Eric of Nantes, it may be well to offer here some explanation concerning the origin of the term Huguenot, which was first used about 1560. Authorities have found it impossible to determine the true origin, right? So they don't really know the origin. They can't tell you, oh, Huguenot means this or that. And it's just some Christians. They don't, you know, they're just making stuff up right there. All right, because they've been trying to find the origin of this uh, appellation. And many theories have been advanced and explanation. In the etymological dictionary of Cledat, we find that Huguenot is a deformation, the aligned Huygens and confederaries modeled Petru. And it goes on, it says the formation of Huguenot from Eigegenosten or Eigengenot. Huggins and Nosten seems to have first place among many explanations offered. As there was a party in Geneva at the time known by that name, it seems plausible that the French Protestants, Protestants would have used the same term, as it is from these French provinces that originated the refugees who came to Virginia. And though it is not known from what localities all of them came, some few are known to have been natives of towns and provinces as follows. Says the family of Imbert came from Nimes, Lower Languedoc. And whoever knows about Languedoc, southern France, this, this part of France, that was Moorish from way back. Like way, way back. That was part of the Iberian uh, kingdom and the Moorish kingdom. This place was a Moorish place from ancient times and, and, and Europe. All right. It says the history of the Huguenots written for the American Sunday School. It says of the family we said was a settler at Mannequin Town, Virginia. Mannequin Town, Virginia, all right? From Matuban in Guyenne came Antoine Tarbe, so from Guyenne. So see, there's a place in France called Guyenne. Guyenne, Guyenne, Guyenne. You can say this, Guyenne, Guyani, Guyani, Guinea, Guyenne. A place in France called Guinea, Guinea, Guyani, Guyenne came Antoine Tarbe. A Huguenot in 1687, also one of the settlers of the James River. He died in January 1724. Also from Guiani, <laughs> Guiana, Guiani, Louis Latag went to Virginia and for over 30 years was minister of South Birmingham Parish, Essex County, Virginia. He was a man of blameless life and devoted to the work of the ministry. From London and Poitou come Jacob Pierre and Matthew Amonet. Chiefs de Familles de London, 1634. Jacob Amonet was one of the settlers of Mannequin Town, right? It's a place actually named after the Monacan Indians. All right, so it says the birthplace of Oliver de la Muse, the founder of the settlement at Mannequin Town, was not far from Nantes and Brittany. Here was the seat of the noble house of la Muse Pontus, David, his son Caesar, and his grandson Olivier. Soon after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, Olivier. De La Muse attempted to flee from France, but was arrested 
on the island of Re. He was imprisoned in La Rochelle in Nantes, where the, every effort was made to persuade him to abjure, but without success. So he was finally expelled from France as a dangerous heretic. He was sent to England, from where he later came to Virginia on the Mary Ann in 1700. All right, the Mary Ann is a ship, all right? Also a native of Nantes in Bre Brittany was Paul Mikau, who came to Virginia from England from England, all right? So it's a French coming from England. All right, he might have been listed. Remember, they became American or British, right? They were starting to name themselves American or British. They were hiding their Huguenot history and settled on the Rappahannock in Essex County. Claude Philippe de Richbourg, the first minister of the Huguenot settlement in Virginia, came from St. Sevier in the province of Berry, Owen, to disputes in his parish, he moved in 1707 with a number of his adherents to the Carolinas and was a pastor of the French church in Charleston. He died in 1719. It says the Mannequin town from Port des Barques came Jackie's Bilbot. The Mannequin town, right? Jean Bilbot, Reconet, Metalet, Safemi, oh, that is French, 4,000 livres fled from Port des Barques in 1681 to England. Jacques Bilot or Bilboa, right? You see that? Balboa, Bilboa. Billaboot, you see what I was saying earlier about the surnames, right? So Billaboot, Bilboa, or Balboa in Spain, Balboa, Bilbot, or Bilebo, all the same. These are Huguenots, right? AKA Huguenots. One of the inhabitants of Mannequin Town, 1700 1723, was doubtless of the same family. At South BC was born Jean Penetier, Jacques Penetier, fugitive de Soubise. John Penetier, naturalized in England. March 1682, Penetier, one of the settlers of Mannequin Town, Virginia, 1700. Chatelis in St. Ange was the birthplace of Jacques Fontaine, the Huguenot pastor, ancestor of the American families of Fontaine and Maury. All right, Maury, the Maury families, Huguenots. All right, plans and propaganda for the immigration of Huguenot to America. As has been said, the Huguenots fled from France and increased in numbers after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes principally to the Switzerland, Holland, and England, all right? They were in all these countries, many of them by reason of the pri privileges extended to them in these countries. Why did they have privileges in these countries? Think about that and remember that. Others, however, a more adventurous spirit or the series of obtaining even more freedom left these countries for America. But even after the great exodus in 1685, there had been a steady stream of partisans from France, beginning with the earliest days of their persecution, several colonies were set up in America, some ending in failure while others were more successful. It was but natural that many should be attracted to the English colonies of America, where they knew they would find many of their own religion or political uh, uh, ideas, right? And of which they had heard such inviting accounts of profitable trade and of lands of rich and agricultural promise, all right? A promised land to encourage this inclination of the Huguenots towards America, as well as that of others who were looking with longing eyes towards this promised land, like I just said, towards this promised land. So the Huguenots come in here for what? Because they know it was a promised land, right? You know, a few travelers of the period wrote in glowing terms of what they had seen and gave much publicity to their works, which became intentionally or not propaganda for attracting new colonists to America, propaganda to get colonists to come to America. William Fitzhugh, as has been said, has tried to interest Hayward in sending French refugees to his lands, which later came to be known as Ravisworth. But he met with no success in that quarter. So he offered the lands himself in 1686, saying that for the French Protestants, I have convenient and good land enough to seat 150 or 200 families upon one divided, which contains 21,996 acres. All right, you hear how much acres this guy has? Is this like real? One guy has all these acres. Who's, whose acres did he take? Whose land did he take to gain all this? And who took it, you know, who gave him the right? Which I will either sell them in, in fee of seven pounds sterling for every hundred acres, or else lease it to them for three lives paying 20 shillings per annum for every hundred acres. The land I offer lies within a mile and a half of the Potomac River 
and of the two both navigable creeks, all right? You see, he's a hugger now. He got all this land. From the Vestry Book of King William's Parish, Virginia, 1707-1750, we learned that as early as 1683, Baron de Sancy ceded a colony on the Lower James, having obtained permission from the English government to establish a colony of Huguenots in Virginia. The settlement was made in what is now Nansemont County, then known as Suttonton Hundred. This was evidently not a very favorable location for a colony, and no records of it have been discovered. Hmm. From the same source, we learned that in the year 1687, 600 Huguenots came to Virginia, and that it is very probable that some of those settled on the lands offered by William Fitzhugh, some in Stafford and some in Spotsylvania. Spotsylvania. So we see that all through the 17th century, Virginia was constantly receiving the refugees from France in large numbers and small. The number reached its peak in 1700, when about 800 came over, many of whom settled at Mannequin Town. It is these settlers who will now be our chief concern, it says here. And it says chapter 4, the settlement of Huguenots in Mannequin Town. And it says, up James River is a colony of French refugees who at Mannequin Town live happily under our government enjoying their own language and customs their own language and customs we're going to see what that is towards the end of the video what it really was i know you're thinking french and protestant right now the settlement of hunting as a mannequin town says plans for emigration had long been in the midst minds of those huguenots who sailed from england in the year 1700 plans which had been in the making for about two years and which had been changed many times much had been done in London to encourage and aid in going into America, all right? They were encouraging this to go to America, those who had become interested in so doing, since many of the refugees had come to England with few or none of their possessions and constantly required financial aid until they could establish themselves profitably. They required what? Financial aid? What does that mean? It means indentured servitude. <laughs> That's the only financial aid they're going to get. Indentured servitude or a land grant depending on their status and their connections and their money. Disbursements were made to those needing money from the Protestant Relief Fund, a Protestant Relief Fund, to get people to come to America. Listen to this. And it was from this fund that many were enabled to come to Virginia. They had a fund for these Protestants to come to Virginia? Records in the Library of Goodhall in London give an account of these disbursements. As for example, in June 1700, the sum of 38 pounds was given to uh, Mon, Benjamin de Jubes, minister appointed to go to Virginia. Later in August of the same year, a request for 20 pounds was made for M. Castain, one of the physicians among the refugees bound for Virginia. Later still in the same year, requests were made for money for such Badaws and French refugees as designed to settle in Virginia. Much was done also in regard to actually finding them land in America where they could settle. Negotiations had first been made with Daniel Cox, proprietary of Carolina and Florida for purchasing land in Florida. The second objective had been Carolina. Letters in regard to the third plan indicate that land of the Nassimon River in Norfolk County had been designated as their destination. When the plans were finally carried out and four ships sailed to Virginia carrying them seven, seven and eight hundred Huguenots, Mannequin Town on the James River was to be the final destination for many of them. All right, although those who came over in the first ship expe expected to settle in Norfolk County, Mannequin Town, the place chosen for the Huguenot settlement, was the site of a deserted village of the Mannequin Indians, 20 miles above Richmond. So really, so they went into a deserted Mannequin Town and took over the whole town, right? Why would why did the Mannequin desert their town though? In the first place, school books would probably tell us that the, the Mannequins caught, caught some disease and they disappeared and were extinct and blah blah blah, right? But in reality, they either got, you know, enslaved as indentured servants for uh, these Huguenots, relocated to other lands and other state reservations, or they, again, assimilated into their families, married into their indig the indigenous people. And, oh, I'm saying this for a reason. All right, we're going to see that later on. So I said a slight digression would be made here in order to give some data concerning the Monacan Indians who had village on the site which later was used for the settlement of the Huguenot refugees. The Monacans, the word is possibly an Algonquin one signifying a digging stick or spade, were a tribe of confederacy of Virginia in the 17th century, who lived on the land of the upper waters of the James River above the falls at Richmond. 
They were allies of the Mana Hoak and enemies of the Powhatans, and their language differed from that of both of these tribes. They were finally incorporated with other remnants under the names of Saponi and Tutelo. All right. The settlements of the Monacans proper was known to the whites as Monacan Town. In 1669, they still had about 30 bowmen and 100 souls. All right. Big up to the Saponi out there. <laughs> yep. Yep. Shout out to Saponi to Tutelo nations. And so they're letting us know that in 1669, there were still Monacan people there. So what do you mean there was a deserted town? They just contradicted themselves. Francis Lewis Michael, in the report of his journey from Bernie, Switzerland to Virginia, October 2, 1701, says, makes some interesting statements regarding these Indians. He says that the soil at Mannequin Town is black and heavy. Is black and heavy. Black. The soil is what? Black. Black soil. When I say black soil, black land to you, black soil, what, are you, what comes to your mind right now? The etymology of Kemet, if you don't know, Kemet, when you go, if you look at it right now, if you go look at it, Kemet, the real etymology is basically black soil, a fertile black land, fertile soil, black soil. Again, he says that the soil at Mannequin Town is black and heavy, and so the Indians had reason to choose this place, all right? It was fertile. That was their place. That's why they were there. Today, there is a red rough stone. Now there's a red rough stone. What did these Huguenots do? Now it looks like Egypt, modern Egypt, they're saying, red rough stone, standing four feet high out of the ground where at certain times they, the Indians, held religious services as they supposed about 30 years ago, they still dwell there. But when they inflicted some injury upon the Christians, Claude Bourne, who was then living on the frontier, namely at Fallen's, Fallen's Creek, Fallen Creek, mounted one of his company and attacked the Indians boldly. He soon overcame them and put all of them to the sword also destroyed their settlement and whatever they own so you see what happened to them right indentured servants most likely as has been stated four ships virginia bringing the refugees the first of these four ships the marianne and brought to virginia's july 1700 207 men women and children many of these went to mannequin town the pastor claude philip the richburg was among these as well as the marquis de la muse and their sally on the second ship the Peter and Anthony, which arrived in Virginia about September 20, 1700, there were 169 refugees. On board this ship was Benjamin de Jukes, who was the <laughs> pastor. So de Jukes, de Ju, de Ju, Benjamin de Ju, de Jukes, right? Gosh, the high tide, who was their pastor, right? And was also the real founder and leader of the whole settlement of Mannequin Town. Oh, the founder and settler, this de Ju, Ju. In order to ensure that Huguenots would live happily in Virginia and to encourage colonization by them, they were accorded special privileges. 10,000 acres of land were donated to them. Okay, 10,000 acres of land donated to them. The best of the James River. The best on the James River, 20 miles above Richmond, being the deserted village of the Monacan Indians. A fertile, very fertile place huh what a coincidence they were soon granted full citizenship oh they got their citizenship they got their nationality good for them huh citizenship nationality oh they got a nationhood now and were exempted from taxation for a period of seven years oh hold up so why are they exempted from taxation and they're getting full citizenship why are they getting all these privileges Man, these Huguenots, they were granted freedom of worship under ministers of their choice. I just wanted you guys to see what happened. I just wanted to show you this historic marker here. As it says here, Huguenot Settlement. In 1700, 1701, Huguenots, French Protestant refugees, all right, who's the Protestants now you know, aka Moors, settled in this region on land provided to them by the Virginia colony. The Huguenot settlement, known as Mannequin Town, centered at the former site of a Monacan Indian town. Former site, what happened, all right? Located south of the James River, during this period, the Monacans and other Indian tribes traded with the settlers. In 1700, the Virginia General Assembly established the King William Parish, which enabled the Huguenots to have their own church, pastor, and set their own parish titles. Over time, the Huguenots obtained individual land grants on both sides of the James River and throughout this region. And from there, 
the Monacan history of people disappear, right? Or supposedly go extinct, right? They don't know what happened to them. They started being labeled so-called Negroes, indentured servants, Cherokee, or the Huguenots started assimilating or amalgamating with them. And that was the case many times. I think this is very important, like, you know, again, a tribe that people really don't know, and they are suing. Just wanted to bring this to your attention. Let's remember the Monacan Nation, who had been living in this region for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They know people was living in this area up to 18,000 years. They have found evidence of human habitation that long in this area. Again, these are part of the mound building culture that was over here in the eastern shore. The Suans that came down from Ohio. And these people were there for so long. And then here comes the Huguenots. Now they even take over their own town and call it Mannequin Town. And then they say, well, we don't know what happened to them. They disappeared. We just inherited their town. Luckily, this rich, rich, rich land and this wasn't the so-called white man that came took the land just want you guys to see this was all planned virginia colony they were given land grants as they were helped these were refugees fleeing the catholics and taking indian land all right so now we're going to read about a specific history of a specific family that you didn't even know about as a historic person in the history of america and the revolution and i'm in the uh suffolk county massachusetts genealogy and history all right biographies of the ribori revere family of massachusetts genealogical and personal memoirs relating to the families of the state of massachusetts color and adams 1910 transcribed by sue ann mcknight it says gene ribori ribori the immigrant ancestor of the revere family of massachusetts belonged to the ancient and distinguished family of riboris or their riboris or romagnio of france they were what Huguenots. They were Huguenots, and some of the family fled from France during the Catholic Inquisition. He married Magdalene Malapergi. Children, Simon Elson's son was a refugee from France, went first to Holland, and afterwards settled in the Isle of Guernsey, Great Britain. Took with him the coat of arms of the family on a silver seal, and these arms were afterwards registered in the French Heraldry Book, book in London at the Herald's Office of Apollos Isaac, mentioned below. So it says Isaac Rivori, son of Jean Rivori, was born about 1670 in France, married 1694, Serene Lambert. They had several children, one of whom was named Apollos. The following account of his birth was written in the family Bible by the father and copy of it sent to the Colonel Paul Revere, Boston, by Matthias Rivori, a second cousin of Martel near St. Foy, France. Apollos Rivori, or son, was born the 13th of November, 1702, about 10 o'clock at night, and was baptized at Recon, France, Apollos Rivori. My brother was his godfather, and Anne Malman, his sister-in-law, his godmother. He set out for Gornsley on the 21st, 1715 of November. According to the late General Joseph Warren Revere, Apollos, the father of the famous Paul Revere. Paul Revere. What do you guys know about Paul Revere? Well, he's a Huguenot, and his name is not Revere. It was Rivoiri. Rivoiri. So when we look at Paul Revere's images of today, we got to dodge the hijack, became the true heir and lineal representative of his brother, Simon de Ribori, and the American branch of the family. Consequently, is the legal heir that present day, all the other heirs having become extinct. The American family would inherit the titles and estates, if any now remain to inherit. Paul Revere, an American Huguenot, right? So dodge the hijack with this image. The 18th of April, 75, is a date fam familiar to Americans. Thanks to Henry Watson Longfellow's third poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, this vivid recounting of the courageous night ride that gave alert that British regulars were marching on Lexington and Concord has thrilled readers for generations. The ensuing skirmishes which forced a retreat of the British are considered the first battles of the American Revolution. Who was this Boston silversmith? A silversmith. The, remember the Huguenots? That was one of their traits. The American patriot with the French sounding last name. Paul Revere was the son of Apollos Riboidi, who was born in 1702 and recorded in the Gironde Valley near Bordeaux. The family was French Huguenot, and because of the persecutions following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, many thousands of Huguenots were forced to flee 
to Protestant tolerant countries. The child Apollos was first sent to save the, to an uncle on the island of Guernsey, but then the uncle paid for his nephew's sea passage to Boston and New World. He probably had to be an apprentice to his uncle and pay that back. Puritan New England was a welcome destination for the Huguenots. All right, escaping why? Why the why? Why is Puritan New England a again just like Virginia, Mannequin Town, all that, and South Carolina, right? All this promise of land to them, the promised land. Puritans, what do the Puritans have to do with Huguenots? We'll see. Escaping persecution in 1735, most of Boston's 14 established churches were Calvinist. One was French Reformed. Apollos turned 13 on the sea voyage and was apprenticed again and was what? Apprenticed to a master goldsmith where he became a skilled artisan. Skills and training he eventually passed on to his son. Now, are they talking code here when they're talking about apprentice to a master? And they passed the skills and training to his son, Paul Revere. This apprentice skills of a master. What are we talking here? You know what I'm talking about. Now we're in this article, it says the effects of the Huguenot diaspora on the American Revolution. Remember Paul Revere, right? The red codes are coming. He was a Huguenot, right? So it says this is a thesis presented to the faculty of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree. Master of Military Art and Science, Military History by Stephen D. Griffin, Major, U.S. Army. All right, BA in University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 1993. It says here, Louis XIV's 1605 revocation of the Edict of Nantes led to the diaspora of an estimated 200,000 French Protestants, Huguenot refugees throughout Europe and North America in what is known as Le Refuge. These Huguenots often intermingled and intermarried with earlier French Protestant Walloon refugees from the Spanish Netherlands, all right? The Walloons are just basically... Calvinists, so-called Calvinists that had already been in Holland. They were just called Walloons, but they're the same people, same Huguenot, same Protestant people, so-called Protestant people. And they were calling it what? The Spanish Netherlands, because Spain, what? Had control? The Spanish Netherlands, Holland? What does Spain have to do with Holland and the Habsburgs and Charles V, huh? It's all connected. By the time of the American Revolution, many of these refugee families had achieved significant political and economic power in their host nations so these refugees and this diaspora right these poor refugees hey they didn't do so bad everywhere they went they were getting land economic power right political and economic power often leveraging refugee networks that cross the atlantic and span generations as part of a larger protestant international because these are what? All the same people. These networks that cross the Atlantic and span generations. They span what? Generations. And then it says the result was that a large percentage of key American, British, French, and various German-speaking participants in the American Revolution had at least partial Huguenot ancestry. Given this high level of participation, this study focuses on what actual demonstrated effects of the existing Huguenot network had on the conflict. As seen against instruments of power in the dime model of diplomacy information military and economics and to see if they were le leveraged to any marked advantage it also reviews to what extent these connections varied across different ethnic groups that the refugees accumulated into if there are any resultant effects on non-huguenots and if these transatlantic connections distinguish the huguenots from other immigrant groups in the american revolution now he's saying here that this patriot force would include over 200 militia led by lieutenant colonel john severe severe that's a french last name right including his brother captain robert severe the severe brothers were descendants of french protestants refugees huguenots who originally spelled their family name xavier or javier see that's from spain javier xavier there you go and had immigrated to the shenandoah valley and Baltimore, Maryland. Over a couple of generations, the family assimilated into the Scots. They became Scots, all right? They assimilated again. So they became assimilated into the Scot Irish who were moving southwest along the Appalachian frontier and established a reputation among the community as both local political and military leaders, right? Now, what else was going on in the Appalachian Mountains? And what, uh, uh, what known uh, indigenous group, right? What they say are mixed people were Europeans. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about the Melungeons. Huguenots were there too in the Appalachians. 
and they were mixing with local Indians. So a lot of those Melungeons have Huguenot ancestry. All right. The remaining over mountain men also include at least one other Huguenot descendant, frontiersman John Crockett. All right, Johnny Crockett. Uh, John's family name had originally been the Crockett Tug. So these Crockett's anglicized their name as well when they escaped from France to Ireland. Uh, the Crockett's came to identify themselves with their Presbyterian neighbors. But we listen to this. So these are Huguenots who became Presbyterians, participating in the mass migrations from Ulster to colonial America. So a lot of the Black Irish included Huguenots. John's son, David, would arguably become the most famous American frontiersman, even before events at the Alamo elevated him to the status of Texas legend. Beyond this important strategic victory is a strategic implication, this of a handful of Huguenot descendants participating on opposing sides at a key battle of the war, perhaps representing a sort of microcosm of effects played across the American Revolution. What effects, if any, did the Huguenot diaspora have on the American War of Independence between two or four thousand French Protestant refugees out of an estimated total 200,000 Huguenot refugees? ultimately immigrated to the British colonies in North America prior to the American Revolution. This resulted in an estimated 20,000 Huguenot descendants living in colonial America by the period of the Revolutionary War. Yet any quick review of the list of founding fathers, patriot leaders, and Revolutionary War historical figures results in names like Elias Baudinot, John J. Henry Lawrence, Francis Marion, and Paul Revere to say nothing of the hidden Huguenot. Again, they're saying right here, they say to say nothing of the hidden, hidden Huguenot heritages of men like George Washington, Alexander Hamilton. Right, so it says a deeper review yields a far greater number of Huguenot descended participants with names like Molyneux, Izzard, and Freneau. This quantifiable evidence expands even further when combined with predominantly loyalist families like the Delanceys and the aforementioned the Pasteurs. These loyalists often served alongside British Huguenots named André de Montresor or even with the numerous Swiss Huguenots, the Swiss Huguenots in British service that included names like Haldimand and the distinguished Prevost family. All right, so I hope you guys are seeing how these Huguenots were everywhere in Europe before they come to America. So when they came to America, now you got French Huguenots, British Huguenots, Irish Huguenots, Swiss Huguenots. You see what I'm saying? That the baseline assertion given this handful of examples drawn from much larger pool is that the amount of Huguenot participation in the American Revolution far exceeded the expected from the size of the initial refugee population. But this assertion, however significant and quantifiable, it is, is merely a measure of performance. A more important question given of this proportionally high level of participants on all sides of the American War of Independence who had some degree of French Protestant refugee ancestry is what sorts of effects did those Huguenot connections have? The Huguenots were no Protestant Illuminati plotting over generations to play both sides of the Atlantic chessboard. And if they were, they were a strangely meso misogynist version. Hmm. However, the Huguenot diaspora did result in a Huguenot international as a core part of the larger Protestant international of the 17th and 18th centuries. The refugees possess cultural and linguistic connections across the Atlantic. Family and merchant networks established remarkably quickly and maintained over generations overlapping connections that cut across various instruments of power. By the time the American War of Independence, these descendants were often only two or three generations removed from France, at times even less with many descendants in concentrated settlements still demonstrating an ability to speak French. The Huguenots were a group with a shared religious heritage, and also a heritage of persecution by royal authority that had resulted in numerous wars and rebellions back in France. Yet some still supported the, revolu the revolution of the potential cost of their lives and fortunes, while others were just as willing to risk the same for the British crown, a cultural factor affecting these decisions may rest not at the stream's destination, but back in the French watershed. Another about Francophile, one with Huguenot connections despite his lack of proven French ancestry, was Thomas Jefferson. Originally from Wales, the Jefferson's family settled in colonial Virginia, full of French Protestant families, scattered from Mannequin Town, 
to Williamsburg, all right? We got that earlier, Mannequin Town. His neighbors included the descendants of both the Huguenot, Martin, and Esley families. Young Thomas was tutored in French by Scottish rector William Rector, whose parish register was filled with French names. And he later went to school taught by Irish Huguenot, James Morey, along with numerous Huguenot descendants. Jefferson was also was a close friend of English Huguenot Francis Fakur, Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. But says Jefferson later employed the services of one Huguenot, poet Philip Freneau, to criticize the policies of another Huguenot, his chief rival Alexander Hamilton. But it is purely suppositional to assert what affects this interaction with all these descendants. It says here, John Adams was aware of John Jay's Huguenot refugee ethnicity when he deplored the New Yorker's strong prejudices against the French prejudices congruent with Jay's accompanying anti-Catholic asserting during the negotiations for the Treaty of Paris that he, Jay, didn't like any Frenchman. <laughs> In 1806, the exiled Dutch, so he, this Jay, who was a Frenchman, was pretending not to like Frenchmen. In 1806, the exiled Dutch radical Francois Adrien van der Kemp would feel comfortable enough with Adam's knowledge of the Huguenots to discuss the very origin of the word Huguenot with him. Remember the origin? He wanted him to know, hey, it means this, man, conspirators, confederacy. You want in? Years later, in his 1821 letter to Alden Bradford, Adam is confident enough to identify the Huguenot ancestry of Massachusetts Governor James Bowden and the marriage of Samuel Dexter to another Huguenot reflecting. All right, so if you from Boston, if you grew up in the hood in Boston, especially Dorchester, Roxbury, you know Dorchester got Bowden Street, Bowden Street. I was there a lot. My friends are from Bowden mm -hmm. Street and Geneva Avenue. And um, yeah, Bowden Street is a Huguenot Street. Down in South Carolina, Patriot John Rutledge, was he surrounded by Huguenots in Carolina Low Country? Given this background, it should be no surprise that a John Rutledge would remember Henry Lawrence in their first meeting as a swarthy, as a what? As a swarthy, a swarthy, what? Well-knit man below medium height, clearly a Huguenot. Why is he clearly a Huguenot? Because he's so swarthy, hashtag so swarthy. The hidden Huguenots. The identification of Huguenots and their probable effects on the colonial and revolutionary periods of American history first begs the question, what exactly constitutes a Huguenot name? The general answer to this refers back to the both the premier, petite, and second grand refuge, and also invokes making distinctions between French-speaking Walloons that fled the attentions of the Duke of Alba in the Spanish Netherlands, and later French-speaking Huguenots who fled France, particularly from the later aristocratic Catholic refugees, fled the French Revolution to Philadelphia and New York, given expatriates like Talleyrand and Noyles the chance to cement friendship with Alexander Hamilton and remark upon how he spoke French like a native. All right, so Alexander Hamilton it says here, spoke French like a native. Why did he speak French like he's a native French? Because his mom was a French. She was a Huguenot. And the number of French Catholic refugees who fled to Charleston, South Carolina from St. Domingue, modern Haiti. Again, and the number of French Catholic refugees who fled to Charleston, South Carolina from St. Domingue, modern Haiti. Why did they flee? Why were they fleeing from Haiti now? Were they being persecuted there? Were they driven out by the indigenous Inca army that the Salinas had? And actually greater than the French partisans that preceded them. Finally, some family names like Martin transcend multiple nationalities. Martin! That's a Huguenot name. And it can extend from documented Huguenots like Virginia settler Gene Martin to non-Huguenots like North Carolina Governor Joshua Martin. It says here, Huguenot names are often hidden by combination of three factors. Why are they hiding their names? Masking adjustment and conversion. Huguenots displayed a remarkable ability to integrate and often prosper in the communities within which they sought refuge. Exogamy, in this case, exemplified by intermarriage with non-Huguenots, means that many French Protestant lineages are maxed among maternal lines that often narrow to a single paternal family name. Washington hides Marty Aou, and Hamilton is better known as the bastard son of a Scotch peddler. Than for learning French at the knee of his mother, Rachel Fawcett. 
she was the hugger nine. Finding an accompanying nine birth name like that of Governor Morris is a rare clue. And even this helpful road sign does not even prevent the U.S. Army Center for Military History from describing him simply as descended from Welsh soldiers. Cultural biases and narrative agendas. Yet often the existence of Huguenot lineage or relationship is not highlighted, not because it is unknown, but because it does not serve the existing narrative or agenda of the author. That's a big one right there. They're leaving this part out. Why are they leaving the Huguenot part out? This bias is understandable if the focus is, for example, on the Scots, Irish, or German migrations to colonial America. But the omission often seems flagrant. James Webb, born fighting, does make a handful of mentions of the Huguenots among the other ethnic groups that the Scots Irish accepted into their ranks. However, the individual's French Protestant ancestry may prove interesting, but not relevant. It's not relevant now. Don't worry about it. It's in the past. Not far from the Victory Monument in Georgetown, Virginia, memorializing the British capitulation in 1781, there stands another smaller monument marking the homestead of Huguenot Nicholas Martel. He is the earliest American ancestor of what? Of George Washington, a Huguenot, all right? Along with other patriots like Virginia Governor Thomas Nelson Henry, Light Horse Harry, Lee, and many other members of the first families of Virginia. Again, many other members of the first families of Virginia. It says Washington also knew and conducted business and corresponded with numerous Huguenot descendants from the eccentric Peter LaBillier to the that sounds like almost like billionaire. That's where the word billionaire comes from. La billionaire. All right. Uh, to, the, uh, I... to the thoroughly well connected Alice Delancey Izzards. Lizard. Izzard. As commander in chief of the Continental Army. His personal oh. staff included Huguenots, Alexander Hamilton, and John Lawrence, who, along with the Marquise de Lafayette, made up the French corner of his mess tent. It says George Washington was the great 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 grandson of a Huguenot named Nicholas Martel. Martel was born near the Huguenot stronghold of La Chorelle in France. He left France to come to England, and he was mentioned in the register of the famous Huguenot Church of Threadle Needle Street, London, 1615. In 1619, Nicholas was naturalized English. All right, so he was, became an English. You hear that? A year later, he left England on a ship called the Francis Bonaventure and arrived in Virginia. He built a fence around Jamestown Fort, and this helped the settlers to survive a Native American uprising in 1622. Well, thanks, Nicholas the Huguenot. When George Washington married, his wife wore a dress of yellow brocade, silver bodies, and silver petticoat. The dress was made in spitalfields by the Huguenot silk weavers. There have been 43 U.S. presidents, and 20 of them have Huguenot ancestors. Davy, Davy Crockett, right? <laughs> was an American folk hero, soldier, frontiersman, and politician. Davy was the fifth of the nine children born into the rough world of the American frontier. Many European immigrants changed or altered their surnames. All right? They, why? Why did they alter their surnames? And this is also true for the Crockett family. The name was originally Crocketagne, and the family were descendants of Huguenots that fled to England, Ireland, and America. 1812 Crockett volunteered as part of a group of militia against the Creek Indians. His duties included reconnaissance and fighting both the Creek Nation and the Redcoats, the British. Following the war with the Creek Nation, Crockett became one of the principal commissioners of peace in Lawrence County, Tennessee, and was chosen by his contemporaries to be the lieutenant colonel of the 57th Regiment of Militia. Now it says here, the Huguenots in America. Huguenot settlers immigrated to American colonies directly from France and indirectly from the Protestant countries of Europe, including the Netherlands, England, Germany, and Switzerland. Again, as you see a recurring theme here, a lot of these so-called Germans and French and uh, Dutch people, we always thought they were just separate people, but a lot of them were just Huguenots. They were the same people, all right? Although the Huguenots settled along most, almost the entire eastern coast of North America, they showed a preference for what are now the states of Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and South Carolina. Just as France suffered a notable loss, though the immigration of those intelligent, capable people so the American colonies gained, the colonies became 
farmers, laborers, ministers, soldiers, sailors, people who engaged in government. The Huguenots supplied the colonies with excellent physicians and expert artisans and craftsmen. For example, Irene Dupont brought his expertise for making gunpowder, learned from the eminent Lavoisier and Apollo Ribori. Remember Paul Ribori? He was a goldsmith. Oh, he was helping him make this the bullets. You see? Paul Revere's dad, another Huguenot. All right, it says Paul Revere, master, silversmith, and renowned patriot. George Washington himself was the grandson of a Huguenot on his mother's side. The Huguenots adapted themselves readily to the new world. Of course, they've been adapting everywhere they went. Their descendants increased rapidly and spread quickly. Today, people of Huguenot origin are found in all parts of our country, in our country, all parts of our country. Who are these Huguenots? The Huguenot says here, the first settlers in the province of New York. Again, New Amsterdam, the Court Journal of New York State Historical Society. Says it has been generally supported that the Dutch were the only settlers in New York entitled to very much consideration at the hands of the historians, but the Huguenots were first in the field and formed a very important element, both in numbers and influence. The history of the Huguenots and the Prince of New York began in 1622 when certain Walloons petitioned the King of England for permission to settle in Virginia. The petition was not granted. About two months later, certain Walloons, probably the same person, petitioned the state General Holland for permission to settle in New Netherland, and the request was granted. In the spring of 1622, the West India Company equipped a vessel called the New Netherlands, of which Cornelius Jacobs was skipper with 30 families, mostly Walloons. They sailed by way of the Canaries and reached New Amsterdam, where they became the first permanent settlers. The first white child born in Prince was of Huguenot parentage, right? So touch the hijack with the, because they're saying Huguenots are white. We know better than that. All right, so again, we're going to get into it. These people eventually settled in New Paltz, New York. At New Paltz, the church organized has always remained, and records have been translated and printed in book form. The Dutch language did not supersede the French until about three quarters of the century. After the settlement, the church about the time began affiliated with the Dutch. So these French Huguenots uh, were basically set in New Paltz, New York. We're going to get somebody's uh, ancestor that comes out of there, and that would be the Du Bois family. The Du Bois family, uh, they settled. Those are some of those Huguenots that settled in New Paltz, New York, New Rochelle. All right. All right. So we're in the University of Central Florida. The Evolution of French Identity, a study of the Huguenots in Colonial South Carolina, 1680-1740. Nancy Moore, University of Central Florida. And it says here, the Carolina Huguenots left France and settled in England because of the religious tolerance offered by King of the Church of England. Then they resettled in Carolina because of the economic opportunities advertised through numerous pamphlets. Again, they were passing out pamphlets like, hey, you want to go to the promised land and get all this land? All you got to do is move the Indians out the way and just not have them work for you for seven to eight years. And you can be very successful. They were passing around these pamphlets, several of which were printed in French. The dream of many Calvinists who immigrated to Carolina was to make a life for themselves and their posterity in a land that offered both economic prosperity and religious tolerance. In their pursuit of prosperity and toleration, these French immigrants encountered and overcame multiple political, religious, and economic challenges. Their participation in these struggles reveals the changes in their identity as an immigrant group as they adapted from Huguenot immigrants to merchants and planters to white British colonists. Several other colonial historians have examined the French in Carolina. Arthur H. Hurst's book, The Huguenots of Colonial South Carolina, is seminal in the study of Huguenots in Carolina. Writing in 1928, Hirsch interpreted the historical data at at his disposal and concluded that while the Carolina Huguenots were unsuccessful in their religious ventures, they were quite successful economically. Hey, they didn't do so good with their religious part, but yo, hey man, they made a lot of money. Now it says, he praised the Huguenots for their rapid absorption into British society by stating that they were practically forced into allegiance with Anglicanism in rapidity and completeness while overcoming their British neighbors economically. Hirsch's work was useful as resource and while he reached the same conclusions concerning absorption, absorption into British society as good friend, he examined Huguenot behavior from a British point of view. John Butler, a social historian whose book The Huguenots in America, a refugee people in New World Society was written in 1983. This book served as a valuable tool in the further examination of the overall behavior of French refugees in colonial America because Butler looks at Huguenots in New York City. 
Boston and Charlestown. His argument, however, is quite similar to Good Friends and Hearst. In this analytical work, Butler stated that while the French were fairly prosperous politically and economically, they did not sustain their hug and religion. Again, they didn't care about sustaining their whole identity. Why? A strong identifying factor for the French. In this conclusion, amply entitled Everywhere They Fled, Everywhere, Bertrand van Rumpmeck in his most recent published work From New Babylon to Eden. From New Babylon to Eden. Where's the Eden? America, right? The Huguenots and their migration to colonial South Carolina. That's where their Eden was. Mm -hmm. Does he have presents the most complete look at the Carolina Huguenots today. He examines the issues around the unraveling of Huguenot identity and concludes that the Huguenots attempted to acquire the economic and legal means to put down roots and prosper after arriving in Carolina. Their goal was not so much to preserve their Huguenot identity. Their goal is not to really preserve or tell people or let people know that they were Huguenots. Mm. As, to, as to live fully and to participate in the formation of a new world society, new world, new world society. However, Van Ruy Benke works is limited to the first generation only and fails to provide a long-term look at the Huguenot's descendants as they continue to put down roots and prosper. They continue to put their roots everywhere. All of the above works have made similar arguments concerning the rapidity with which the Huguenots lost their unique French identity in colonial America. Their reasons vary from an aggressive push on the part of the Anglo-Americans to conform, the crumbling organization of the Huguenot church as a whole, to the lack of any unifying social structure in the new world. However, there are still several questions that remain unasked and unanswered. Why did the Carolina Huguenots so readily surrender their religious identity? Were they coerced, as Goodfriend argued, or were they their other factors? Were there other factors? There were 154 Huguenots who, as adults residing in Carolina, signed the request in, on 696, 697 to become naturalized English subjects. These individuals comprise the first generation of French immigrants to, in Carolina. They arrived in the colony as a diverse group of individuals. They were already diverse when they got there, but they were united in their aspirations for economic opportunities, they say here, but I would say power. They were united. Remember what it means to be a Huguenot. You're a Confederate, right? Upon fleeing the various regions in France, many of the Carolina Huguenots, like Gittin and Tibu, headed first for England. A few fled first to Holland or Switzerland before settling in Carolina. Still others arrived in Carolina by way of the Northern British colony of New York. And we're in chapter three of this article from legitimate Anglican subjects to merchants and planters. It says here, Judith Gittin had immigrated to Carolina in 1685 after escaping the religious persecutions of France. She had been accompanied by her mother and two brothers shortly after arriving in the colony. Her mother and her brothers died, all right? They died on the way, leaving her along to pursue a new life. Her pursuit was unsuccessful, was, well, actually was successful, as she became the wife of one of the Charleston's most successful Huguenot immigrants, Pierre Manigault. There you go again with that guy. Their son, Gabriel, followed in his father's footsteps, becoming one of the most prosperous Huguenot descendants of his generation. As a merchant, a merchant, what is this merchant? What are they selling? What's, what's the biggest, one of the biggest business in that time, one of the biggest business, apart from tobacco and products, also is indentured servitude, so-called slavery? Yes. So the younger Manigault had connections with markets in London, right? So they had these networks in London, La Rochelle, and France, Barbados, and Northern British colonies. At the time of his death, his estate included lands, slaves, storehouses, residences, lots, notes, bonds, and mortgages was valued at 845000 back in those times. Yo, that's millions. That's, that's millions today. Possibly trillions. Or uh, billions, I mean. Okay. Judith's struggle had not been in vain. For the Grittons and Manigals, for the second generation had achieved the dreams that their mothers and fathers sought when they came to Carolina, right? They got their promised land and their dreams, right? There are also records of a limited number of Huguenots who owned Indian slaves. Oh, really? While this practice was not prevalent, it did not seem to hinder an individual's reputation within the community. Hannah Gerard was the widow of Peter Jacob, 
Gerard when she penned her will in 1735. Her husband had been the son of Jacob Gerard, a wealthy Huguenot immigrant who had arrived in Carolina in 1680 with six slaves and enough capital to buy 4,000 acres. This wealthy Huguenot. All right. Hannah's husband died in 1711, leaving his young wife with two children in a large estate. In her will, Gerard left eight of her slaves, six black men, one Indian woman, and one Indian man. You know, dodge all the hijacks here. You got to see who these all these people are and who these so-called black men are. What are they talking about? Are they talking about indentured servants? If so, black Europeans? Something we got to look into. We just can't think it's just aboriginals or people from the islands. Or anything. They could even mean black Europeans. We know they were coming here by the hundreds of thousands as indentured servants, too. Other Huguenots also owned Indian slaves. Monsieur Pierre de Saint Julien was called before the Commission of Indian Affairs in 1713 due to a report that he held two Indian women as slaves when he appeared before the Commission of Saint de Julien, justified his position by advising the members that he held the women to justify a grievance and was subsequently allowed to continue. An item appeared in the South Carolina Gazette in 1744 of yet another Frenchman, René Perrier, who owned 50-year-old Indian woman. Perrier was the son of a Huguenot immigrant, David and Judith Perrier, who owned a large plantation along the Santee River in Craven County and 108 slaves, 108 slaves. Also in 1744, perhaps in response to the above-mentioned news item, Pierre remarried his first wife, Florid Bonneau, the daughter of French immigrants Antoine Bonneau and Jean Elizabeth Vidu. Ownership of an Indian woman did not tarnish Pierre's standing in the community, however, because he, Carolina's third generation Huguenots, many of whom were planters and merchants, were regularly involved in the business of slavery. Oh, really? They were regularly involved in the business of slavery, either as planters who owned slaves or merchants who bought and sold them. The third generation of French descendants born between 1715 and 1745 was a group comprised of the grandchildren of Huguenot immigrants. Its members were not as occupationally diverse as their grandparents had been. The historical records contain information on only a few Huguenots who were neither planters nor merchants. A good number of these third generation cohorts were experiencing a lifestyle that their grandparents had yearned for but had not accomplished. Many were successful planters, owning as much as 12,000 to 24,000 acres of land and 250 to 369 slaves. Others were prosperous merchants with economic ties to England and West Indies and Northern colonies, so they had this network of business going on. Most merchants were also engaged in agricultural business as well, sometimes owning their own plantations, sometimes lending money to others, lending money to others to become established as planters. Still, others were actively participating in the colony assembly or council members, treasurers or speakers of the house. The majority worshipped in Anglican churches, but a few were still supporting the remnants of their forefathers, French churches, through their attendance with their donations. One character that is unique to the third generation is that they more frequently married outside of the Huguenot families, especially those who resided in Charleston. One common thread that ran through this generational group was that the nearly all owned slaves, some owned only a few, some owned a great many. Whether colonists worked as craftsmen, merchants, or planters, nearly everyone in Carolina, male and female, had at least one slave, with the exception of the very poor. All right. This is verified in the wills of many of the French colonists, all right? They all have slaves. The Huguenots and their descendants aspired to be slave owners. I can't wait to be a slave owner or own indentured servants. Some even brought slaves with them upon their arrival in the colony. Craven County was a stronghold for French settlers, many of whom owned slaves as witnessed from their wills in 1741. John June, alias Jean June, a resident of Craven County willed his wife a Negro woman. He left the balance of his estate. So his wife was a so-called Negro woman. All right, this hugger now. He left the balance of his estate, which consisted of slaves, a horse, and cattle. So his eldest son, John, another Huguenot descendant who resided in Craven County was Abraham Mikau. In 1765, Mikau willed his four sons, land, will, his wife received furniture, livestock, and three slaves, a Negro called Charles, a young ranch called Lisette, and a girl called Julata. His daughter, Hester, also received a ranch called Elsie. His house ranch, Phoebe, 
was to go to whichever of his sons she so chose. Cool. All right. Yeah, we're going to keep it going. All right. The French hugging us of colonial South Carolina. Assimilation or acculturation by Brenda Faye Roth, BA, uh, University of Arizona, 1984, and University of South Carolina, 1987. Right? That's her degrees. It says here the question of assimilation versus acculturation is one that should be tested. The Huguenots of colonial South Carolina provide a forum to look at the experience of a minority group in colonial society and how they dealt with the process. This paper advocates that the French Protestants in Carolina did not disappear as a separate cultural group, but rather they adopted certain behaviors that brought them economic and political success in the colony. These behaviors included acquiring large pieces of land. That was one behavior as amassing fortunes, right? And moving into elite South Carolina society. As a result, they threatened those who thought of them as alien, caused conflict in the colony between political factions. These conflicts refute the notion that the Huguenots disappeared as a separate identity by 1750. Cultural groups that vanish do not threaten or create conflicts because the dominant group absorbs them. All right. They're like, they didn't disappear. The story of Huguenot acculturation in South Carolina shows how immigrant groups can change the host society. Again, the story of Huguenot acculturation in South Carolina shows how an immigrant group can change the host society and how the dominant group is also altered as a result of the intermingling of cultures. Assimilation in American life, the sub-process or condition, the change of cultural uh, patterns to, to those of host society. It's a stage, cultural behavior assimilation term, acculturation. It says two, large-scale entrance into cliques, clubs, and institutions of host society on primary group level. Stage, structural assimilation. Number three, a large-scale intermarriage. And that's called what part of the stage a marital assimilation amalgamation all right number four development of sense of peoplehood based on exclusively on host society and that stage is the identificational assimilation number five absence of prejudice and that stage is attitude receptional assimilation uh, absence of prejudice oh yeah absence of discrimination Behavior, receptional assimilation, so acting like the people there. Absence of value, power of conflict. The stage is called civic assimilation. All right, so they were assimilating, assimilating, assimilating into everything. And this is from Milton M. Gordon, Assimilation in American Life, The Role of Race, Religion, and National Origins, New York, 1964. Several historians have characterized the Huguenot experience in Carolina as assimilation. It was, however, more correctly an acculturation process in which Huguenots did not simply become English Anglican. Minority groups in any society that acculturate do not disappear as a subculture, but they do adapt to their new environments by making behavioral and cultural changes. The acculturation process began almost immediately as the Huguenots moved into that dominant culture with ease. They arrived in Carolina soon after it was established, and the primitive conditions they found there supplied the backdrop for them to use their skills and talents to affect changes in a dynamic Charleston society and to take advantage of economic opportunities found in Carolina. French Protestants understood the importance of blending of their culture. They understood how important that was. With that of the whole society, they know it was very important. We got to... We got to we got to assimilate into the whole society while maintaining the continuity of their distinct traditions of communal and religious life while maintaining their secret the crypto life style they adapted all world practices to new world demands. But as they did so, the dominant society did not completely engulf them. Author H. Hurst depicts the assimilation of the French and Carolina in religious and familial terms. The rapid assimilation of the French in Carolina, he begins, into the established church and their intermarriage with other nationalities. What nationalities are remarkable features of their early history? This includes Indian nations. Uh oh. Okay. Uh oh. He states that the assimilation, John Butler agrees with both Hirsch and Wallace. He refers to the Huguenot assimilation in South Carolina as a swift disappearance of a cohesive refugee group 
involving the pace and extent of their movement into a non Haganah religious group. Unlike Hirsch, however, Butler associates the Haganah assimilation with agriculture. He states that the South Carolina Haganah refugees began assimilating when they no longer cultivated the products traditionally associated with them, which is what? Wine and what? Silk. Silk. Land represented wealth and status in Carolina. And we find that the Haganahs purchased large amounts to ensure their stations in society. Like, hey, if we want to be successful, we got to get land, guys. And they was like, hey, let's do it. The documents revealed that the Lord's proprietors initially set aside specific regions for the French Protestants. Yet, as land in other areas became available, Haganahs quickly took advantage of these sales. They did not abandon their old settlements, though, in favor of the new ones. The combination of separate communities and purchase of additional land in other parts of the low country shows that both community and wealth accumulation were important. They were very important. All right, now it says a genealogical history, Jews and Muslims in British colonial America by Elizabeth Hirschman, Donald Jates. Despite the small nucleus and founder effect, both the Normans and the American colonists were extremely diversified in their rank and file. The former includes Danes, Vikings, Norwegians, Flemings, Picards, Bretons, Frenchmen, many from Toulouse and Aquitaine in the south and region called Languedoc, a number of a Spanish or French Jews and Muslims. All right, the last mentioned typically operated the armories, the mints and construction industries. All right, the last two, which were the Jews and the Muslims, these were the ones in charge of what? The armories, minting the money, the coins, the construction industries, while supplying most mercantile professions with a strong component, as well as all banking personnel and civil servants because of their literacy and fluency in accounting. They were all the bankers. The Norman uh, pers uh, capital of Rouen, Rouen possessed one of the largest Jewish communities in Europe. Ranking alongside Toulouse and Rome, Constantinople and such Spanish cities as Toledo and Cadiz, the institutions of Exchequer, originally a chessboard or abacus, hmm, star chamber based on the concept of star, Arabic for node. All right, you hear that? Now, I know you guys seen the checkered floor on this Masonic uh, symbolism. This is what it means. They're telling you straight up here what it means, the note, the money, the note, the bank note, Right, the star chamber, the money, the control, the checkboard, the pieces. Star chamber based on the star area for note. Sheriff marshals and other civil titles came from most Arabic Spain and or the south of France. So all these what cops, sheriffs, all right. Now we got cops and sheriffs and where did that come from? From most Arabic, Arabic yeah. Spain the or the south of France, and were not outgrowths of the originally machinery of North Norman Anglo Saxon or Frankish states. In identical fashion, the immigrants who trickled and then streamed into the colonies comprehended Scotchmen, Irishmen, Welsh, Channel Islanders, Border Scots, French, Dutch, Flemish, Germans, Poles, Swedes, Swedes, and Cornishmen, as well as people from London and the English Heptarchy. Kent, Excess, the West Country, and the Midlands, Sussex, Northumbria, Yorkshire, both movements had a traditional character. Although the Normans, though of themselves as they thought of themselves as Frenchmen, they had not resided long enough in Normandy to become amalgamated with the local population and were still pagan Norsemen at heart. The largest emigration of all occurred with the so-called Huguenots, who, as we shall see, were in many cases second or third generation Spanish and Portuguese Jews who traded their French colors for English, Flemish, or some other nationality as they fed religious persecution again. Yeah, well, they're letting you straight up know that these Huguenots basically, they were third generation Spanish and Portuguese Jews who traded, who traded that even the Huguenot identity for English, Flemish, and other nationalities as they fed religious Persecution, so they became Russians, Irish, Protestants, Quakers, uh, you know, Presbyterians. But All right, so we live. I right? remember, I'm here. I'm still here. I right, so Amaru Capona, they're not Caucasian. You missed the whole presentation. You're ignoring it, and don't come distract here. We'll remove you. You're you're, you're just giving opinions. And I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, we live. We're gonna continue. We're almost done, you know.
both academic studies and informal family histories attest many of the Spanish and Portuguese colonists in Central and South America. Mexico and the Caribbean were conversos and moriscos. Although they might appear to be good Catholic Christians on the surface, they were in reality crypto Jews and crypto Muslims. All right, crypto Jews and crypto Muslims. Why are you ignoring that? The information speaks for itself, not opinions. We're done with opinions. In this channel, we don't do that. Secret Jews and secret Muslims, they practice the traditional traditions of Judaism and Islam in the privacy of their own homes, sometimes in small de facto communities or intermarried family groups, both Judaic and Isla Islamic law, excuse this behavior on grounds that such temporizers were constrained to submit to political pressures to save life and property. The earliest martyrs to the commandment of the Torah requiring Jews to declare themselves as separate and set apart from the other people were called annual, annus, annusism, or annusism, forced ones. The Inquisition rolled out a dragnet complete with tip sheets rewards and public spectacles that feared out of the fez Judaizers as well. Although the bulk of the refugees fled to North Africa and Ottoman or Turkish lands in the Levant. Thousands of others sought safety in France and the Low Countries. As Protestantism swept across Western Europe, many of these Jewish conversos and moriscos became often only outwardly Protestant. They became what? Protestant. They're the Protestants in history that were coming in in the colonial times. These are the Protestants. We're talking about Jewish conversos and moriscos people all right huggernauts Hussites to anabaptists calvinists same thing german reformed walloons same thing mennonites same thing dunkers quakers puritans and presbyterians all same thing these are all conversos from jewish and morisco people that were expelled through even since the 1300s they were being expelled from spain and portugal and the iberian uh, colonies when the British, Dutch, and French began establishing colonies on the Atlantic seaboard, they sent as colonists, listen to this, not subjects of high political and social rank from their respective countries, but for the most part recently arrived patently anti-Catholic, newly minted Protestants. Many were debtors, prisoners, or servants. Again, many were what? Indentured servants. Right, Protestants, these these so-called Irish Protestants, Scottish Protestants, these Quakers, the German no, these were Huguenots, aka Jewish conversos moriscos. All That's right. why they had all these titles and they were against the Catholic Church. Yep. So many were debtors, prisoners, right? We know of the convicts, right? Or servants, indentured servants, slaves, cast offs of society who were struggling to get onto their own feet in the new country. In May. 1572, Drake set sail from Plymouth in a ship named the Swan and the Pasha, English royal emblem and Ottoman title. Arriving in Panama, he formed an alliance with a group of French Huguenots. So he was in Panama and there was already Huguenots in Panama. All right. AKA what? Moriscos, Sephardic Jews, right? Jews. He got to Panama and they were already there, setting up shop there. Among refugees of the Spanish Inquisition can be believed. They succeeded in capturing a Spanish treasure caravan totaling 300 tons of silver. Drake returned to England, not only a stupendously wealthy man, but also a national hero cap capulated to the highest fame. So he's, he robbed the Huguenots in Panama, right? And everywhere else they were. Among Drake's other exploits was the, fir the first English circumvention of the world sailing in the Golden Hind. Cabalistic title. That's a Kabbalistic title following Sephardic Morisco maps drawn by Mercator, Abraham, Ortelius, Ortello, and Italian. If for now, so all these people, Sephardi Jews and Moors, of course, again, they're the map makers, navigators, right? They were the ones mooring the ships. So we propose that not only Drake was, was Drake aware that he had Sephardic Jewish antecedents, but the Spanish were as well. His surname, Drake, is Spanish for dragon, all right? DNA samples from Drake's brother's descendants, Francis, had no children, show their white chromosome to be type R1A1, a common Ashkenazi Levite lineage. So, by 1548, the Hawkins family and his associates were trading in Morocco, a haven for both Sephardim and Moriscos, 
a haven for what? Sephardi Jews, too. Sephardim, remember Sephardim. The French ports with which they family traded. Dieppe, Rouen, and La Rochelle were also heavily populated by Protestant Huguenots, many of the whose origins were Sephardic and Morisco. The French Protestants by 1560 had undertaken attacks on Spanish interests in Cartagena, Santa Marta, Havana, and Santiago. One may speculate that when Rouen, a center of English jewelry, exempt from many of the regulations concerning Jews since the time of William the Conqueror or before passed to the French under Queen Mary in 1553, many Rouenites Jews threw in their lot with the Huguenots to escape the growing anti-Jewish climate. All right, Rouen and Le Havre became popular stopping off points for Spanish Jews in exile. All right, so even Jews, what became Huguenots? At any rate, it was the Sephardic and Morisco populations of Spain fleeing after 1492 to France, the Dutch Republic and England that was most committed psychologically and militarily to her destruction as a world power. By 1569, the Huguenots and English merchants in the port of Plymouth were working in concert to assail Spanish shipping and the Imperial Treasure Fleet. The French Cardinal Chatillon, a Huguenot, likely Sephardic, despite his Catholic office, the name perhaps originally Castillon, was in London on a campaign urgent on attack on all the enemies of God, otherwise called Papists, Drake's Kingsmen, and the Chapernaums were deeply involved in this effort, as was Cornish man named Philip Bodushidai. All right, Robert Robin Sidney Sidney, Earl of Leicester. The list of family names, likely Sephardic or crypto Jewish ancestry in Elizabethan England, will not be complete without too much more prominent players in the trade and diplomacy of the day. The first is uh, the Sidneys, also spelled Sidney as in Sidon, Palestine, one of the leading figures in this line was Robert Robin, Sidney, Earl of Leicester, 1563-1626. Robin is a form of Reuben. I, Robin is a form of the tribe of Reuben, the name favored by crypto Jews. Robert Sidney's father, Henry, was a radical Protestant. According to biographer, hey, in 1569, Robert was placed under the tutelage of Hubert Lagwit is Carly Huguenot emigre. There are also French traders, Christophe and Jean Bresson and Bernard Fartour, Arabic Fartouat. Several Huguenot businessmen based in La Rochelle had interest in the Azores, including the Marano Labat family, the Moranos, converted Catholic uh, Jews, all right, and, and, and Moors as well, who helped settle French Canada. Louis de La Ronde, Armigo Nolet and Antoine Souvre, one Abram Bogular, Bogelier, Bogelier, seller of birds, Ashkenazi, served as combined Swedish, Danish, Dutch, Hamburg, and Spanish council. In 1620, the Virginia colony had another new governor, Francis Wyatt, Arabic surname, Wyatt. All right, so the Wyatt, which is Arabic, became Wyatt, who put a premium on obtaining female settlers. Economic efforts included timber production, wineries and ironworks, and glass manufacture. Mulberry trees were planted to foster silkworms and silk making. Again, silk, right? Silk, a Huguenot trade, right? Silk. Why? Well, we know why now. All these industries were ones in which Sephardic Jews, Moriscos, and Ottoman Turks excelled. Ser sericulture, in particular, was a secret art, jealousy guarded and known only to them. The flight of the Huguenots from Catholic France beginning about 1575 brought silk manufacturing to England so that by the end of the 17th century, Huguenots numbered as high as 80,000 in London. Many of them were silk weavers or skilled craftsmen in the ordered textile arts in Shoreditch and Spitalfields, only two or three generations removed from being Spanish or Italian Jews. The constitution of the Virginia Company was rewritten in 1621, named now as proprietors were Sir Francis Wyatt, Governor Francis West. All right, so they named all these people. A lot of them most likely, what? Huguenots or what? AKA what? Like I said, they were marrying into or assimilating into with the indigenous people. 
It says, with its three large volumes, Jacob R. Marcus, The Colonial American Jew, 1492, 1776, 1970, is the most substantial work on the Sephardic presence in British North America. Marcus traces roots of American Jews to the important French crypto Jewish Sephardic community beginning about 1550. He emphasizes that many of the Iberian refugees publicly belong to Huguenot, Walloon, or other Protestant denominations. All right, other Protestant denominations. He also acknowledges the crypto-Jewish and openly Jewish Sephardic communities in the Netherlands, which served as the seed bed for the large-scale return of the Jews to England, beginning about 1650, as well as the foundation of the New York colony. As does Katz late start, Marcus focuses attention on the underground Jewish community that flourished in England from the reign of Henry VIII. He suggests, we note in chapter one, that Christopher Colon, all right, pay attention now, this is a bomb right here. He suggests, as we noted in chapter one, that Christopher Colon, or Colon, right? Not Columbus, Colon, Cristobal, the Christ bearer, was a converso Jew whose family resettled in Italy. And that not only Columbus navigator, but also five additional crew members were Jewish along. All right, so just to clear up, because we got the presentation and the sources and everything. Yeah, he was Sephardic Jewish, but he was Portuguese. He wasn't from Genoa. He wasn't Genoese. He wasn't Italian. He was a Portuguese Jew from a town called Cuba. His great uncle was Henry the Navigator. He had connections navigating. It was in the bloodline. And he, yes, he was Sephardic Jew. Uh, his real name was Salvador Fernandez Sarco, not Columbus. Alfonso de la Calle, Marco, a physician who bore the name surname of Marcus himself. Master Bernal, a physician, Rodrigo Sanchez de Segovia, the controller, and Luis de Torres, the interpreter, the firmest, the famous interpreter. We got him a lot in our past videos, right? They brought him to who? To what? To speak with the Indians. Because why? Because he spoke Chaldean, Hebrew, Arabic, uh -huh. and I believe Greek, another language. Yep. And he was communicating with the Indians. This is Luis de Torres as soon as he got here. Immigration patterns in Virginia after 1624 suggest an even stronger picture of the Sephardic Morisco presence. The aptly named Abraham, leaving London in 1635, had on board Walter Pickett, Henry Dobell, Alexander Sims, Simmons, and Simon Farrell. See Appendix C, the David that same year carried Robert Alsop, Robert Barron, Baron Baroon, and Gultred, Levet, Levite, Levite, Levi. The Bonaventure, 1635, listed as passengers, among other, Basil, Greek Basil, sounds like Brazil, right? Book, Hebrew anagram, Robert Perry, James Mycere, and Thomas Hyatt, Arabic Hebrew for Taylor, each bearing a Sephardic surname. More and more persons of likely Sephardic and Morisco descent continued to arrive. The Elizabeth, 1635, of London carried John Bagby, George Travis, example from Travis and al Sasi and Ellen Shore, Hebrew Shore, Bull, related to the name Joseph. The Globe, also in 1635, brought Robert Copen, diminutive of Jacob, William Savoy, Michelle Hames, and Anne Levians, which seemed ob obvious enough not to call for comment, and the Alice had on board Robert Hagara and Sophia Roderick, 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 Rodriguez, all right, Rodriguez, in 1700, several boatloads of Huguenots, several, again, several, several boatloads of Huguenot refugees arrived in Virginia from England. Many of these persons were likely Sephardic or Morisco or Moors or Moors ancestry. There are other strong cues regarding Bird's ancestry and religious leanings. Hatch states that Bird regarded Catholics as but one degree above the devils from hell. In 1699, when the Huguenots were under attack once again by Catholic monarchs, it was William Bird of Virginia who championed their cause. About 300 of them were brought to safety in Virginia and another 200 in the following year, largely as a result of the arguments presented by William Bird to the boards of trade between 700 and 800 Huguenots settled in Virginia. Such activities are in complete conformity with the efforts begun in the late 1500s by Raleigh and Drake to settle their Sephardic and Morisco kingsmen in the New World. Both Raleigh and Drake had assisted the Huguenots in France before and after the infamous St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in 1572. Uh, uh, in the 1705 edition of his history, 
Robert Beverly wrote of the goodness and generosity of Colonel Byrd toward these distressed Huguenots. Uh, Lavery knows that it was the Huguenots who brought the Jewish Moorish craft of silver working to Massachusetts in 1685. Again, who brought that over here? The Jewish Moorish craft? The Huguenots, right? AKA Jewish Moors. Among these best known were Jeremiah Dumer. Again, Jeremiah, Hebrew name, Dumas, John Connie, and who? Paul Revere. We already got that. Paul Revere, the Huguenot. All three of these bear French Sephardic surnames. Another culturally prominent settler was Nathaniel Ames, medieval English Jewish surname from Amos, who simultaneously practiced medicine, ran a tavern, and published an almanac. Even the man with whom Paul Revere rode, listen to this, even the man with whom Paul Revere rode, now remember, this is supposed to be a so-called black man that Paul Revere rode with in history that they just recently let us know. So even his boy that he rode with, uh, rode to warn the British arrival for, in 1775, bore a Sephardic surname, Dawes, a, as already pointed out, a derivative of David Dawes. In agreement with crypto Jewish practice, edogamy among the Massachusetts Quaker settlers was carried to extremes. In one case, Pestana reports six intermarried families accounted for fully two thirds of the more than 500 people known to have been members of the Salem monthly meeting. Among these congregants were Benjamin Bagnell, Sarah Flood, Bassett, and the SD's family. All bear Sephardic surnames. A list of the early settlers in Salem and given an appendix X of these several would appear to be French Huguenot or Sephardic. It says here marriage patterns among early Dutch colonists. Marie Taine, Taine, Toy, Toyne. Let us take a closer look at some of these non Dutch Huguenot and Walloons settlers. Marie Taine married Jean Leroy in 1671. Her brother Isaac had immigrated to New Amsterdam. Some years before her own voyage in 1660, Isaac was made a burger of a new Amsterdam on 24th of July, 1666. He obtained a grant of land at Newcastle, Delaware, and married Sarah Reason, a name that is Persian for Prince. As previously noted, Marie and her husband, Philippe Cashier, sailed directly from, for Manhattan from the Texel in the Netherlands on April 27, 1660, on board the Gilded Otter and settled at Harlem on 23rd of June, July 1664, 17 Harlem residents had their names transferred to the register of the church at Fort Amsterdam, to which several of them had previously belonged. All right, this are the names here, as you can see. In 1624, the West Indies Company, the West Indies Company, made the decision to plant colonies in North America. Not surprisingly, given what we have already seen of the English strategy, the company used Sephardim as antagonists in the first onslaught. The early settlers were Walloons, remember these are just Huguenots that were in Netherlands or Dutchland, Dutchland. Protestants refuged refugees from the southern Netherlands who displayed willingness to risk wives and children towards emigration. As we have witnessed happening repeatedly from Roanoke to Jamestown, from Plymouth Rock and Boston to the shores of South Carolina and Maryland, former Sephardim and Moors now surfacing in various hues of Protestantism, various what? Hues. What's hues? Colors, right? Hues. Various colors. That's subliminal there, that, that you know, were placed aboard ships. They were placed on ships, right, and transported from Western Europe to North America. All right, you're talking about a middle passage still in Africa? No, it was happening with Europeans and swarthy Europeans too. In addition to the Walloons came French Huguenots, recruited by one Jesse de Forest, Jesse Silva. All these incoming ostensibly Dutch settlers receiving free passage and an allotment of land to cultivate their own of their own usage. Cons conscripts were permitted freedom of conscious and religious matters so long as the public aspect of religious worship adhered to the reformed Protestant practice of the Netherlands. This, of course, left the way clear for continuation of Judaic and Islamic practices in the privacy of their homes. So there we go, finally. This was what they really meant when they're talking about they can still continue to practice their religions because there wasn't no reformed Protestant or Calvinist, whatever that is. That didn't mean nothing. We read the definitions earlier. That don't really mean anything. This is what they were really doing in secret. 
The lead cashier, the lead cashier of the Calais in France, is first mentioned in the Huguenot settlement of the French West Indies. Philippe and Marie Tain, Cassier's first two children, Jean and Marie, were born in Martinique. In 1645, he and others left the island and returned to Europe. He went first to Calais, then to Sluis and Flanders, the Flemish, right, the Flanders region, where his daughter Hester was born. Many French and Walloon exiles from England and the Dutch seaboard fled to Mannheim in Germany, drawn there by assurance of freedom and protection under the government of the Protestant elector Karl Ludwig. Sometimes after 1652, he moved to the Lower Palatine along with a number of professed Protestants. By 1652, David Damaris, Greek, and other Huguenot refugees arrived to join and form a French church. In it were Philippe Cassier and his family, Simon Cornier, Maynard, Jornet Diaz from Mardic, Flanders, Jules van Oblius, Oblinus also from Walloon, Flanders, and Pierre Hermantier from Wonsland, equally Walloon country. Philippe Cassier, David Usil, and their family settled in Harlem on Manhattan Island. Remember what ODB said? Yeah, they gave it to the Dutch, right? These Dutch were Huguenots, actually. Yep. They sold it to yep. the Jewish yep. Moorish Huguenots. They sold their land for trinkets, right? ODB's uh, Shinnecock ancestors, the island of Manhattan. By the end of 1661, there were over 30 adult males settled in the same place. These were Michael Sipergus from Cyprus, Jan Sneeden, Jan Le Montag, Jr., Michael Le Jansen, were Michael Cypergus from Cyprus, Jan Sneeden, Aiden Daniel Turner, Jean Leroy Pierre Carison, Jack, Jack Crescent, Philippe Cassier, and all these names. It keeps going. And they say all these names, right? The common denominator was again Jewish roots. The list provides three additional Hebrew or Arabic surnames Usil, Lucas, and Mayer. Two others appear to be Turkish, Boys, Bay, Bay, King, Lord, and Carson. Bay, Bay, Huguenot, around 400 Huguenots immigrated to New York around 1680. Numbering among them were Francois Bouquet, Joshua David, Eli Bodinot, whose grandson would be elected the president of the First Continental Congress. This was the presidents before George Washington. That's a future video I'm going to show you guys. There were so many presidents before Washington. Now we know that one of these was a what? A Huguenot, a Swarthy Huguenot, and whose mother was Marie Suri or Suero of Marans, Anuis, France, Susani Papin, Papo, hey Papo, Andrew Lauren, Marie Luca, John Magnan, Jacob Radier, Joel Arnold, and the Tangi from Tangier, Lafon and Gracilier families. Augustus J was a very successful merchant from that crypto Jewish stronghold, La Rochelle. France, which lent its name to New Rochelle, north of New York. Like K, Bea, Kimball, Hamill, and V, the letter J, was probably adopted as an expedient Kinui, or circular name. The original Shem HaKodesh, or sacred name, could have been Judah or Jacob. Delancey, New York's third great mercantile family, was founded by Stefan Delancey. He fled Cayenne in France as a Huguenot refugee in 1681, going first to the Netherlands and then on to London. In March 1686, when he was 23 years old, he set sail for New York, arriving on June 1686 with a nest egg of 300 pounds from the sale of family jewels. He rose rapidly in New York City society, partly, no doubt, because of his marriage to Anne Van Cortland, daughter of Stefan Van Cortland. In 1699, Governor Bellamont, Bellamonte accused Delancey, along with other leading New York City merchants, including both Frederick and Adolf Phillips, of trading in pirated goods smuggled from Madagascar. You see what they were doing. The African pirates of this period were almost exclusively, what? Conversos and Moriscos. What? Again. Again. The African pirates of this period were almost exclusively conversos, what, Jews and Moriscos, same people. By 1711, the Lansing was prosperous enough to speculate in cocoa to extent of some 3,000 pounds. He also purchased wheat and flour and was active in the Indian trade. From the beginning of the 18th century, Indian trade? What do you mean by that? His name appears frequently in shipping records showing that, the, that he received wine from Adeta, 
rum and European goods from the West Indies and European goods from England. So he had a whole network of connections making money. All right. He was the richest man in province or Providence, right? One of the principal earmarks of crypto Judaism is intricate and overlapping commercial relationships across families and countries. This is very interesting what they do, right? Across nations and generations, even past years. With regard to several of the families of interest, Matson observes, the these New Yorkers maintain close liaisons with four prominent partnerships in Amsterdam. Listen to this. The few colonists knew the bankers, John de Neuf or Newhouse, and son from London instruct introductions and John Hutchinson had moved to Amsterdam after years of doing business in England. Daniel Chameleon and son had been found founded about 1735 after the first major partner, a Huguenot refugee from France, had lived in both the West Indies and New York. Cromlin had facilitated and backed shipments between Amsterdam and New York since about 1720. All right, so they're doing business. It says Levinus' Dutch Jewish surname, Clarkson, the fourth Dutch liaison, had the double good fortune to have been raised the son of a well to do New York City merchant, Matthew Clarkson. Remember, merchant, they're selling humans here, not just fur. And to be related to Charles Ludwig, a successful New York trader who returned to London after 1710. Levinus, Levi, the Venus visited the Ludwig household and met many of the metropolis commercial elite. By 1736, he was prepared to join his uncle Amsterdam in Amsterdam, where they launched a vigorous export trade to New York that also involved an elaborate service in converting bills and converting bills of exchange and extending credit. All right. Occasionally, Clarkson imported New York goods and bills in Daniel Crumlin's name. Through his connections with the Ludwig in London, Clarkson also secured goods and credit for Francis Golet, Huguenot, Anthony Rogers, and the Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Rosenfeld brothers in New York. Until the end of his career, he also held onto his portions of a 5,000 acre colonial state that had been granted to his relative. They had been granted. Whose land did they take? Note the recurrence of London and Amsterdam firms and combination again of Huguenot, English and Dutch commercial partners. Clearly, despite language and geographic differences, there was an overreaching ethnic bond that permitted these relationships to be established and maintained. All right, these are family, ethnic bond, same people. Similarly, Rodrigo Pacheco, a Spanish crypto Jew, and James Alexander, a Scottish crypto Jew, a Scottish crypto Jew, formed a joint venture and worked together. During the 1730s, they were friendly rivals, aiming to capture a prominent dry goods position in the seventh, uh, in New York market. They regularly discussed their cargoes. According to Madsen's research, rice last year did very well at London, but prices had been declining and it would sell uh, better at Lisbon. Pacheco predicted in 1732, in order to get the rice, not a commodity of that New Yorkers grew to his destination, Alexander outfitted the ship Albany to sell with flour, bread, pork, peas, tar, staves, and other goods to Jamaica, buy sugar, rum, limestone, Negroes, and cash to the value of about 800. So who's these Negroes, so-called Negroes? Brought Negroes from Jamaica, not Africa. And so then to sell them to New York for goods and proceed to South Carolina to acquire a full load of rice for Lisbon. So that was the whole trade. You see how they were getting rice to Lisbon. You had to sell humans at some point. And keeping with our thesis, the Livingston genealogy in America shows a pattern of marriage to crypto Jewish Dutch families in the first generation, including the Vetch, Van Bru, uh, Beekman, the Van Horn families, the Vetch descendants marry into the Bayard family and the subsequent generations show an increased crypto-Jewish mar mar marital pattern including Moffat or Moffat Arabic, Arnold Jewish Cornell Coronel, Van Horn and Simon. In one we see a descent of Philip Livingston marrying his close cousin Gertrude Van Rissalener Schuler. In, other word, in, in, in others, we encounter two Alexanders, the Peisters, Tembroic, Crypto-Jewish Dutch, two Huguenots, French and Lawrence and Hoffman, Dutch-Jewish, a larger state, stage Robert Livingston of Claremont and wife Mary Beckham have sons who marry two sisters, Eliza and Mary McEvers. And we see also a sheaf, likely Huguenot, and Mary Louis Valentin de Acesa, Castra Maru. 
the latter were likely openly Jewish. Later, the descendants of Gilbert Livingston and Cornelia Beekman married two close cousins, a Van Cortland and a Van Rissala heir, the Huguenot Joy Darrow, and a Dutchman who seems also Jewish, Jacob Rudson. Still later, we see the descendants of Robert Livingston Jr. marrying two close cousins, Livingston a Schuler, and two likely Huguenot Jews, Valentine Gardiner and Marianne Leroy. All right, so all these people marrying with each other, right? Keeping the power going. Let us look beyond appearances now at these German settlers. Keith Dole compiled a list of the early German settlers of York County, Pennsylvania. It is given in Appendix H among the names already discussed. Example Acre, we find some new entries suggestive of Jewish or Islamic ancestry. All right, and these Germans, all right? Emma and Amman are both Arabic, as are Bar and Bentzel. Bless is likely the anglicized form of Baruch. Blessing, bone, and boner, or boon, are forms of the Spanish and French words of good. A common Sephardic surname. Ba Buat is Arabic, Turkish. Campbell is Ashkenazic. Example, as in television reporter Ted Koppel, we find also several French Huguenot names. Example, the Boos, the Graf, among the German entries. Doos, Dot, Doodle are various forms of David. Dwinkle means dark. Dwinkle means dark and is the German equivalent for Moreno. So why are these people being called black and Moreno then if they're German? Huh? Example, dark-skinned. Elazar is Hebrew, Arabic meaning from Alsace, Lorraine. Isaac is a form of Isaac. Faisal is Arabic. Example, Faisal. Florentina denotes one from Florence, Italy, which had a large post-expulsion population of Jews. Uh, in 1496, four years after the Inquisition began and Jews were banned from Spain, a man named Mano Simon was born in Holland. As both his given and surnames indicate Hebrew affiliation, we believe it is very likely that Mano Simon was a Sephardic descent. By 1525, he had founded the Mennonites. All right, the Mennonites, a sect that plays a prominent role in German, Dutch, and Hungarian Protestantism. All right, these are all the same people. In 1901, book by Kunz, The German and Swiss Settlement of Colonial Pennsylvania, estimates that over 100,000 immigrants from the two countries arrived in Colonial Pennsylvania. And these are the German Palatines and all these Protestants. Several Protestant sects were represented among them, Swiss Mennonites, the Walloons, and the Huguenots. Quakerism, who notes, had been introduced to Germany by William Ames, Sephardic in 1650. Five. And uh, another Quaker, William Kenton, Hebrew, Arabic word meaning small, little, has visited the German Palatinate at a later date. Another, Johann Jacob Zimmerman, and one of the founders of the Germantown colony in Pennsylvania, was an esteemed astrologer, magician, and Kabbalist. And still another early minister, Johann Kelpius, believed he was to be taken up into heaven alive like Elijah. And he says, concluding comments. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehand once remarked that without purpose, human history was a barren exchange of names. Without purpose, what's the purpose? Listen to what he's saying. In the case of Maryland, we have gone beneath the surface of the names to document marriage patterns, business partnerships, inheritance provisions, and other family matters. More than in any other colony, Greeks, Ottoman, and Turkish roots are exposed once we rub off the English, Dutch, or Huguenot veneer. Again, what? Once once you remove all those tags is what they're saying, what you get at the roots is Greek, Ottoman, and Turkish roots. At the base of it all, we encounter Spanish, Portuguese, Hebrew, Arabic, and Berber. So at the base of the Haganuts, that's what you get. Just those elements that imbued the Sephardic world that came to abrupt end in 1492 right when the moors and jews got expelled from spain and, and portugal we have seen an ingrained pattern of cousin marriage one that starts even before arrival in new in the new world and one that is no respect of nationalities business arrangements were often cemented by these intermarriages you see, nope it was business arrangements were often cemented by these intermarriages with the effects of keeping money and credit within the extended family all right finally we have drawn back the current of quakerism to reveal the true motives that dictated where the family settled and where the family moved on to. None of their traits 
we suggest was random or accidental. It's not no accident that they came here or they settled in a specific place. No, it was all planned. That's what they're letting you know in this book. The crypto Jewish element in the Carolinas, large French population goes back to the first pogroms against Spanish and French Jews in the 1380s and 1390s, all right? Even before this, however, events had the effect of throwing the two groups together. The union of the two was particularly strong in the Spanish marches of southwest of France. Here, the Babylonian exilarch Machir, William of Toulouse, had founded a Jewish principate under the Charlemagne around the year 770 CE. All right, they're going way back there. Evidently, many other Jewish institutions and practices gradually went underground. At the same time in southern France, crypto-Jewish expert Abraham Lavender proposes that many Huguenots began as Jews, while Cecil Rhodes, the chronicler of the Spanish Inquisition, writes that a large number started out as Muslim Moors. Their fortunes were variable. Jews had temporarily returned to France beginning in 1361 at the invitation of Charles V although they were expelled by his Catholic lenient successor in 1394. The tiny island of Red near the Huguenot stronghold of La Rochelle was an important place of refuge from 1681 to 1686, although it was only 16 miles long. Red was almost wholly Protestant and had several Huguenot temples on it. Temples, in parentheses, right? So we already know they're talking about either synagogues or, right, the Muslim temples. The mosque, yeah. The names of those from Ray who settled in America strongly hint at their Judaic background and Iberian origins. We can easily trace in the, these the transformation of Spanish or Occitan surnames as well as the persistence of favored Jewish given names. The former can often be recognized by the addition of ill, old, or like sounding suffixes of Hebrew or Arabic names. So this pattern of Huguenot naming continued, although weakening with time in the United States as late as the 1700s. Period. For example, Esther and Judith remain among the nine most frequent female Huguenot names in Charlestown, South Carolina, while Abraham, Daniel, Isaac, and Jacob were frequent male names. Even as late as 1790 in the United States, Huguenots, despite rapidly assimilating and generally following non-traditional Christianity, were more likely than most other Protestant groups to have Old Testament names. <laughs> the exceptions were in the Puritan areas of New England, areas which were the most traditional in the following of Christianity. Among the 16 most frequent Huguenot male names in 1790, seven, uh, Benjamin, Samuel, Jacob, Daniel, Abraham, Isaac, David were Old Testament names. There are clearly a connection between naming patterns and ethnic religious identity. The very first attempts at planting French colonies in the New World were inspired by Huguenots who landed in the area of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in 1555. It came to not in the same Huguenot faction planted a short-lived colony named Charlesburg on the South Carolina coast. Charlesburg was organized by Admiral Gaspar Coligny and Jean Rebonnard in 1564. Coligny attempted a second French Huguenot colony at Fort Caroline on the St. John's River, but the settlers were massacred by the Spanish. Finally, in 1566, the Spanish succeeded in establishing the Santa Elena colony near the present-day border of South Carolina and Georgia at Buford. The settlers numbered 1,500 men and 14 women from Santa Elena. Captain Juan Pardo, Sephardic surname Brown, set off two expeditions establishing forts as far west as Knoxville, Tennessee. Santa Elena was a thriving seaport colony with craftspeople, families, and a Morisco pottery-making facility. Santa Elena craftsmen and merchants tr traded with Mexico. Listen to this. They traded with Mexico, Italy, and Spain. Some even owned Chinese porcelain. Soldiers stationed in the town were drawn from a cross-section of Spain, Marchena, Gibraltar, Cadiz, Sevilla, Bilboa, Leon, Salamanca, Toledo, Valencia, notably all areas with substantial Sephardic and Morisco populations. Religious toleration meant more than freedom to establish congregation. No person whatsoever shall disturb, molest, or persecute another for his persecution of opinions and religion or his way of worship and legal matters and affirmation and, and lieu of an oath was invitation of two Quakers. Not only could Huguenots worship as they wished, but upon subscribing to fundamental constitutions, they could become naturalized citizens. Talking about Moors, right? Citizens, nationality. All right, and stipulation of a belief in God, not Christ, meant that Jews and Muslims were welcome. The only religious profession not tolerant was Roman Catholicism, a view quite in keeping with politics and restoration 
and Restoration England, with the exception of Rhode Island, this was the most tolerant religious policy in, in English America. Besides recruiting their fellow British Caribbeans, the Lord's proprietor also sought out Huguenots as settlers due to one main surmise to their Sephardic Morisco affinity and enmity towards Spain, the colonial power to the south. Pamphlets were distributed in French to Huguenot refugee communities in Ireland. All right, again, the pamphlets going around. Hey, you want to go to the promised land? It says, for a list of Huguenots refugees in Ireland, when Louis XIV repeated the Edict of Nantes in 1685, which had provided religious freedom to non-Catholics in France, thousands of Huguenots fled France. 1,500 of them made their way to South Carolina. Edgar reports that prominent surnames among these colonists were Bonneau, the Davidic good names, uh, Cordes de Saussure, de Vaux, de Bois, Forret de Silva, Gillard, Grendon, Gurard, Maury, Moroccan, all right, Harry is Moroccan, Huger, Lawrence, Laguerre, Manigault, Marion, Pyrie, Porcher, Pricolou, Revenel, Simmons, and Timothy. Again, several identify as Sephardic Moriscos. 1764, an additional 300 Huguenot settlers arrived in hopes of developing the silk and wine industry. The same two Sephardic Moorish dominated industries attempted in the Virginia colony. Most of the incoming settlers were drawn from La Rochelle and Bordeaux, two French cities with large Sephardic Morisco populations early in the 1720s. Perrysburg on the left bank of Savannah River had been settled by around 800 French Swiss settlers, which we have argued elsewhere were primarily of Jewish and crypto-Jewish ancestry. Yet despite their crypto status, Jews, Moors, and their descendants made important contributions to South Carolina's culture and economy throughout the colonial period. One of South Carolina's major agricultural crops during this time was indigo. The dye plant was introduced by Elizabeth Lucas and its process and was developed by Andrew DeVu, both of whom have likely Sephardic ancestry. Moses Lindo, an openly Jewish settler, was the colony's indigo export inspector in 1762. And key producers included John B., James Stobo, Robert Sams, George Mitchell, Isaac Hine, Richard Pinkley, and John Hudson, most of whom bear Sephardic Morisco surnames. It is largely the same story with Carolina silk industry. Many French Huguenots and newly minted English colonists entered South Carolina and North Carolina via Ireland. They came from Ireland. Thus, they swelled the ranks of the so-called Scots-Irish settlers. So-called Scots-Irish settlers. They were what? They were really what? Huguenots. And they were what? A.K.A. Sephardic Moriscos. These so-called Scots-Irish settlers. All right, so when they talk about black Irish, now you know some of them were, what? Sephardis and Moriscos, who are estimated to account for about one third to half of the whole population of the South. The largest migration of Irish and Scottish people occurred after the Battle of the Culloden in 1745, when Prince Charles Edward Stuart was defeated and the Jacobite rebellion against England was lost for good. But the roots of Irish immigration to Americas were much deeper. The process can be said to have been jump-started when William III, of son of William II, Prince of Orange, Stadthire of the United Provinces of the Netherlands, began his campaigns against Irish Catholics, spoils of war went to Presbyterian Ulster Scots and French Huguenots. This Celtic French, however, as it has become known in the nostalgia inherited from the Victorian era, was not altogether Celtic or even British in ethnicity or uniformly Christian in faith. The tolerant Carolinas acted as a magnet for all sorts of nationalities, those who were better off sailed straightway to Charleston. The many of these Irishmen were of recent French Huguenot provenance, and before that of Spanish Jewish origin, can be seen in a compilation of genealogies covering some of the South Carolina's famous colonial surnames. In fact, a historian, Lyburn, repeatedly points out the Scotsmen changed their way of identifying themselves and it, as it suited them Alter, alternating between Irish, Ulster, Scottish, English, British, and other designations such as Presbyterian or Quaker. There you go. You see, these are just titles they were using. They're really just what? Huguenots, aka third party, Jews, or Moors. And it says here Bailey. This Huguenot name is derived from Philippe de Baloux, a French refugee who settled in the neighborhood of Torney Abbey circa 1656. Since, they, since then, the name has 
assume the following forms Bailu, Bailu, Bailey, or Bay, right? Bailey or Bailey. All right. Burgess says a member of this family, Valerie or Valerian de Burgess, came to England with one of the earliest bodies of immigrants and settled at Canterbury. Most of the earlier Huguenot refugees in England landed in Kent. From successive intermarriages, the names became almost unrecognizable as Huguenot origin. And so was then changed to Burgess. But the pedigree of the family can be clearly traced back to the Bourjois family of the Picardy, who were seniors of Grama Gamachi of Oil Oil and of the Foss a la Foss. A Burgess was soon found as an Indian trader in the Carolinas. Calimot, the Calimot, younger son of Marquis de Rubini, commanded a Huguenot regiment at the Battle of Boini, where he was killed. Cabin, all right, that's another having a name. Uh, Gosset, then you got Goss, Gis, Gas, Gas. You see Gas clothing, you see Huguenot, Gas, Gas, Gosi, Costa, a Huguenot family originally from Normandy, which first settled in Jersey, from where some of the younger branches passed over into England. Perrin, Count Perrin was a Huguenot refugee from Noary. Victoria says Queen Victoria descended from Huguenot ancestress Eleanor de Esmeris, Marquise de Aubier, who was her who was her great great grandmother. A great grandparent was also a Sixas, hence the name of her duchy and dynasty Saxic Coburg, which the royal family said to be have hated. La Rive, this refugee who settled in Ireland, escaped from France with his wife by pretending to be sellers of oranges, a traditional Jewish occupation and going about with a donkey and panniers. When they reached the Netherlands, the Prince of Orange gave him a commission. And La Reeve found bravely in the Irish campaigns, but some of the family, this name has been changed into Reeves, a Melungeon name. Reeves, La Reeve, Huguenots often escaped by distinguishing themselves as servants, gypsies, travelers from foreign countries, and the like. All right, now pay attention to this part. It says, Guali, Guale. So Peter Guali, son of the Sir of the of La Gineste of Rorg, fled to England at the revocation, so he was a Huguenot, with his wife and three children. This became the name of a remote tribe of mixed African and Indian people on adjacent islands. What? Huguenot set the tone of the Carolina colony with their wealth, professional backgrounds, and gentility. It is sometimes hard to distinguish them from Sephardic Jews. Charleston became the fourth oldest Jewish community in the American colonies after New York, Philadelphia, and Savannah, and the establishment of Beth Elohim in 1749. The old the Coast of Family plot served as the location of the Cumming Street Cemetery founded in the 1764. Charleston, Charleston Overly, Jewish population of 500, constituted the largest, wealthiest, and most cultured Jewish community in the colony. Until about 1830, it had the largest uh, Jewish communities, with the notable exception of Savannah. It never experienced the slightest repugnance of, from its host city. Part of that goodwill undoubtedly came from the Jewish fellow travelers, the Huguenots. Was it surprising then that Charleston became the birthplace of the Reformed Judaism movement, the Reformed Judaism, Reform <laughs> movement in the 1840s, or that South Carolina voted? the first Jew to public office, Francis Salvador, a newly arrived immigrant, and 1774 elected to the first provincial Congress. As we have seen, South Carolina's Jewish roots are very deep indeed. Its Muslim element in the colonial period, moreover, are not insignificant either. And it says here, plot thickens. A connection between Jews and the Mississippi and Georgia emerges from a stray reference in the Board of Governors. Records of 1750, the Frenchmen Isaac Laban, Hebrew for white or blonde, Leonard, Boldly, Budo, Borel, Anthony Pages, and Anthony Lesage, Wise, Waze, Stage, Wiseman, Uzman, or Uzman, that's what it really, Wiseman, Uzman, are recorded as arriving in Savannah on the ship, the Charmin Martha, from London, all right, from London, not from Africa, the Board of Governors had appropriated a choice piece of land fitting for their purposes, and had also decided Mr. Gene Sack. Hebrew anagram, Serach Kodesh, Holy Seed, an old inhabitant of this colony, a countryman of theirs, to assist them. One might ask why Frenchmen were granted lands in Georgia 
at a time when Britain was engaged in a bitter struggle with France, one, one that would only end with that country's surrender and complete withdrawal from North America. So look, they're making a good point. So why, if they got beef, would they be selling land to French people? And that's what I was saying earlier. If they're telling these people to leave their country, why are they helping them settle over here? Remember, these are Jews and Moors. That had nothing to do with Huguenots or Frenchmen. That's why it's in parentheses. Although these Frenchmen may have been outwardly Huguenots, it is apparent from their names that they were Sephardic Jews underneath the Protestant veneer. It seems some of the Jews who identified with the Salzburgers went beyond good wishes and actually joined the swelling exodus, whose numbers may have included crypto Jews and Huguenots from the start. Whether we look, silk formed part of the triad along with wine and olive oil with what's supposed to be salvation for the southern colonies. All these occupations were developed and dominated by Spanish Jews. Silk manufacture was established by medieval Jews who learned the art of the famous Silk Road to China. The seekers were passed after 1492 to the Huguenots. Huguenots in parentheses, right? The denomination superficially opposed by Paul Amatis in Southern Carolina, a number of families, including the Hugers, the Garis, the Gandris, Manigals, and Masiks. All right, it says Indian traders active in Georgia also include John and Daniel Ross, Christian Russell, Sicilian, a Silesian Ashkenazi, Nicholas White, a native of Marsalis, but resident in the nation of Creek Confederacy, <laughs> 30 years, Abraham and Mordecai, a Jew of bad character, according to Indian agent Benjamin Hawkins, but an intelligent Jew, according to Albert James Pickett, author of the history of Alabama. Mrs. Duran, a female trader, Obedia Lowe, Cornelius Daughtery, a Jacobite, said to be the first trader or one of the first among the Cherokees. John Van Van, later an important Cherokee mixed blood family. James Leslie, Leslie James Lewis, Aaron Harrod, Harrod, a Cairo Cox, a land developer, Richard Sparks, a captain of the Lico blockhouse in Cherokee upcountry. Cox is considered a Melungeon name. Davis is a blacksmith. John Marino, a Spaniard. John Beamer, a Huguenot, whose original Sephardic name was probably Benna Moore, and Benna Moore and with Cherokee son was known as musty or mixed breed, all right? So a Huguenot with a Cherokee was called a what? A musty. The offspring of a Huguenot and a Cherokee was called a musty or mixed breed. Thomas Nyard, Arabic, James McQueen, corruption of McQueen, son of Cohen, John McKee, Alexander Long, Robert Bunnin, Bundaran, Greenwood, Lefleur, Lefleur Flores, Benjamin Perryman, mixed blood. Artie Perry introduced cattle among the Chakta. Uh, William Dixon Moniak, originally Jacob Monaki from Munich, Germany, and John Shepard, also considered a lunge name. Now, the Kennedys. Now, it says here Kennedy. We propose the original name of famous Kennedys of Hyannisport, Massachusetts, may have been Italian Candiani, filtered through the French form Canada or Candiani Candyland from Candy Candyland the old name for the Turkish capital of Crete all right Candiani these are really Turks listen to what they're telling you genealogies of the Irish branch of the Kennedys do not go further back than Patrick Kennedy a prosperous farmer of Duggan's town County Wexford Ireland who was born about 1785 and whose son immigrated to America the family was probably of French origin before it became Irish. All right, French. Both Cassell, a sept of Clan Kennedy, pointing to a region in southern France, and Kennedy appear on a list of refugee French Huguenots to Ireland. All right, the Kennedys are really French Huguenots. The Kennedys. All right, Sephardic Jude and Moors, Turkish Moors. That's what a Kennedy is, is a Turkish Moor. It says one of the uh, author ancestors from province said to have been of extremely dark appearance, extremely dark appearance, very dark complexion. The surname was probably originally a Spanish compound of one Bon Durante, a form of the good name, Durant, Durant, were a prominent Sephardic family of rabbis, physicians, and scholars who settled mostly in province, Marsilis, Majorca, and Morocco after the expulsion of the uh, 1492 uh, where the Budurans originated, Jean Pierre, the immigrant, was an apothecary and witner by profession. His mother was Gabrielle Barjan, 
a Bargeant relative was one of the organizers of the mass escapes from France, which led the Huguenots through Switzerland, Germany, and finally London to the New World. Jean Pierre's wife wrote up for anglicized as Ford, all right, Faur or Ford, Wallot Ford, Wally Ford, also bore a Sephardic surname, Faugibon. The Boudouran family can be traced back to Genelhag, Department of Guard France, to the early 16th century, but not before. As we have seen often a clue and invoking the date 1492, they were probably relatively new arrivals from Inquisitional Spain. All right. In Virginia, the Boudourans intermarried again and again with Aggie, Maxie, Radford, and Ford Cousins, a common crypto-Jewish trait. Ancestor of co-author spouse Teresa Panther Jace, the family intermarried with Tuscarora and Cherokee Indians and was later known as Black Dutch. All right. And it says here, it's called the Jewish Blackness. Theses Revisit. All right, all right. Believe it or not, guys. Uh, that was the end of the pre-record uh, session I had uh, for you guys from old excerpts and old videos. I see a lot of questions in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. If you were here, the complete five hours almost. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Um, you know, a lot of questions being asked. Make sure to watch the whole presentation. Make sure to catch up on all the previous videos if you want full understanding. You know, everything is connected. History is very complex. Genealogy is very complex. And before we leave today, just want to remind you what we read right in the beginning, right? Now we have a context behind this newspaper from 1859. It says here, the Vermont Patriot. All right, hold on, guys. Let me get my... Okay, so the Vermont Patriot and State Gazette, the Moors, it may not be generally known that some of the best families in South Carolina are Moors by descent. The blood of the African dodged the hijack, they're only saying that because of the complexion, it washes out. But that of the Indian and the Moor, after half score of generations, shows itself almost as strongly as ever, okay? Yeah. French Huguenots, so-called Huguenots with Indians, mixing a lot of people have that heritage, more than they even think. Because a lot of those people came as an Irish, English, Scottish, or just Sephardic Jew, Moorish, Portuguese. Yeah. So the Crips curling black hair, dark sad eyes, long silken lashes, and swarthy complexion come up gener generation after generation. Many of our old Huguenot families down to the present day, show strong traces of their Moorish descent. Okay? Their Moorish descent. <laughs> all right? Now you guys got a whole background behind all that. All right? It's not just somebody writing here. It's not my conjecture. I'm not black watching. It's just real history. If you are a truther, then you have to be able to accept this with all your cognitive dissonance kicking in. Because sometimes this truth is even controversial for so-called truthers. And I'm talking from experience. <laughs> yeah, so if you guys want to check out the full chapter I read on chapter 8 of that book, British uh, uh, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America. Chapter 8, I read the whole chapter in this video right here. It's called Huguenot, South Carolina, Sephardic, Moorish Colonists, Genealogical History. Check it out. I also have this one. Entangled Borderlands, the Huguenot, a.k.a. Moore, Timucuan, Catholic Alliance in the 1500s, Florida. Okay. Yeah, catch up. We also have the Dakota family, Sephardic, Moorish, Irish of South Carolina. And, you know, Huguenot, they have that ancestry too. Okay. Make sure to check out these videos. Catch up if you got questions. Make sure to check out my great presentation on the Acadians, the Cajuns, the exiles, and the colonies. This is part 10 of Nations of the World series. Swarthy Arcadians, Cajuns, Huguenots, Exiles, Refugees, and Indians. All right, you're going to see how much they mix with the Indians. All right, the so-called Acadians who were French Huguenots. So-called Huguenots, they were Sephardic Moorish people. Now we know the full background, full circle. And of course, check out uh, my genealogical story series. Episode 1, we did uh, Du Bois uh, genealogy, W.E. Du Bois genealogy. All right. And of course, the Du Bois or Du Bois is a French Huguenot family. 
That's who his lineage is. And also he has Burgard through his mom, which was called the Black Burgards of the, uh, where his area in Massachusetts, the Berkshires, the Black Burgers of the Berkshires, uh, Massachusetts. All right. Famous. We proved it. This ain't Black Washington. This ain't trying to self-hate. And, you know, that whole Pan-African thing, you guys got to drop, you know, clear your mind of the empty your cup. Empty your cup. And all your biases and everybody just wanting to be Indian, that's fine. We're just finding out, a lot of people just finding out that they're Indian. They're finding out how much Indian they are. And that's great. That's amazing. It's wonderful. You know? But there's also more to you. Every individual has a complex story. You can't generalize by color or by region. Because, oh, we're all in the South from this. No, it's not like that. Everybody in Massachusetts is from here. No, it's not like that. Everybody from Jamaica is, oh, it's not like that. Everybody from Costa Rica, no, it's not like that. It's very complex everywhere. Melting pot. There's been a lot of mixture, a lot of migrations, a lot of history that they didn't want us to know about in detail. So they taught us a generalized history based on the false narrative of out-of-Africa theories and Mesopotamia and all that, and that all Europeans were white, and that all so-called black folks came out of Africa. All that is false. You got to empty your cup. This ain't personal. It's time to really wake up. If you're a truther, this shouldn't be controversial to you. It's not about your feelings or your personal emotions. Nothing like that. You got to get over all that. And I'm not here to be your enemy. And you mad at me because, oh, Kurimel just wants to do this. Kurimel just... I get a lot of crazy comments, guys. A lot of people hating. A lot of people slandering and putting words in my mouth and <laughs> all this stuff. You know, they're not listening. They're not looking at the info. They just want to be biased and keep uh, their narratives. And I understand that. People can have their beliefs. That's fine. I have my own biases and beliefs too. You know, don't follow me blindly. Verify everything I say. Don't follow anybody blindly. Because I see a lot of people following people blindly. I'm still getting remarks like, Harry Tubman and that Turner were fictional. Come on, guys. You got living descendants, genealogy, everything. So people follow others blindly. All right, facts over feelings. Again, thanks for uh, tuning in. I appreciate everybody that uh, was here for most of the presentation. That was I know it was a long presentation, but I hadn't done one of these in a while. I got a, a lot of new subscribers, and I just wanted to uh, touch up on this subject again because it's very important when it comes to U.S. history and European history. Yeah. So I appreciate everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed it. hope you like this uh, revised version of it. Because it was very old. It was about four years ago when I did the video. And um, so I wanted to do it again. I'm going to might probably do some more. Uh, let me know if I should do some of the older ones again. Any of them you have, you know, uh, ideas about, I can redo them. No worries. Uh, shout out to the patrons. Thank you for supporting me. If you support, you like what I do. You know, this takes hours. I worked all week on this on top of doing the videos I was dropping every day late at night. While I'm still taking care of my family and doing other things, you know. I got I got a real farm here. I'm, I'm handling <laughs> real farm, man. Like we're really trying to uh, survive in our own ways and uh, keep working, staying productive. You know, so if you uh, I got also got a lot of great books here on Patreon. So if you like to support, you know, if you can, it doesn't matter. I'll still do what I do. If you if you can't, no worries. You know, that's just I'm just saying <laughs> support a brother. And um, yeah, because, you know, unfortunately, I lost my job to COVID. I had to really step my game up. And um, minimum wage here is very low <laughs> for people like me who got no degrees, really. I just got my English, and that's like a degree here, which I can get call center jobs, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather do this, guys, honestly. I just, I'm just being real with you. I'd rather do this because I like doing this. I've been always into this history, everything, these conspiracies, these, these mysteries, all that. You know, and I like video production, so it's my two favorite things, hobbies, apart from the farming and all that. You know, but I'm glad that I'm able to touch and help people understand things and all the great testimonies I get in my comments, you know, all the time. It just motivates me even more and more. So I appreciate everybody always letting me know uh, your story and confirming what we're showing here. Again, people can talk, people can get mad and have their beliefs and troll and everything. But sooner or later, the whole world will know this. You can't can't stop this. So you guys are advanced right now because you guys are hip. All right. And don't worry about converting or letting people know, or forcing others to believe this. If they want to know this, they'll come in their own time. You know, they'll really literally come in their own time. 
if they really care about history. If not, don't try to force it on people. You have to really care. You have to really care, and most people don't. That's why they're still stuck in the world, in the materialistic, in the game, in the movie, in the Matrix. Right, watching the news and all that, and the money, hustling, trying to get that money. It's all about that money back, yeah? It's all about that money back, right? <laughs> well, it's really not always about the money back. And we're going into different eras now. And all that, that peace and age stuff, all that's getting thrown away. So you got to adapt to the change or you get left behind. You know what I'm saying? I just want to keep talking sometimes. Right now, I feel like talking. But I'm going to go now. We're going to go out with two beats. Two great beats from two great producers. Uh, they were in the chat today. Uh, shout out to my brother, uh, Red Lion. All right, Pakana. We're going to play one of his beats. We're going to also play Ocelot's beat after that. All right. So thanks for the uh, to the music producers also that give some of the background music. I appreciate it. And shout out and make sure to check out Red Lion Pakana's uh, YouTube and anybody in the chat that has a YouTube channel that you know of, Platoni. I know I saw him in here. Check out their YouTube. James was in here earlier. So make sure to check out the check. Thank you, J9, for always uh, monitoring and everything, making sure, you know, the chat goes smooth. Appreciate it. And all the moderators as well that were here. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Hawa. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Robin Dre Beats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Robin Dre Beats, Gotham City Music Group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Ocelome 12 in the house. This one right here is called Clockwork, produced by Ocelome 12. He's in the chat. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We're going to do a pull up. Pull up.
Yeah. Uh. Uh.